uh, uh, K34. Uh, remember, when we talk about uh, why was Jesus talking about when I was in, uh, 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 when I was uh, uh, in hospital, you came, or in prison, when I was sick, you looked at me. Sometimes we, uh, we try to separate uh, the spiritual from the physical, but then when we, uh, when we remember that uh, uh, what we have in our heart, or how our minds uh, are, or the state of our minds, is, will also depend on how our uh, our, our, the state of our heart is as well. And therefore, uh, Jesus, in a way, was trying to bring healing and asking the people to continue to think about others in a way that uh, helps them to have uh, uh, well-balanced and uh, healthy mental wellness because when we look at uh, uh, what, what he is saying is that People who are, he is referring to are those people who mostly feel isolated. And when they are isolated, uh, you know, of course, uh, their mental capacities might be disturbed in one or the other. But when uh, uh, he brings about the visitation, it's all about the fellowship. It's all about reconciliation. It's all about him bringing touch, or, uh, touch into the reality of the people and uh, enable them to remember or to know that they, are, uh, uh, they belong in the community, they have uh, people who care for them, and therefore they feel that they belong. Uh, the other text that relates with that is uh, that text of the prodigal son, uh, which we get in uh, Luke 15, 11 to 32. Uh, the idea of the prodigal son uh, is connected so much with the mentor in the sense that when he actually misused all that uh, he had inherited from the parent, uh, he, he was reduced to a state of someone who can just live among pigs. And you know, when he realized his state, even when he is saying, let me go back to my father's home, at least there I can be counted as one of the servants, he is already understanding that uh, he does not, he has some kind of uh, uh, social distance. He is disturbed. He, he is not feeling part and parcel of those who can really say they belong. And therefore, what we see in his father's uh, reception of this son is that uh, he accepts this son and uh, tries to bring him back. Uh, you remember the conversation between the two is that uh, the elder son, the oldest son is so uh, furious that uh, the father can take care of this son who went away and misused his property. But then uh, when this one is looking upon his right as the eldest son, the father is looking at someone who was lost and who is actually confused, who has uh, even uh, some kind of disturbance in his life. He has cut off all the relationships. And uh, this person, uh, even though we may not go deeper, we know that he must have been disturbed and realized that this is not how my life is supposed to be. And I have to go back to my father's home. Uh, what we are saying today is that uh, uh, when we know our spiritual aspects or how the spirituality is connected with uh, our mental health, then it will, be, uh, it will be a time for us to start reflecting on that uh, connectivity or, or that intersection um, between spirituality and mental health. And I think through this, we shall uh, have a very op uh, great opportunity to learn and also to uh, have some time for us to do some kind of discernment so that uh, we get to discover new avenues where we are able to respond to some of the societal issues that we are facing today. Uh, may God bless us and help us to see that holistic life um, being part and parcel of what we are called upon to do at this time, and also to be able through that to find uh, meaning, and meaning of course that is relevant to our lives today and also for our generations to come. May God bless you and God bless us all and pray that God is going to guide us in this conference as we begin and continue uh, up to the last day. I pray in God that uh, uh, we are all going to be enabled even through our speakers and all those who are going to attend that uh, this is going to be a special conference 
and of its kind for this time in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and bless you. We exalt your name this morning. Thank you for bringing us your word and also enabling us to have this opportunity to reflect on our spirituality and also mental health and how we can navigate through this in a way that, Lord, we, our lives become more successful and, Lord, also uh, giving us an opportunity to learn on how to handle various situations, especially that uh, affect our minds and also our hearts, those affect, uh, that affect our spiritual life and also our physical and social life. Bless us all, Lord, and bless everyone, bless all events. Bless each and every person who is going to participate in one or the other. Bless all the conference uh, uh, attendees. Bless even the facilitators and the presenters of various uh, papers that God, you are going to direct them to the particular and the very pertinent issues that we need to deal with at this time so that God, this conference is going to be a blessing to us all. We thank you, Lord, also for this university. We thank you for the management. We thank you for the vice chancellor. We thank you for all the people who are involved. I pray for those who are here and those who may be away. May you bless all of us and continue to guide us. And all the glory and honor shall remain unto your name. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you very much, Reverend uh, Douglas, for that uh, uh, opportunity of devotion. I want to take this opportunity again to thank you uh, members who have come uh, online and uh, physically in this conference. And uh, we are glad that you are able to join with us this morning as we start of the day. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mushiri uh, from, the, uh, from the Directorate of Postgraduate Studies. I'm glad to be part of this and uh, as, uh, serving as uh, a moderator for, the, uh, for this uh, session. I'm going to invite the chair of this session, uh, Reverend Dr. Tasira Kevala, who will then take over the process and the program so that we can learn together. Uh, Reverend Dr. Kevala, please take over. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you so much, uh, Hemsing, uh, Hemsing, Dr. Muchiri. I want to take want this to opportunity to also to welcome every one of us and so and more so, so more our so guests, our guests uh, who, are who are not members, not members or, or, of staff or staff in this university, in this university uh, online, online and also, and also physically, physically seated, seated here. here. We're very much very welcome, welcome to, participate to participate in this conference. In this conference. Uh, uh, I can see many can of see us, many most of us are online, online and the lockdown, lockdown time, time. We really want to appreciate, appreciate that particular punctuality from your side. I now, I now uh, uh, take, this take this opportunity to welcome, welcome uh, uh, the chair, chair of this of particular, this particular uh, conference, conference, Professor Dr. Professor Vantu, Vantu, Professor Vantu, 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 to introduce to us the keynote speaker. We have noted that the vice chancellor is in a meeting. Yes, the most needed to be to be to give our remarks right now. But we will be, be doing it late in the day when she uh, gets uh, some time off from that meeting. Uh, thank you so much and welcome, Professor.
Professor Baguma, Professor Peter Baguma online. I think Professor will be joining us. Uh, I need to reach him out. Back to the Master of Ceremonies for Osama. I'll uh, reach out to the keynote speaker now. Oh, Professor, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Professor Baguma, you may have to unmute. While you are unmuting, I want to just provide a, a, a profile. Professor Peter Baguma stands a beacon of innovation and leadership in the realms of psychology with a career spanning decades. Professor Baguma has made indelible contributions to both academia and the practical application of psychology in various sectors. As an esteemed educator, Professor Baguma has held numerous academic positions, including professorships and administrative roles, where he has shaped the minds of county, countless students and mentored aspiring scholars. His dedication to teaching excellence and his ability to inspire intellectual curiosity have earned him the respect and admiration of colleagues and students alike. Beyond the classroom, <laughs> Professor Peter Baguma has been a trailblazer in the field of psychology, leveraging his expertise to drive transform transformative change in society with a keen understanding of the intersection between psychology and mental health. 
He has spearheaded initiatives to integrate digital, digital tools and methodologies into the learning environment. Professor Peter Baguma's contributions extend beyond academia as he has played a pivotal role in harnessing psychology for social and economic development. Through his involvement in research mm. projects, consultancy work, and partnerships with industry stakeholders, he has championed the use of mental health in various settings, including the military and veterans. As a thought leader and advocate for psychology, Professor Baguma has been instrumental in shaping national policies and strategies aimed at bringing the psychology divide and promoting equitable access to resources, psychosocial resources. His efforts have helped empower individuals and communities, enabling him to harness the potential of psychology for personal and collective advancement. <coughs> In summary, Professor Peter Baguma's multifaceted contributions to education and psychology have had a profound impact on society, driving innovation, fostering learning, and empowering individuals and communities to thrive in the digital age. His visionary leadership, coupled with his unwavering commitment to excellence and social responsibility, exemplifies the transformative power of psychology and creates a better future for all. Welcome, Professor Peter Baguma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Welcome. We can hear you. Very well. Uh, as the Vice Chancellor of the Kenya Methodist University and other university dignitaries, the dignitaries of uh, sister universities, whom we are trying to forge collaboration. Uh, the Reverend Preacher, who gave us uh, a religious commitment. Uh, Dr. Mushiri, the moderator, and Dr. Bantu, uh, who introduced me. Uh, I'm called Professor Peter Baguma, a psychologist at Makere University. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bantu, for introducing me. And uh, you, dear presenters and listeners, Ladies and gentlemen, my role is uh, not difficult. My role is to welcome you uh, to this international conference and make you uh, feel at home. Uh, this is not a, a serious lecture. Uh, we should send your hearts pumping, but rather to soothe you and cool you down so that you are in the mood uh, to take in and digest what the conference is going to offer. Uh, My presentation uh, has got that outline, the introduction, the recognitions. I have finished recognizing everybody here present in this conference. And uh, I'm welcoming you to the conference or summit. I will give background to the summit then we talk about the whole person concept, present the aims and objectives of the conference or summit, 
and give key themes and then uh, expected outcomes and then closing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and honored guests, it is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I will come you uh, to this conference. The topic of the conference is integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches to mental health and international dialogue. Over the next two days, we will embark on a journey uh, of experience and collaboration delving into the intersections of psychiatry, psychological, and spirituality to, ad to, ad to advance our understanding of practices in mental health care. So I'm sure among us, stars, we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, and we have uh, religious personnel. And I'm sure there are other types of helpers among the stars. You are all welcome. As we gather here on the 21st and 22nd of March 2024, we are confronted with and an deniable, deniable truth that mental health is a multifaceted, multifaceted and deeply uh, 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 multifaceted and deeply uh, is yes, and deeply complex aspect of human well being. Yet, amidst us, there is complex, complex lies a profound opportunity, an opportunity to integrate psychiatric and spiritual approaches, forging a path uh, towards holistic and comprehensive care for individuals experiencing mental health challenges. And the uh, Reverend has already alluded to this in his remarks. He talked about the holistic approach and comprehensiveness that we need in order to help uh, people uh, facing health challenges. So that is going to be the temple of this conference. We're we'll taking, looking at a person holistically and in a comprehensive manner. Uh, the background, of our dialogue is rooted in the recognition of the interconnectedness of psychological well-being and spiritual wellness. Uh, definitely, when we talk about the holistic approach, we are covering all these areas of human nature, and we are saying that they are all interconnected. We understand that addressing mental health concerns re requires a holistic approach that acknowledges the biological, psychological, and spiritual dimensions of the human experience. However, despite this recognition, there remains a glaring gap in the international dialogue 
and collaboration in this field. Many of us operate within our respective silos or silos, limiting opportunities for interdisciplinary exchange and collaboration. So this is a very important point. I would recognize that uh, we have to approach human nature holistically if we are to help them effectively. But uh, when you see what's happening on the ground, uh, most of us are working in, in the silos and separated from each other. So this has retarded progress. Retarded progress. There hasn't been collaboration. People at the university, uh, Kenya Methodist University are working alone. Those at Harvard are working alone. Those at Makerere are working alone. And in so doing, we might not achieve our major objective, which is helping the troubled person holistically. And I think, and I, it is our hope that at the end of this conference, we are going to forge collaboration uh, so that we are able uh, to meet human needs, uh, not only in a holistic, holistic manner, but we shall be able at cross borders and reach as many people as possible. Uh, so I don't need to labor much to justify uh, the importance of this conference by bringing together mental health professionals and spiritual leaders from across the globe. We shall have the opportunity to promote a holistic understanding of mental health. We shall be able to foster collaboration and address the, 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 the diverse needs of individuals uh, seeking support. Uh, so this point has already been highlighted uh, and uh, it is clear what our intention is and the outcomes uh, of our conference in terms of increasing our understanding of mental health, taking mental health holistically, and then forging collaboration. And once we have collaboration in place, definitely we shall be able to, we shall increase the capacity uh, to meet the needs of various corporations. Uh, I want to talk more about the whole person concept. It is a, a, trading, a trending concept. Uh, looking at the person holistically, uh, not just in, in separate uh, domains, looking at the, it looks at the, at human nature uh, in a totality, uh, focusing on the human body, uh, those are the physical needs, focusing on the mind, focusing on the heart, and on the spirit. And this idea of the whole person concept was initiated by Dr. Motima Adler, uh, who lived uh, in, during those years. Uh, so when you consider the concept of the whole person, in that diagram, we are looking at many domains. We are looking at the social cultural uh, beginning on the, on the extreme right, right. We look at the person as a social being, as a cultural being, and also as a spiritual being. We look at the finance and the money. We look at parenting and caring relationships. We look at uh, what happens to the person, the world of work and expression. Uh, we look at personal care and physical well-being, that is uh, the 
health, health, physical health part of it and medical aspect, uh, medical and other forms of treatment, uh, including psychological interventions. Uh, then we look at the accommodation, we look at the education and training of the person. So we look at the whole person holistically, and I hope uh, this will come out uh, during uh, this conference. So the aims of this conference are as follows. To facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration, the idea of interdisciplinarity cannot be overemphasized. When you want to contribute and solve a problem, you cannot solve human problems when we are working as separate disciplines. That has come to be realized that when we work in separate disciplines, uh, we shall not achieve much. And that's why we are calling upon interdisciplinarity, psychologists working with uh, spiritualists, psychologists working with psychiatrists, uh, 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 psychologists working with social work, social work working with the political scientists. Yeah, so uh, when we contribute to the problem from a multidisciplinary angle, we are able to address that problem and uh, really solve it, okay? And the, that fits also very well in the, in the concept of the whole person. So we uh, would want to facilitate interdisciplinarity, want to work together, different disciplines, working together uh, to sort of uh, to address the psychological needs. Uh, then we want to explore innovative approaches. So we want to work to new look at things in a new manner using different uh, approaches, new approaches, uh, new methodologies, new models. Uh, because as we speak now, we are, we are applying models mainly based on the Western culture, the culture of Europe and the culture of America. Uh, the, the whole of the African continent has not contributed much in terms of ideas, new ideas uh, that could help in solving human problems. So we hope in our forthcoming collaboration, we, are, we, we expect ideas from the African continent uh, so that we can make the argument richer, richer, and therefore being able to solve what we have not been able, what we have not been able to solve uh, when we are working along. Uh, we want to enhance the understanding of spirituality in, uh, in mental health promotion. Uh, in many instances, the role of spirituality uh, is not emphasized. It is put on the side and just mentioned in the passing. So, but now we realize that really, spirituality is a key common component of human nature. So when we want to, if we want to address problems of human nature, there is no way we can avoid spirituality. And the, we are waiting to, so to see that uh, spirituality takes its role in the address of mental health problems. Uh, and the, uh, we are looking forward to uh, the contribution. Uh, we want to empower uh, mental health professionals to address our key psychological needs. Uh, yes, uh, mental uh, health professionals need some 
expertise. Yes, we need further training. Uh, and we hope in our collaboration, we are going to address this need. Uh, further training of professionals, uh, uh, no skills equipping uh, uh, events uh, so that we are sharper, we are more empowered uh, to address the mental health needs. So these are some of our major aims. And the, uh, as we seek collaboration, uh, using innovative approaches and enhancing our understanding uh, of different mental health issues. We want also to identify new strategies, new strategies. Huh? This is very important. When we talk about innovation and the using new strategies, then we are at the dot. Yes. So uh, we want to promote awareness within the faith-based communities. Uh, it's good that uh, Kenya Methodist University is taking a, a, a leading role. It is a faith-based institution and uh, uh, which is now leading an, uh, an attempt to address uh, psychological needs and the other needs in the communities. So bravo, uh, Kenya Methodist University. Uh, uh, then through these objectives and aims, we hope to achieve increased awareness, enhanced collaboration, development of innovative interventions. Yes, intervention is, is at the back of our minds and standing high. Because normally we address uh, these uh, human needs, especially psychological needs, uh, using what we call interventions. And as we are empowered through these conferences, uh, we should be able to design well-informed and powerful interventions that are going to help us. Uh, and then uh, when we come together, definitely we are going to, streng to strengthen the support systems. You see, uh, we have ideas like bringing the East Africans together, you see, so that we develop a support system, uh, a, a, a collaborative uh, system that is going to bring all professionals in the in the mental health field together because we have similar needs uh, and so there isn't uh, is the reason why we should work separately as east africans so we are looking forward uh, to forming associations uh, in the uh, uh, of professionals in, in mental health uh, uh, bring East African together, East, East Africans together, and even globally, yes, globally. Uh, what are the themes that we are uh, focusing on? Uh, we are going to look at uh, trauma. Uh, this trauma, trauma is a uh, a, a catch word these days. Everybody is talking about trauma, trauma, trauma. Uh, sometimes without a clear understanding. So, uh, in this conference, we are going to address the concept of trauma and the post, uh, post traumatic stress disorder, sometimes called psychotrauma. So, we want to see how we can address it uh, holistically using psychological, spiritual, psychiatric, and other approaches. Would also, but another theme will be digital health. Uh, digital health is also a trending aspect and it will be addressed, it will be addressed in this conference. 
because uh, you see, we have many populations of people with psychological needs, but the professionals, we are few, we are few. So this leaves the service gap, a service gap. Many, uh, the few professionals cannot satisfy the needs of the many people that have uh, mental uh, issues. So when you bring in the digital help, it is going to help us, help these people seeking for help uh, to reach, to access mental health interventions that, uh, that we have. We have them, but uh, they are not reaching where they, whom they are supposed to reach. So this concept, I think, will be explored, and I think it is an important concept. Uh, I invite members uh, not to lose it. Uh, then another theme will be understanding aggression, and then the integrating spirituality in psychology education. Yes. So we shall look at education. Uh, how do you train? How do you train? How do you empower uh, a person that is going to help uh, people with mental needs and even help them effectively? Uh, so uh, presentations will, will be on that issue. OK? So we expect a lot of learning and a lot of collaboration. As we embark on this journey together, let us remain open-minded, curious, and compassionate. I've already looked at you through this video, and I see that actually most of you are open-minded. I saw your faces. We had a curiosity there. I, can, I could see it, and you are compassionate. So I think these are going to come out, and we are going to benefit from this attitude. Let us embrace the diversity of perspectives and experiences present in this room. Recognizing that it is through collaboration and dialogue that we will achieve meaningful progress in mental health care. Uh, somewhere I was reading and I came across a concept, one world, one earth, one earth concept, you see, one earth. Some of you want to divide us. They say these ones are Chinese, these ones are American, these ones are African, these ones are this, these ones are Kalenjin. No. You see, we are all human beings. And we definitely we have similar needs. You see? And we have similar challenges. So uh, this, this now uh, puts our conference in a unique position where we are looking at human beings, uh, we as the same, where we are looking at uh, the world as one world and one earth concept. Uh, uh, so uh, they say, talking in many words, by a person who is suffering from schizophrenia doesn't stop that person from being apprehended and offered treatment. So uh, I have said many words, but uh, every good thing has an end. So allow me to reach the last part of my address, which is the closing. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you, uh, the participants, the contributors, uh, the seminar uh, uh, presenters, the original universities that involved in this dialogue, that are involved in this first ever uh, conference that has cut across borders uh, that is uh, a global in nature. So uh, I'm 
very happy for being this, for being given this opportunity. And I look forward to interacting with you. And we look forward to fruitful uh, interaction. Together, let us pave the way towards a future where holistic and comprehensive mental health is accessible to all. Thank you for this opportunity. May God bless you all. Asante Nisana. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Baguma, our keynote speaker, for that comprehensive keynote address, uh, which is all inclusive to the participants and also uh, to the uh, mental health focus. At this juncture, I want to welcome the chair, Professor Andrew Adibantu, uh, to proceed on uh, with the next part of the conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Professor Baguma, thank you very much. And um, he has expressed gratitude for the opportunity to address such a distinguished gathering for professionals and advocates in the field of mental health and spirituality. Um, he has highlighted the significance of integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for holistic mental health care emphasizing the need for collaboration and synergy between clinical psychiatry and spiritual healing practices. Professor Baguma acknowledges the complexities of mental health and the diverse factors that contribute to an individual's well-being. He underscores the importance of recognizing and addressing spiritual dimensions in mental health care, <laughs> noting that spirituality can provide individuals with a sense of purpose, meaning, and connection which are very essential for recovery and resilience. Members, we have other participants from the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and we have other professors from um, uh, the DRC, and I would like to take my humble pleasure to introduce to you Professor Etnet. Professor Etnet comes from the University of Kinshasa, and she would be traveling to the PAPU meeting in Addis Ababa, but she's connected. And then we also have uh, Professor Dr. Matonda is online. And uh, I wanted to request that um, one of our French speaking uh, colleague to make a, a brief about the background of this conference and then after we shall have uh, other speakers projected and then we move from there. So I would like to welcome um, uh, Chogora Patrick Duncan Chogora to briefly make a translation in the French language. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, le prof qui est invité, alors euh, cette séance aujourd'hui part sur les, les activités des, des approches spirituelles pour la santé des <coughs> mentales dans un euh, sens euh, qui peut reco reconnaître la, la lien entre la spirituelle et la santé. Donc, euh, cette approche peut aussi reconnaître l'importance d'adresser les concerns de la santé mentale euh, sur euh, les perspectives spirituelles et cliniques pour aimer euh, la science des individus qui expérimentent les défis mentaux. Donc, euh, l'objectif de cette euh, conférence pour faciliter Premièrement, pour faciliter le dialogue interdisciplinaire 
et faire la collaboration entre euh, euh, les professionnels euh, qui ont, so, so, sont sur euh, euh, la, la, la santé mentale et aussi les professionnels euh, qui sont aussi spirituels. Deuxièmement, on peut faire explore, explorer les approches, les approches innovatives pour intégrer les perspectives spirituelles donc, euh, pour familier aussi dans, euh, dans la liane de, de la santé mentale. Et troisièmement, pour faire euh, reconnaître euh, le rôle de, de la santé mentale pour promouvoir, promouvoir aussi et faire la, euh, le sien de, de mental. Donc, euh, le quatrième objectif, c'est identifier les les moyens pour adresser euh, les oui pour, ah, désolé le, le quatrième objectif c'est faire identifier les stratégies pour adresser euh, les biais de, de psychosocial mental et aussi pour les professionnels pour donner leur les rapproches pour, euh, pour, pour identifier ce qu'on peut faire pour euh, déterminer les, les, les sciences mentales aussi. Et cinquièmement, pour promouvoir et faire euh, distribuer les, la connaissance de la de liste de, 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 de santé mentale et aussi distribuer cette euh, connaissance de la communauté qui sont qui se trouvait euh, au lien des des de, 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 de sociétés et communautés euh, qui ont qui se trouvent de la ré, religion et finalement ce qu'on a pour, on, on peut cette science pour euh, arriver et déterminer ce qu'on peut faire pour euh, reconnaître les, les, les cinq moyens pour identifier les, euh, les, les santé qui se trouvent dans l'espace euh, religion. Premièrement, faire, euh, faire quoi, distribuer la connaissance importance de intriguer les approches spirituelles et aussi euh, la scène mentale. Deuxièmement, pour faire la collabora collaboration entre les professionnels dans la euh, les professionnels, professionnels santé et aussi euh, les professionnels euh, dans la centre religion. Troisièmement, faire développer les interventions innovatives pour les programmes qui pour intégrer les perspectives spirituelles et aussi euh, de la psychiatrique. Quatrièmement, on peut aussi faire euh, les professionnels mentaux adresser les Uh, désolé, quatrièmement, uh, on peut aussi faire les professionnels qui, se, qui travaillent dans le secteur de, de, la sein, de la santé pour adresser les, um, uh, ce qu'on qu peut faire pour, pour ceux qui souffrent dans le lien de, de secteur social. Et cinquièmement, pour faire les systèmes qui peuvent faire un soutien pour les, les individus qui souffrent de, autour des, 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 des défis euh, de santé et aussi psychiatrique. Merci beaucoup et, merci et bienvenue dans, le, dans cette science et bienvenue parler avec euh, ces gens qui attendent votre adresse et on vous euh, apprécie pour être un membre de cette science. Bienvenue à Kemi. Merci. 
Uh, I think that's very interesting that uh, we are joined together with our colleagues from the, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, um, from, the, from the University of Kinshasa. Um, we I shall have some communication from Laura. Laura will be presenting and then later on uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Alice, uh, Bishop Alice introducing Laura. And then I'm requesting that um, Professor um, um, uh, Professor Etnet uh, will be speaking again. She will be speaking in French. And then also Professor um, uh, Dr. Matonda, because he's online. Uh, so I'm begging that since we had started with uh, Laura, and I at this time I'd like to request uh, Dr. Bishop Alice to introduce uh, to introduce to introduce Professor Dr. Laura. We have two Dr. Auroras. Uh, this one presenting is called uh, Dr. Laura from Hamak University in Finland. And uh, I would like to take this pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Uh, Laura, uh, to make a presentation, and then thereafter we shall have other uh, guests introduced. Dr. Laura, are you around? Dr. Rora, you can proceed. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes, we can hear you very Great. well. Great. Welcome. Great. Donc, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very happy to take part in this international dialogue that has a very important topic close to my heart, mental health and well-being, and how we can approach these issues uh, holistically. Uh, my presentation is about art therapy, as you may have seen in the program. I hope you can see my slides. If someone can, yes. Are you there? Yeah. Good. Great. And actually, I'm, yes, as uh, Professor Bantu said, I'm from Finland originally, but right now I'm in Kabale, Uganda, doing field work. I will tell a bit more about that as well. Oh. Mm -hmm. So greetings from Kabale, Uganda. Uh, my topic is uh, about art and how art can create hope and how it can be really efficient uh, in psychosocial support. And obviously, uh, because it's about art, I will also show you some images of visual art. And there's the first one already here on the cover, which is a wall painting in a group home of unaccompanied minors at the refugee center of Finnish Red Cross in Finland. I have worked with uh, with asylum seekers, young people who have come without families to Finland. Very happy here, and I'm sure I will also <coughs> learn a lot during these two days. Um, briefly then about creativity uh, as a warm up. I honestly believe and know that uh, creativity is and has always been essential for us humans everywhere in the world. And as actress Felicia Rashad has beautifully put it, before a child speaks, it 
things. Before they write, they paint. And as soon as they stand, stand they dance. So art truly is the basis of human expression. Then uh, briefly about my own background, uh, Professor Bantu uh, kindly called me doctor. I'm not yet doctor, but my doctoral studies are in process. Uh, and, and even this field work I'm doing in uh, Uganda is part of it. But I've always been passionate about arts, creativity and equity in education and well-being. For 25 years, I have worked in the field of education. I'm an educator but then also uh, increasingly in mental health and psychosocial support. And through my field work with UNICEF, run here in Sierra Leone, Burkina Faso and Niger, I witnessed how um, expressive arts helped children and youth in very difficult life situations. Of course, we know that they, they need food and shelter, but also self-expression is very vital to healing of young people who have gone through uh, traumatic life events. So I wanted to learn more and studied art therapy in Canada. So I'm also art therapist by training. And here's up there, there's one photo of um, a national uh, music, dance and drama festival in Kampala at the National Theatre. And that was taken just one year after the civil long civil war ended in the north. And seeing how much joy uh, this event brought to the children from the north and from all parts of you, all parts of Uganda, uh, was really moving, and showed also how important it is for the young people to have these opportunities uh, to express themselves through arts. I have organized art uh, groups as art therapist with children, mainly with children and. I lived there. I worked with cancer patients in school. And then I mentioned I mainly work with asylum seekers, refugees, um, with Red Cross. So I worked with a local child psychologist, Ruben de Bahika, who has created a home for vulnerable girls called Grace Villa here in Kabale. So I will. Uh, present some of these um, experiences during this presentation. And uh, I think as a researcher in a field research with UNICEF, I have used images as means to gather data and um, just maybe want to encourage all that in a natural way for children to express themselves and we can, we can gather a lot of information through their images. Uh, like we did in Sierra Leone, when we did uh, a baseline assessment for child-friendly schooling. Children were drawing images of ideal school environments, how it is in their lives. So it's a means to gather data also. Then, it's a situation in the world. To know we have is the climate change, unfortunately, many wars and conflicts. We all had the COVID-19 impact on the men. Currently, globally, one uh, percent of adolescents experience mental disorders. Twenty-three uh, percent of children experience mental disorders. And in Finland, uh, even one third girls experience anxiety is very common at the moment in Finland. So here, a lot activist culture uh, like here in uh, Africa. So I really like this idea of caring and learning together how we can better work for our young people and everyone who suffers from different health challenges. Well, we know that lack of funding and availability of mental health services is a challenge everywhere. So we need to find ways to better support, especially our most vulnerable, the children and youth. 
I also wanted to share a few useful websites. In my opinion, these are good for, for young people, but also for families, for professionals. There's this UNICEF web, website on, on my mind that talks about mental issues and gives good uh, tips for young people and also family, uh, parents, workers, professionals. And then also in Finland, we have, uh, during the COVID-19, we developed uh, in, uh, by Professor Andres, Andres O'Randa, uh, psychiatrist, and his uh, team, this Let's Cope Together website that has good tips for uh, how to cope during difficult times in crisis. And then we also Ukraine, as you know, uh, we have this war now in Ukraine. Uh, so we had many asylum seekers oh, coming from Ukraine or refugees from, from Ukraine. So to help them cope also, it was translated in Ukraine. Uh, but it's available in these two websites I find useful myself. So we have this current mental health crisis and we need to find new ways to support youngsters. Uh, as we also know, we have record number of forcibly displaced persons, so many wars and conflicts in the world. And I also always in Finland want to remind people that most of the refugees or displaced persons are hosted in developing countries, not in the West. We only have very few uh, refugees who come to the Western countries globally. But of the journey has many risks and dangers, and unfortunately, since 10 years, since, nine, uh, since 2014, over 20,000 migrants have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. So I also think that it's, um, we really need to receive humans who need help wherever we are. In Finland, when I worked with asylum seekers, we received more uh, asylum seekers than in previous years, it was uh, 2015, and about 10% of these asylum seekers were unaccompanied minors who came without, without families. So I worked with these young people and I'm going to tell a bit about what we did and how it helped, how the art making helped these young people in very vulnerable life situations. Uh, and of course, asylum seekers need psychosocial support because they have to cope with a lot of uncertainty. Many of these people I work with have needs, but they could get in touch with every the obvious trauma experiences are common. But also, I think it's important remember that even if um, very difficult life situations are really reality, not everyone gets traumatized and it is possible to survive trauma. And we all know that there is this phenomenon of post-traumatic growth even. But the fact is that unaccompanied minors are the most vulnerable and many of them, about 30-40% suffer from traumatic stress, insomnia, anxiety, and depression, which are, of course, normal reactions to an abnormal life situation. Because being an asylum seeker is, of course, a very, very stressful life situation. So it's also important to validate these uh, difficult emotions and, and reactions. Uh, but then, to my favorite topic, I could talk all day about expressive arts and how can how they can play an important role. But I want to bring some few observations and research uh, data expressive arts and art therapy and how they can help in in psychosocial support. Uh, what I also find comforting is that uh, social support, compassion by the community that receives asylum seekers and optimism reinforces young asylum seekers mental health so being human and being empathic already helps in a new country 
So it matters how we receive these young people. But then art making in a safe and holding environment, of course, establishing safety is the first step, as we all know, in psychosocial support of psycho psychological first aid. But art making can play an important role. Music or art can decrease anxiety and hormonal stress. So the cortisol Uh, there's a problem of network, and I think uh, she'll be back shortly. And uh, thereafter, I wanted to introduce uh, my Professor uh, Etnet. Uh, Professor Etnet. Uh, Laura, once you are online, please, you can uh, still be able to proceed. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, back. Sorry, uh, the player is very unstable. Yes, you're welcome. Try to speak. Okay. Um, one second, I'm trying to share the presentation again. No. I hope you can I hope you can see the presentation and hear me. Can you someone? Uh, can someone tell if you can hear me? I don't we know. can hear you. You can. We can hear you. I'll continue. Yeah. Okay. Proceed. Great. Okay. Thank you. So I'm sorry for this unstable internet connection. So now about art therapy. The term art therapy may be very dear to some, but for those who is who are not yet very familiar with art therapy, the concept was first used by Adrian Hill in ninth or in UK. And it can be defined as an integrated mental health and human services profession that enrich lives of children's families and communities through um, act making creative process, applied psychological theory and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. So it's an act action based uh, psychosocial support. Uh, that definition was by the American Art Therapy Association, but I also invite you to see the Canadian Art Therapy Association's uh, descriptions on art therapy if you want to find out more. And there are many theoretical approaches within psychodynamic, influenced by Freud and Jung, humanistic influenced especially by Carl Rogers and Gestalt and Ericsson, um, cognitive behavioral, narrative, solution focused and that combines many different approaches based on the client's needs. For myself, humanistic and solution-focused approaches are the most um, familiar that I use in my work. But also it's important that any trauma work, of course, requires collaboration of experienced, trained mental health professionals to ensure the best possible holistic care that we already talked about this morning. So it's a teamwork always. Where art therapy can do its part of professionals. Uh, also, it's good, uh, good to maybe realize that, as we know, causes difficulties to talk. 
And even in the brain scans, it has been shown, PET scans have shown that uh, the Broca's area, the section of the brain that is responsible for speech and language, tends to shut down when a trauma occurs. So therefore, this uh, visual that develops self-expression through image making actually to be more effective help than verbal interventions, especially in the beginning. And as we discussed, the mind and body and spirituality uh, is a whole, we need to find these ways to holistically approach humans to be able to help them as well as we can. Um, then another image from a refugee sent by a 16 year old boy from Afghanistan that I worked with. He's feeling with to be in a refugee center that are lowing. I think there is a, a stable network uh, for Laura. I would like to introduce. We wanted to have a break uh, from 10.30 to 11 a.m., a health break. Uh, we have made some adjustments so that we can be able to take care of our colleagues uh, online waiting. So Laura, you, are you on the still, uh, are you able to continue and proceed? Laura? We've lost Laura. But we'll still be able to have question and answer. Let's try to continue. Okay. Yes, you continue, please. Or do I continue still? Yeah. All right. Um. So, uh, trying to be brief so that we can move on. Um, the point is that we need to provide uh, young people possibilities to share their stories when silence is sometimes imposed by others or even by themselves. So. Sharing the story is an, an important part of healing. Um, I hope you can see the presentation now. So what in art therapy, the power of imagination is very important in feeding the hope. This is an example of um, an image at hospice system, young cancer patient had made it and a poem alone in the ocean and here but also elsewhere the happiness of being a dreamer allows me to escape escape to other worlds always with my compass so during these difficult cancer treatments art enabled to imagine a better future and that I think, Laura, you may need to switch off the video so that you can be able to proceed with your presentation. Um, I think when you switch off your video, it is easier for us to follow up. And I think that is the I'll challenge. Yeah. Okay, proceed. Okay. I'll try. Right. I don't know where we stopped <laughs> now because I'm all looping out all the time, but you, you are talking about let me try to go back. Okay. From trauma and the approaches that are used. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, um, I think we were here. Were we here? Okay. Um, 
So there was this, I don't know where we, where I dropped out. So that's why I, I hope to go back somewhere. I hope you won't bear with me with this bad connection. Um, so creative acts are very important for the young survivors to share their stories, which is an important part of healing. Um, and then there's another image of a hospital setting where um, I worked with young cancer patients in France. Um, during those intense treatments, uh, art helped to imagine a better future. One day it will be easier. Um, and also what also always comforts me uh, gives me hope as um, a helper is the fact that resilience can be learned. We can rebound uh, back even from very difficult experiences. A majority of children have worked with and also according to research show a resilience even after severe adversities and that gives hope. Children are very resilient beings. Um, but of course, neuroplasticity, uh, neuroplasticity, as we know, is greater earlier in life. If we need to enhance children's self-esteem executive function skills that foster resilience. And thinking about the theme of this conference, um, it's also important to think that this could research an important factor in resilience, personal faith gives a lot of hope. Uh, in these art groups, I organized DNF with 12 first steps, helping safety, empathy, and self-compassion. Internal are important in all psychological first aid or types of social support. The goals groups we had with young people was to manage symptoms and stress, validate them also in this together. And then find the strengths and resources they had, fostering self-esteem and cultivating hope, all in through art making. It's of course important to build the trust, go slowly, remember cultural sensitivity and individuality. And for all the uh, challenges, empower the parts their own choices. Uh, then pictures speak more than words. I hope I'm not dropping out. This is something I really wanted to share with as an example of a process. So at that group home where I worked young, on infant wives who had come with families, they were 12 to 16 year olds. Many of them, of course, had to be very difficult. This hyper arousal, as we know, is common among children and youth who have experienced um, trauma. So there are difficulties with self regulation, but there, art can really play a role because it can and offers comforting and bonding experiences increase anxiety and fear and this is also based on research so there's a process of a young 12 years old in the beginning and first image was which is quite difficult often after difficult experience to get this frustration out and then all time it stay home and but to do uh, more concentration, relaxation and joy. So it was wonderful to witness that process from nothing to come sit down, concentrate. So just for art in practice. Uh, and of course, children a lot of emotions 
through the energy and it takes time for these difficult stories to come out. But then there was an uh, example of for two the Europe the I felt my mother died. And then these feelings if before nobody will touch if you don't nobody will come cry for you. Let these things out. The permit part of hopes, dreams for home country, love England, uh, different kinds of often a lot of hope also in the communities, as I said, children are very resilient beings. And then Just an issue of network. I'm sure we experience some of these challenges uh, once in a while, and uh, so uh, I'm sure Lola is concluding or just about to conclude. So let's be uh, slightly patient. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. I'm very sorry about this. No problem. Network Lola, problems. Please yes, I'm about to, I'm about to conclude. I don't know where I dropped out again, but let's try. Uh, I hope you saw the process from mess making to more concentration. I really hope you saw that one. But and I will also share the slides if you wish, so that you get a whole. So more examples of um, of arts. Uh, this this I hope you saw this one example of from uh, an art group mess making from mess making to more concentration and joy. So from hyper arousal to calming down. It seems that I was too unstable. So maybe I'll share the rest of the slides. Professor Bantu, and you can share with participants because I don't know <laughs> if it makes us to, to continue if I drop out all the time. Yes, I think we will, uh, as you've mentioned, that we shall share the slides. And since we have, uh, uh, we are continuing mm. with the presentations. Uh, will allow you uh, yes. some other time so that you can be able to uh, get proper network so we can proceed. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think you may... Maybe one more if I manage to show the last message. Please, please, go ahead. Then uh, I stop. This is just my message after the peer research and practical work facilities for young people for creative self-expression because it be healing and calming in difficult life situations and here is a picture from Graceville from the home of one of the more girls that I'm working with I don't know if you see it I'm sharing the slide but I don't know if you can see it Can you see the image? I hope you saw some of this image at least because it speaks many words. Professor Bantu said to share the with all data and resources. I hope you will benefit from it. So we're going to see this short film about our mental health challenges and how important again is share one story. The men is another means of creative expression and I'm sorry for the problems you got at least some ideas of all of this and I I'm sure I will learn a lot during these two days. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I um, apologize for having given you the title of a doctor yet to be, but in our deliberations, we indicated that uh, later you'll be a doctor, but I apologize for that. But thank you, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you. you very much, and I look forward to supervising your PhD, which you had <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to introduce to you uh, Professor <laughs> Professor Ethernet, Ethernet Mukwanga Ebulazem, uh, is a um, uh, professor of clinical psychology and is an expert in psychotraumatology and is uh, specialized in uh, treatment of gender-based violence and uh, mental health. Um, she's also uh, one of the peacekeeping, peace-building experts from the uh, Association of, Psychology, of Clinical Psychologists, and she's the director of the Neuropsychopathy pharmacology at the University of Chinsasa and she's also in charge of the relations public public relations in the United Nations psychological and uh, clinical uh, in DRC in the Republic Democratic of Congo so professor would you make a few remarks as you'll be followed by uh, the other professor. Professor Etnet, you're welcome. Yes, Professor Yes. yes. Uh, we have a translator in French, so you can still be able to deliver your remarks in French. <laughs> professor? <laughs> Internet. <laughs> 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 Professor Internet, you are online. Um, uh, 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 yes. Professor Internet. Uh, as Professor Internet prepares to make her remarks, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Thierry Matonda. Doctor, are you around, Professor? Oui, je suis là. Okay. Bon. Uh, je voudrais d'abord saluer tout le monde. Merci pour l'opportunité que vous me donnez de, de parler uh, dans cette conférence. Euh, je ne sais pas s'il y a un traducteur. Yeah, proceed. We will have uh, at the end of your presentation, someone is going to make uh, a summary. But I'm aware I also speak nice English. I have attended your presentations before. So you can still be able to communicate in uh, English. Um, but we have someone who's going to make a summary. So whichever you will be very uh OK. Euh, donc je vais me, me présenter. Um, je suis uh, professeur Matonda Manzuzi. Can I confirm just, uh, just a minute? Can I confirm Dr. Mushimi Mana is online so that you can help us interpret that? David David Mushimimana?
David. I'm seeing him online. Ah, uh, okay. Dr. Moshevi. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, Kiwishi, could you call for us, uh, Kiogora? Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Now I have been able to unmute. Ah, okay, fine. David is online. That's fine. Okay, Thank fine. you. So then we can continue. He will interpret the French to English. No, you want me to interpret as he speaks. That's okay. Ah, uh, proceed. Yes, it's still very okay. Prof, you can proceed. Okay. Yeah. Donc, je suis le professeur euh, Maton Dabanzuzi. Euh, je travaille au département de psychiatrie de l'Université de Kinshasa, euh, où je dirige le service de psychiatrie infantile juvénile. Euh, oui. oh, oh, oh. Prof, can you just give me short, uh, uh, short sentences so that I, I can translate if they want me to translate directly. Uh, thank you, Prof. So he has already introduced himself and he's saying that he works in the Department of Psychiatry. Now, from now on, I'll be translating shorter sentences. Thank you, Prof. Continue, sir. Okay. Merci. Uh, et donc, ce matin, j'ai été contacté par uh, Madame Etiennette uh, pour pouvoir participer et parler brièvement de, de, de ce que nous faisons uh, dans notre service de, de, de dans notre département de, de psychiatrie. He was um, contacted today and he was uh, requested to to talk, to tell the conference what they do in the Department of Psychology. Continue, Prof. Uh, not uh, psychology, but uh, psychiatry. Oh, psychiatry, yes. In, yes, in psychiatry. Thank you. Okay. Um, Donc, je n'ai pas eu le temps de, de préparer euh, quelque chose, donc il n'y aura pas de, de présentation. Et je, me parlais, je parlerai assez brièvement de, de ce que nous faisons dans notre département. Il dit qu'il n'a pas eu le temps de préparer une présentation, presentation, donc il ne va pas avoir des slides ou des présentations pour faire, mais il va donner leur expérience, ce qu'ils font dans leur département. Thank you, Prof. Donc, chez nous, comme un peu partout ailleurs, euh, nous faisons de la Enfin, nous, nous avons une, une approche biopsychosociale en tenant they compte have, des aspects biologiques. They have in their department an approach psycho, uh, psycho or psychosocial approach. Yes. Donc, euh, Nous tenons compte des aspects biologiques, des aspects psychologiques et des aspects sociaux. They take care of, they take account of the psychosocial, theological and the social aspects all together. Je me réjouis de voir que cette conférence euh, est basée, euh, fait le lien entre la, la santé mentale Et, euh, et la croyance, ce qui Il est un dit... aspect. Oh, continue, finish your sentence, sir. Ce qui est un aspect que nous intégrons aussi dans nos dans la prise en charge de de nos patients euh, au Congo. Uh, he is happy that uh, in this conference, the, all the aspects that uh, they give, they take attention to, and uh, that is uh, religious psychologists and the uh, health, all of them are integrated in this conference. And that is what they do in their department as they treat their patients. Chez nous, pour les patients, qui, particulièrement les adultes, quand ils présentent certaines pathologies, nous savons qu'il y a des aspects culturels qui jouent un rôle euh, important. They consider cultural aspects very important, so they take care of them when they have patient, adult patients to treat. Ainsi, uh, nous avons à peu près 400 uh, tribus dans notre pays 
et chaque tribu a certaines euh, croyances et certains aspects culturels euh, qui leur sont propres. They have almost about 400 tribes and all the tribes have their own uh, background and the uh, religious and uh, what they, they believe in and that affects uh, their psychology. Ainsi, euh, je prends un exemple. Au centre de notre pays, nous avons une communauté euh, kassaïenne au centre du pays qui pratique ce qu'on appelle le Chibao. To give an example, they have a tribe at the center of uh, the country and uh, those are the people from Kasai and uh, they have, uh, they practice what they call Chibao. Dans, dans la croyance du Chibao, euh, ce qui se passe, c'est que quand une femme a été infidèle, euh, lorsqu'elle va, si elle a un petit enfant ou si elle accouche d'un enfant, l'enfant risque euh, de mourir. La punition du Chibao, c'est que l'enfant risque de mourir si la femme a été infidèle. When uh, a lady in, the, in what they believe, when a lady cheats, or commits adultery, and she happens to give birth to a child. That child, they believe, the child has to be killed. Et donc, il arrive parfois que nous ayons des, des femmes qui viennent, par exemple, avec un trouble psychotique, bref, et qui sont convaincues que leur trouble est la conséquence euh, de leur infidélité. So sometimes they have patients who uh, come having cheated and they believe that what is happening to them is as a consequence of their adultery. Et parfois quand on demande ce qui s'est passé, euh, la femme nous explique qu'il y a eu décès d'un enfant euh, suite à la à l'infidélité à l'infidélité qu'elle aurait euh, qu'elle a commise, qu'elle avait commise. So sometimes when a, a mother loses a child, they believe that probably that is as a result of having committed adultery. Ainsi, dans la prise en charge, en dehors des aspects euh, médicamenteux, en dehors du traitement médicamenteux, nous intégrons aussi cet aspect en recherchant les, les traitements culturels de, ce, de cette problématique. So, them as uh, doctors who take care of those patients, in, in some cases, they do not just concentrate on treatment, uh, giving drugs, but also they integrate that mm -hmm. aspect of culture and looking yeah. for what might be causing uh, that psychological problem, but from the cultural aspect. Et donc, nous invitons la famille et leur demandons Qu'est-ce qu que nous devons faire ou qu'est-ce qui doit être fait pour réparer euh, l'infidélité ou le chibao qui aurait été euh, commis? So the family is involved and in some cases they are, the family is requested to suggest what can be done so that uh, this infidelity is some kind of somehow taken care of or repaired due to the chibao. Belief. Et dans certains cas, nous avons des résultats euh, qui sont euh, qui sont positifs. And in some cases, they have positive results. Ce n'est pas toujours facile d'intégrer cet aspect culturel parce que euh, avec 400 tribus, c'est toujours un peu difficile de savoir euh, réaliser euh, un traitement lié à chaque à chaque à chaque culture. It's not always that easy to get a treatment which comes from the background, the cultural background. But in some cases, they do find uh, such treatments. Mais depuis un certain temps, à la psychiatrie classique, nous avons d'autres euh, problématiques euh, qui prennent de plus en plus de, de l'ampleur. So for some time they have been uh, using this and uh, 
they have had cases of uh, success where the cultural aspect is uh, used for treatment. L'un des problèmes, c'est le PTSD avec euh, What beaucoup de violence. PTSD? One of the problems is a, now, say it again, Prof. <laughs> but please, I don't but, understand. No, no the, what you are calling PTSD. Uh, post, post traumatic stress disorder. Oh, thank you. I'm not in your field, sir, so I, I cannot uh, translate what you are saying. That is why I okay. told you to repeat. Thank you. So, Usually in uh, in French we we use the PTSD uh, as uh, in English. <laughs> okay. Donc, maybe uh, I think, euh, nous uh, avons un problème actuellement avec uh, le PTSD à l'est de de notre pays où il y a uh, de guerre, mais aussi dans le reste du pays où on a beaucoup de violence avec les les gangs. So nowadays they are also faced with a, a new emerging issue of post-traumatic disorders, especially with the, the war in the Eastern Congo. Mais aussi dans le reste du Congo, avec de la violence, euh, avec les bandes organisées. And uh, in the rest of the country, because of organized uh, thuggery and a uh, bands of uh, thieves, uh, robbers. À côté de ce problème, le deuxième problème, c'est que de plus en plus, euh, particulièrement chez les jeunes, il y a des, des, des problèmes de consommation euh, des drogues. And with young people in the communities, they are also having, they are faced with the challenges of drug use with young people. Et chez, chez ces jeunes particulièrement, on n'a on, on a pas que les drogues classiques, cocaïne, euh, euh, marijuana, euh, héroïne. On a des nouvelles drogues qui sont euh, plus ou moins euh, inconnues du monde euh, médical. So, in addition to the known drugs, which he has mentioned, cocaine, marijuana, etc., there are new emerging drugs which are not known and uh, whose uh, treatment is not probably known. Et uh, dans mon équipe de pédopsychiatrie, uh, depuis un certain temps, nous sommes en train de nous battre pour sensibiliser la population sur uh, le trouble du spectre de l'autisme chez les enfants. And uh, in their team, they are now trying to sensitize uh, the population and uh, especially in conjunction with uh, what is a, uh, oh, are you talking about autism? Autism. autism. Yes. Autism. autism, yes. I think that uh, in English they have the same, autism. Yes. Yes. Um, C'est une problématique qui n'est pas connue uh, chez les professionnels de santé et dans la population générale. Autism does not uh, seem to be very known in uh, with uh, the health professionals and uh, the, the community does not know it. So they are now addressing it and uh, they are trying to help. Le combat consiste à ce que les parents, uh, enfin, que la moitié au moins des enfants qui présentent un trouble uh, de l'autisme puissent être scolarisés et puissent ne pas être abandonnés. And uh, their biggest war is uh, to make sure that uh, children who are diagnosed with autism can attend school like other children without being discriminated. Et je pense que pour l'instant, nous avons beaucoup à faire parce que il euh, y a très peu de, de psychiatres Uh, dans le pays, que ce soit à Kinshasa ou ailleurs, et donc uh, c'est un grand challenge. So for now, it's still a very big challenge because the number of psychiatrists is very limited in the country, and those who can diagnose and uh, make or uh, help are limited. 
je pense avoir un peu résumé euh, ce que nous faisons en termes de prise en charge des personnes qui ont des problèmes de santé mentale euh, à Kinshasa. He hopes that he has given a, a summary of uh, what they try to do to help as a, or in the area of psychiatry in the community in uh, Kinshasa and in Congo, in, in DRC in general. Merci pour l'écoute. Thank you very much for listening to me. That is what he says. Thank you, Prof. Thanks. Merci, merci, merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for this presentation. We look forward to collaborating and partnering with the University of Kinshasa. Uh, we have other collaborators from the uh, Harvard University, Marklin Hospital, and we believe that uh, we shall make a difference in terms of the dialogue. I saw you are trying to struggle to explain PTSD. I thought it, is, uh, it has an equivalent in French, schizophrenia, I thought it has an equivalent in French or even mother tongue. So you can see th there's need for us to have a dialogue and see how we can be able to um, translate these psychological conditions in uh, a language that is understood by everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation and we look forward to being with you. We, this uh, conference will be there until tomorrow. So please, you can always be able to join in with the link. I don't know whether Professor Etnet is around, uh, still logged in. Professor Etnet? And if Professor is not in, I know she'll be joining us. I would like to hand over to the Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Mushiri, to make remarks on the adjustments that he has made. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bantu. Thank you very much, uh, the, the people who have, the professors and uh, our guests who have already made presentations. Uh, the dialogue and the conversation continues. Uh, we realize the program, of course, you will see that we are already learning behind the program. So what we want to do in terms of adjustment is to request that uh, if the tea is available, we will take a cup and then come and uh, sit as we progress. Uh, because we have, of course, a, a, a big team in the on online who are most likely not going to take tea breaks. Uh, so in between, we will uh, pick our tea as we continue. We will be going on to, uh, to listen to the next presentation, and uh, I will uh, be expecting that uh, the next presenter, uh, Dr. Masse, will be introduced as we move on. So uh, we will, uh, I will request that uh, Reverend Dr. Kibara please, so that people can take a cup of tea as we progress. Thank you, uh, Dr. Muchiri, our MC. I'd like us to bow for a word of prayer in thanksgiving for a cup of tea. Jehovah God, our creator and our maker, we want to thank you and honor you for bringing us here this day to deliberate on the, this noble issue, noble challenge, global challenge of mental health. As we move on, Lord, we are praying for your blessings that Almighty God we shall come to a conclusion which will yield results. Precious Father, we thank you even for the provision of the cup of tea. We pray that, Lord, you cleanse and embrace it to nourish our bodies. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. Thank you very much. We will uh, uh, later on have uh, the Bishop, uh, Reverend Dr. Alice, introduce the next presenter. She, uh, so that we could be able to move on, uh, Dr. Bishop Reverend uh, will be able to
Yeah, Kenya Methodist University is uh, a university that has three campuses. One is based at um, a main campus in Meru region, and the Nairobi campus, and the Mombasa campus. All these uh, centers are surrounded by other universities like Meru University, Taraka University, Chuka University, and um, Mount Kenya University, Embu University, the Didan Kimathi University. Uh, this university has a very unique environment as you would be seeing in the, on the website. It has cut across all the regions within the country. At Nairobi campus, uh, it has an opportunity of having University of Nairobi, International University, uh, African Nazarene University, uh, Daystar University, all of those ones within the university, uh, the, the central uh, place. And also at Mombasa campus, it also has other um, universities like the Technical University of Mombasa, Pwani University. So you can see that really this is the place to have the integration of spirituality, healing, and mental health. And where Meru is, uh, where the main campus is situated, uh, it has a history of witchcraft, and in fact the name Kaga, Kaga is a connotation that that was a place which was really feared. But with the coming of the Methodist Church, it was able to explain and have people understand uh, that witchcraft or demonology or curses can always be healed through prayer. So it's very important that this conference is generating a dialogue in which we can be participants in the creation of the human soul. And therefore, I would like to consider uh, a partnership that will embody the integration of spirituality, healing, psychiatry, and mental health. I therefore take this pleasure to welcome our participants from other universities and the guest facilitators to this very important university. I'm told that uh, we have some representation from Kisi University, which of course cuts across the country. We have a representation from University of Nairobi and other presentations from uh, the neighboring universities that I've mentioned already. So this partnership is going to bring uh, and address issues and concerns that affect individuals, families, and the clergy. So therefore, I would like to invite uh, the bishop Dr. Reverend Alice to introduce our next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mbantu. Um, our next uh, presenter who is going to speak on uh, ethical considerations in pastoral care is uh, Dr. Masi Mukada Turanira, and before I invite us to I invite him her to speak to us, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Turanira holds a PhD in counseling psychology and a Master of Education in guidance and counseling, both from Egerton University in Kenya. She also has a Bachelor of Education from Kenyatta University, also in Kenya. And she is a practicing 
counseling psycholo psychologists specializing in personal and group therapy and administering psychometric tests, training of peer counselors, stress management, and conflict resolution. Dr. Duranira facilitates seminars on work, retirement, parenting, family, and developmental issues. She is an accredited mediator with the Kenyan judiciary and an accredited lay preacher in the Methodist Church in Kenya. She has over 15 years of experience teaching at the university, and she has taught at the department this uh, morning, and let us put our hands together as we invite and welcome uh, Dr. Duranira. Welcome, Daktari. As she takes the podium, I also want to say that she has written a book, Your Mind, Your Gold Mine. Your Mind, Your Gold Mine. So this is also a resource that we can get from her for use. Thank you, Dr. Duranira. The other information about me has been given. I'm a counseling psychologist and also a lay preacher. So I'm really interested in this conference where we are looking at the whole person or how we can help the whole person. Um, maybe as uh, my slides are wrote there, the topic I'm going to discuss is ethical considerations in pastoral care, ethical considerations in pastoral care, and um, generally, uh, I'll straight away go to the presentation. So um, thank you, thank you for that setup. I will straight away go to the definition of terms. I will be very simple because I can see my audience are quite informed on these things. What do we mean by ethical considerations? Ethical considerations refer to moral principles and the values that guide decision making about what is right or wrong in particular situation, particularly when it comes to treatment of individuals. So um, these principles are important in all areas where we are uh, treating people, we are relating with people. And in this case, more crucial in pastoral care. Uh, in pastoral care, we have the clergy, we have the church leaders who relate with people on daily basis. And that's why it's uh, my feeling that they need to have these moral principles. In other professions, they are quite pronounced. And every profession, they have their own uh, ethical uh, principles that they follow. And I've tried to borrow uh, many of them from other professions that we can use in pastoral care. Uh, the other term is Pastoral care. Pastoral care is the emotional, social, physical, and the spiritual support given to church members by the clergy and the religious community. 
I purposely used the word clergy because it's more inclusive. And I also want to emphasize that it's not only the clergy that gives pastoral care, but uh, they do it in support um, from the church and other uh, members of that given congregation. So although maybe in my hundreds I so much point at the clergy, it's good to note that there are other members of the church or the religious community that also participate in pastoral care. So pastoral care is uh, given mainly to the Nindi, although in many religious communities there is a routine that attends to the, the members or to other members. Now, a pastoral care actually originates in the Bible. I've cited a few examples. There in the Harry Church, we had Christians sharing their belongings according to their needs. This is more emphasized in the book of Acts. We saw the apostles healing. Uh, even during Jesus' time, we saw him attending to individual physical needs, healing them. He took care of their health. He took care of their, their food, the social matters. And so this is not something new in the current society. It is actually uh, something that started all the way in the Bible. Uh, today, we have the community experiencing needs. Uh, I've just listed some of the needs the church is experiencing today. Uh, relationship issues, this is very common. Uh, we also experience these are the, uh, the major issue in even the counseling cases that we receive. Family conflicts, very common today. Uh, financial challenges, sicknesses. Today we don't only have the sicknesses that uh, were there traditionally. We have others coming up, mental illnesses, world pandemics. Uh, we find isolation, loneliness, uh, increased cases of violence that are coming up, crime. Uh, there's a lot of confusion coming from the social media. We have injustices, uh, members who are bereaved. Uh, from the many sources of spiritual guidance, we have a lot of uh, confusion coming up. These are just some of the needs you might find with the members, and I'm happy that uh, we are now going to look at the approach, uh, which is more holistic. That will take care of the spirituality, that will take care of the physical person, of the social person, and all that. So, um, so much has been said about the needs, so I'll not emphasize on them. I'll straight away go to the ethical needs or uh, the moral principles and the values. Um, and due to the uniqueness of various pastoral cases, the clergy need to be more keen on how they treat their members. I said the issues are very dynamic today. Uh, therefore, there is need for moral principles and values which includes the following. What principles can guide the clergy or the other church members who are giving the pastoral care? Uh, some of them cut across other, other um, uh, professions. And I'm going to pick what I thought is actually crucial for the clergy and the pastoral care givers. Uh, straight away, uh, the first uh, principle is confidentiality. In layman's language, confidentiality is keeping secrets or protecting personal information from others or holding a secret. Um, during pastoral care, the pastoral care and givers uh, interact with people at the personal level and gather a lot of information from them. They gather a lot of information, uh, very personal information, and this information needs to be treated uh, with a lot of confidentiality. So confidentiality is important to protect the dignity of the person and to prevent wrong use of information. 
uh, just a mere visit to a person's home and gives a lot of information about that person. And what happens to this information? Uh, sadly, sometimes it defines its way to the pulpit. Other times it defines its way to, to the testimonies. Sometimes it defines its way to other people who actually misuse that information. And this ends up being really demoralizing to the person you're teaching or you're taking care of and uh, sometimes very frustrating. So confidentiality really needs to be observed. What do the pastoral caregiver do with the information they are given? If they have to speak it out to other people, then it should be uh, with the consent of that person. Uh, the other principle is informed consent. Uh, participants are informed on what to expect. Uh, although um, many times we may not really think it's important, it's important to involve the person we are going to take care of, informing them what to expect, what they should be able to expect. So church members should be well informed about pastoral care activities and agree with it. This will enable adequate preparation and accommodation of significant others. And if it is possible, some procedures can be documented. Uh, for example, if it is a given church, they should have a stipulated way. This is what we do when a member of the church has this and that problem. For example, it involves visiting that person at home. And when, we, wh when they are visited, they mean to be in agreement with what is going to happen there. I'll give a, a practical example of some of the things that I've seen happen. Uh, for example, the pastor and his team visit a family and they want to pray for them. And then uh, when this pastor was praying, uh, one of the things he does is touches the hand of the lady whom he was praying for. And what happens is that uh, the lady falls down. Incidentally, the other members of that family did not know that when somebody is praying for, he fall or she falls down. And what happens? The husband started fighting. Why have you uh, made my wife faint? Or what exactly are you doing? So this ended with a lot of commotion and uh, it was not really very interesting. So the members who are really being cared for need to be clear, this is what is going to happen, this is what I will expect, and I agree with it. So the informed consent. Also, if any information will be taken from there to another person, then that also should be in agreement with the person concerned. Related to the same is uh, the principle four of autonomy. Uh, autonomy uh, means to enable independence or freedom for the person we support to make their own decisions for their lives. Um, it's not about the caregiver, it's about the person we are caring for. So um, is this person in agreement? Are they given freedom to make decisions? Autonomy I write respect for individual values and the beliefs that can guide people to use their voice to express themselves and make choices. So uh, what I'm emphasizing on here is uh, although the church has its own way of um, offering the pastoral care, the members or the member concerned should be given the freedom to make the decision and say this is the way I would like it done. I'll still give another example. One of the things uh, done in pastoral care is taking care of people's needs. So there is this time when a church was taking care of the windows and they decided we are going to give an, a, a bag of maize to the heldary uh, windows. And so the members donated and uh, sacks of maize were bought. Now, when they took this bag to one family, a elderly lady, uh, obviously the lady appreciated 
And what happened? The following day, a drunkard son of this lady took the whole bag and sold it. So why it that this lady was involved, she said, I wouldn't like the bag of maize. I would want uh, money, and that will help me out. So as much as we have uh, procedures of how to reach out, uh, autonomy is quite important here. What does the members want? Sometimes we may assume they want prayers, but it's not prayers. They wouldn't want something else. They wouldn't want to be listened to. Uh, then the other principle is justice. Justice simply means treating people fairly. How do we treat the uh, members of the church or the members that we are, or are being taken care of? Is it fair? Justice does not mean treating all individuals the same, but treating individuals appropriately, attending to the members according to their needs. So specifically, when we now come to the holistic person, you'll notice that uh, the needs may not always be spiritual. They will need other things. So we need to be just there. Sometimes there is a disagreement on maybe amount, the time given to this person and the other one. Uh, then the caregiver needs to be just on that. Uh, then fidelity. This one is actually core even in Christianity. Fidelity involves the notion of loyalty, faithfulness, and honoring commitments. This should be actually core in caregiving. The person giving the pastoral care needs to be very faithful, and this will offer the base for trust. This will help the people you're taking care of trust you. I want to emphasize the importance also of, the, of integrity. The clergy should be a person of integrity. Integrity implies trustworthiness and incorruptibility to a degree that one is incapable of being forced to a trust, responsibility, or pledge. So what has been promised uh, needs to be given? And this is a core principle that needs needed to be adhered to in pastoral uh, care. Um, the other um, principle I want to emphasize on is accountability. Accountability, pastoral caregivers shouldn't be answerable to their deeds. Sometimes in pastoral care, um, uh, there is a use of maybe church resources. There is um, contributions that are given and uh, the success of these events goes to how well are our resources used. So in this case, I would like to borrow the idea from the Bible of openness, where the pastoral caregiver is a person of the light, should be able to portray openness in their deeds. This is what I did, and this is the reason why I did this. In caregiving, there are different ways of doing it. Maybe I decided to pray because I found this person needs prayer. I decided to assist to take this person to the hospital because I saw this is what is necessary. So accountability is very important here. Now, there are others still that we can incorporate here. Uh, purity. I know this one is a little bit sensitive, but uh, purity is freedom from guilt of evil. In situation where we are involving the clergy, uh, that aspect should really come out, where although the Bible says that everyone is guilt of, uh, is sort of uh, sinful in one way or another, the person who is giving the pastoral care I need to address this such that uh, they refrain from aspects of uh, 
being uh, not sent with these evil things, associated with evil activities. And then uh, another a principle I would like so much to borrow from the counseling profession is beneficence. That means do good. In pastoral care, the target is doing good, being proactive, and also to prevent harm when possible. How do we handle the pastoral care? Is it promoting goodness? Are we leaving the person in a better place than we found that person? Are we leaving the family better than we found it? Then uh, still related to the same is non maleficence This one means ab above all, do no harm. So in pastoral care, uh, the pastoral care give us try to avoid harm. Uh, that is where no harm is caused in the pastoral care giving. So I picked uh, these as some of the principles that I thought are quite important in pastoral care, and they will really uh, protect the dignity of the church members and they will also guide the caregiver at whatever level. Uh, recommendations. Um, I would recommend that church members uh, face unique challenges. Therefore, they require individualized support. So the caregivers need to know specifically what is the challenge in this situation. So what does the person require? In the introduction, it was emphasized on the holistic person. And so um, I feel that all these uh, dimensions of a human being really should be hit and fall. For example, it will not make any sense praying for a person who is angry, who does not have food. So what is the challenge the members are facing? That one need to be looked at. Then another uh, aspect I thought can be looked at is that um, to cater for the diverse challenges, the church may consider applying both the spiritual model and by uh, psychosocial model in pastoral care. What I mean here is there is a spiritual aspect where we take care of the spirituality, but also there is this other dynamics of the person the biological aspect or setup of the person, for example, what is the age of this person um, and what are they going through in their life? Psychological aspect, this one is biting. Uh, we've seen uh, mental challenges that need to be looked at, social issues, relationships with people. Um, the other aspect, which is more economical, so it needs to be all around. And I felt that um, in order for the clergy and other pastoral care and give us to be able to address the whole man, then they can embrace uh, psychological counseling skill. This can help and more social approach to uh, pastoral care. Um, maybe there I have some references of some of the materials that I, I referred to, and with that, I uh, submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duranira, for that enriching presentation. Of course, uh, take, uh, bringing out the interdisciplinary collaboration that the uh, we heard about in the morning, and we are sincerely grateful that the pastoral aspect is now coming out. And it is going to be quite useful for us. I want to believe that uh, we are moving on well, and uh, probably we'll have some time for maybe questions for those who might have some areas that they need clarification. And now I want to find out whether 
uh, mprenda na Luanga is around either physically or online so that I can invite um, Dr. Monica to lead that session. Meanwhile, we continue taking our tea as we continue uh, listening to the presentations. Is Brenda available anywhere? Brenda na Luanga. Okay, I think I think this person is not around. Then we could have yes. Okay, yes. I'd like to address the room. Okay. terms of pastoral care is a huge one. And I was thinking, uh, Dr. Tari, in your recommendation, uh, probably you might want to earn the issue of basic training for the pastoral care committee uh, in the different churches or different organizations. Because it is one thing to talk about um, the issue of confidentiality and the issue of autonomy, it's another for those members because uh, the pastoral committee usually, uh, they're just picked, they, they are selected, uh, maybe chairpersons of every um, department in the church. So they really have no training at all. So um, I think this becomes a huge, huge problem. And uh, even in the example that you gave, the issue of prayer, uh, when the pastoral visits are done, of course, the question of confidentiality again is not uh, considered because how does the 
the, the, the clergy, the minister or the pastoral care leader, together with the pastoral care team, expect the, the participants or the people that are being visited to really open up on deep issues uh, in the family so that they can present them for prayers. So I think uh, there is a huge gap uh, in terms of uh, pastoral care and the issue of confidentiality. So I, I just thought that um, a huge, huge part of the recommendation of in this paper is to have some basic, absolutely basic uh, training for all the pastoral care uh, uh, teams in our churches so that they can be able to maintain uh, confidentiality and autonomy. Autonomy because I know many of them will go and give advice and say do this, do that, without really considering where the, 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 the people they are visiting are coming from. So that's my take. But that, this was really a good eye opener and I hope as we think of integration, uh, those of us who are integrating all this and especially from the pastoral care team, uh, these ethical considerations will be highly considered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daktari, for that input. I will actually hand it on the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Anybody else who has anything about the presentation? I hope those online are okay. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tranera, for that, again, that presentation, which brings out a lot that need um, attention, especially with the pastoral care team. I do not know whether uh, we have online Professor Baguma. I'm not sure whether Professor Baguma is there because in his address, he talked about uh, integrating years, uh, pastoral care, or um, spirituality with mental health care. And I have been wondering as we spoke whether we need, again, training like Monica has brought out. Because uh, for pastoral care team, again, to be able to identify, to care, and to be able to help, the mental health uh, people, they still, again, need training. So I, I, I think possibly we are suggesting that there is some training that is required so that we can be able to integrate the two and also be of help. Those of us who are in the Ministry of Pastoral Care, the clergy and the laity. Thank you so much. So far, so good. Um, is the next presenter now ready, Daktari? Yes, we are ready, uh, Bishop. Okay, if, if you are then, I would like to invite you, Dr. Peter Mweti, to bring to us uh, the next uh, presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, chair for this uh, conference. I, I have the pleasure to introduce Stella Waki Moriyuki uh, to this uh, conference this afternoon. Uh, Stella is married with the two children. Uh, she is a certified professional mediator accredited by Kenyan Judiciary. She is a Christian and a police officer with the Kenya Police with the designation of uh, Chief Inspector of Police. Uh, currently, Stella is stationed at uh, National Police Leadership uh, Academy in Ngong, where she is a psychologist um, on the academy. Stella holds uh, a degree, master's degree in Counseling Psychology from Kenya Methodist University. 
She has done very insightful uh, research on depression and uh, suicidal ideation among the police officers in Nyeri County. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Wachira and myself, we are delighted to present to you Stella as she presents to us this insightful research with the hope that it will generate a productive conversation that surrounds our, around this problem and more so within uh, Kenya and maybe beyond. So uh, please allow me to present uh, our presenter this afternoon, uh, Stella Waki Moriuki. Thank you, Doctor. I'm presenting influence of depression on suicidal ideation among police officers in Nyeri Central, sub county, Kenya. And before I forget, I appreciate Kenya Methodist University, who have really mentored me in the psychology field. So I appreciate so much. So, police job entails difficulty responsibilities, such as dealing with human suffering, mistreated children, and quick life or death judgments. So you find that police officers, all the concerns of the society, uh, sufferings like uh, death, murder, they are called upon by the members of the public or the society to deal with them. Additionally, a lot of social accountability and stringent legal standards are imposed on police as they cope with these demands. So you find that through their work or through dealing with these difficult situations, uh, most of them end up being stressed. And also, if they are not taken care of, they fall into depression. Uh, studies by CDC and who suggest that rates of suicide and suicide ideation are particularly high among officers compared to other various occupations. Globally, the prevalence of su suicidal ideation among police officers is between 10% and 30% with continental and country variations. Studies found a high prevalence of suicidal thoughts among police officers in Canada, North America, and United States of, uh, of America. Results of a study by Wasserman indicated that 8.30 of police officers in South Africa found a high level of suicide ideation. Question found a lifetime suicidal ideation of 28%, suicide planning of 3%, suicide threat of 21.6%, and 12-month suicidal ideation of 26.9% among police officers in Ghana. Having suicidal thoughts is a direct risk factor for suicide in people with depression. Depression is a mood or emotional state that is marked by feelings of low self-worth or guilt and a, re a reduced ability to enjoy life. So you find that those um, with depression, they don't see any value in life. They don't see anything of interest in their lives. During a depressive episode, the person experiences depress a depressed mood. And that is feelings of sadness, irritability, empty, or a loss of pleasure or interest in activities for most of the day, nearly every day, for at least two weeks. Depressive symptoms, uh, symptoms in police officers may be brought on by long-term exposure to job stress, long-term exposure to job stress, meaning that uh, maybe 
it is started slowly by slowly until now uh, they become so much affected by the exposure that they have gone through. Depressed police officers are more likely to suffer from major depressive disorder and to have greater levels of depression symptoms. And those who suffer from depression have a worse quality of life. We can just imagine being served by a police officer who has a very bad or a worse quality of life. You cannot expect much from that police officer. In Kenya, reports, uh, National Police Service reports that six police officers commit suicide annually due to social, financial, and workplace pressures, mental health experts have said. The breakdown of police suicide by counties shows that Nyeri County has the highest number of police suicide outside the metropolitan areas like Nairobi, Kisumu, Mombasa, and Nakuru. That's a report by the National Police Service, the year 2021. The reasons behind this surge of suicide are not clear, and there is scarcity of studies interrogating this problem. My objective was, or our objective, was to establish the influence of depression on suicidal ideation among police officers in Nyeri Central Sub-County, Kenya. Methods used, uh, research design, descriptive survey was used. Study location, this study was carried out in Nyeri uh, Central Sub-County. The target population were police officers working in Nyeri Central Sub-County, which com uh, were comprised the target population. Then uh, we have the sampling, you can see it there. To ensure that both male and female police officers were included in the sample, start five random sampling. <laughs> collection. Data in the study was collected during three, uh, using three research instruments, that is a questionnaire, a focus group discussion, and an interview schedule. Data analysis. Quantitative data was analyzed using descriptive statistics, chi-square, and a regression using SPS, uh, SPSS. Qualitative data content analysis was used to analyze qualitative data. Ethical considerations. Ethical review, search permit, voluntary participation, informed consent, anonymous, uh, anonymous and confidentiality. Then we have the results. Prevalence of suicidal ideation, majority that is 78.4 percent of the respondents did not have suicidal ideation, as we can see there. Association of demographic characteristics with suicidal ideation. Uh, we have gender and working experience were significant. Male respondents and those with a high working experience were more likely to have suicidal ideation. As we can see in the table there, focused group discussion participants were asked to describe de uh, depression among police officers. All participants indicated that many police officers were depressed, which put them in danger of suicidal ideation. Depression is high among police officers. 
Many police officers are depressed because of the work and family issues. Depression causes helplessness and feeling of neglect by the whole society and lack of importance causing police officers ABBA the suicidal ideation. Maybe they do a lot to the community. They expect a good feedback from the members of the public, but in, instead, they feel that they are criticized or the members of the public does not even uh, appreciate their effort. So they feel that they are left alone. They feel that whatever they are doing is of no importance to anyone. At the long run, they end up having suicidal ideation because they, what they would like is just to, uh, at least to, have a, uh, um, to be motivated by the members of the public and also recognizing the work they do after um, experiences several challenges and also putting their lives at risk. Participants in the interview who comprised mental health counselors and senior police officers were also asked to describe police officers' depression and how it influences suicidal ideation among police officers in the study area. In agreement with the participants in the interview, the participants indicated that depression was high among officers and it contributed to suicidal ideation. Depression in police officers is caused by poor working conditions, such as inadequate equipment and working far away from their homes with excessive overtime. This results to suicidal ideation and feeling of helplessness. As we know, most of us, or maybe a strong family, when you have a, a strong family, you live with them. When you are stressed or you are facing challenge, at least you can get comfort from either your wife, your husband, your children. But here we find that they work far away. So whatever they go through, they are just there silent in their, their houses. Nobody talk to them, nobody uh, able to understand them. So you find that working far away from their homes where they can get support it also affects them. Above finances to family distance, an officer wakes up to abhorrent scenes as a routine. Rape, murder, defilement, and accidents are all scenes which react negatively to officers' mental well-being. The combination of all those can lead to, or rather, results to depression. A depressed mind can easily bring suicidal ideation due to misapprehension of facts, like visiting scenes of murder. You find that maybe it is a husband who has murdered his wife, or you find a police officer has shot his wife, has also shot himself in presence of the children. You go and visit such scenes. There are always flashbacks of what you saw. So they end up falling into depression. They can imagine the cry of these children. They can imagine also in terms of uh, rape, when the reports are made to police officers, when they visit, they just imagine of their family members. They see their sister crying because she has been raped. They see their uh, daughters because they have been defiled. So there's a lot which they go through after even visiting such scenes. Uh, it is what we call vicarious traumatization. Influence of depression on suicidal ideation. There was a significant relationship between depression and suicidal ideation. The table below there shows. Discussion. This result suggests that depression is high among police officers. This agrees with the results of Banner all those have listed there, where there was an alarming high rate of depression and suicidality among police personnel comparable to that found 
by Jiro. This research also corroborates the work of Nota and the other one there, who discovered that suicide ideation is strongly and positively connected to depression among police personnel. So I go to conclusion. The researchers concluded that depression influences suicidal ideation among police officers in Nyeri Central sub-county Kenya. Although the prevalence of depression was low, respondents with depressive symptoms were found to be at risk of suicidal ideation. Preventive strategies. Provide professional counseling services in all police stations. Uh, for now, police officers have uh, counselors in county or the regional levels, but you find that at the police stations, there are no counselors. So for a police officer to go all the way, maybe the county headquarters is far, they find it so difficult or if they need a counselor uh, urgently, sometimes it is not so easy. Develop a system of identifying low level cause of psychological distress. This will help before things get worse. Provide chaplain services in all police stations by identifying officers with a call and a passion to help others. This could be very much important to police officers because serving chaplains at the station level with a call and a passion. Those who uh, their interest is to help their fellow police officers. Their interest is to see that uh, they are connected with the spiritual world. They are connected with God. Those who can also stand them in time of need those who can offer support to them. Uh, it brings a lot of a uh, sense that they feel that they uh, a sense of belonging to the service or to the organization. They feel that there are people who care for me. They are people who are concerned with my life and with my family, which can help uh, be a, a great help to police officers, to the Kenya Police Service, the National Police Service, and also the nation as a whole. Increase value for family. Uh, this can be done by the counselors and also the chaplains for police officers to know the value of having families. Uh, even if they've worked far away from their family, it is important for them to know that, to know how to balance family and, and uh, work. Because a, a strong family, uh, if a police officer has a strong family, some challenges can be solved even within the family setup. But if now they have broken families, they feel so rejected, there's now nobody they can lean on. Uh, so it is important for them to understand the value of a family. Increase value for mind, body, and spirit connection. It is good for police officers to be able to remain to be, uh, aware that uh, mind and body and spirit connection is very important to them. Uh, sometimes you see a police officer in uniform kneeling down and praying, and then uh, they are being seen as uh, this being seen as abnormal or something so strange. How can a police officer kneel down and pray? They should know that they need God in their lives. They need to know that uh, there is a supernatural being. Uh, who is the master of their lives, apart from what we do, apart from what they do each and every day. Because let's say they encounter an attack. Some of their colleagues are killed and they remain. If they have a strong or they have a connection with God, those who will appreciate God, those who will say that surely, it has taken the hand of God for me to be spared. I am the only survivor will come closer to God than before. But those without any connection, 
they might end up complaining and saying that this is a service that is so risk to my life. I, was, I, I, I almost died. I was almost killed. They complain a lot. And um, uh, they might end up in depression. But those who know their connection with God, those who see God with their survival or with the protection which God has given to them, in fact, they'll end up uh, giving their testimonies and encouraging others to be connected to God who has saved their lives. So we need the chaplains and the counselors are very important in the National Police Service. The uh, conclusion, oh, sorry. Training police commanders on basic counseling skills, management and leadership skills, specifically humanistic approaches. It is very important for police commanders, the senior police officers. If they are taken through counsel, uh, basic counseling skills, they will be able to know when a police officer needs uh, um, counseling help or an expert help instead of uh, taking administrative action against the police officer. It will be important for them because they'll be able to understand this person does not need administrative action but needs to go through counseling or needs to be seen by a chaplain before, um, before taking any action that can arm the police officer. Trainings and sponsored supervision to chaplains and counselors in the National Police Service. Trainings are very important to chaplains and counselors because uh, counselors, uh, chaplains also will need to have the counseling skills so that they can handle their clients or the, uh, their fellow police officers because there are some issues and you can't tell somebody just to kneel down to pray for that person, yet you have not uh, yet you, you have not talked about the real issue, what that person is undergoing. So the, uh, the skills, counseling skills are very important to the chaplains and also supervision to counselors because they hear a lot. They hear a lot, they get more stories and uh, stories which they also can also lead them to depression. It is important if they get sponsorship for such trainings and also if the organization can be organizing for such, for the counselors and chaplains will be very important. Develop a healthy and wellness strategy to ensure well-being of police officers by having workshops which will allow them to share their journey of life. These workshops uh, will be very important to police officers when they share the journey of their lives because through sharing you'll find that uh, if a police officer shares all the challenges he has undergone and how he handled them, you'll find there are others who will learn more from that officer. They'll come to realize that it is not only them who are undergoing the same challenge, others underwent the same and they were able to overcome. So they'll be able to learn of skills or get knowledge on how to handle their current challenges they'll be able to know that it is not only them who are facing a mountain. And if they are facing those mountains, they will overcome because others have done it. And also, it will also bring a sense of whatever they are undergoing, it is just normal because they are not the first to undergo the same. Recommendation. In every organization, there are different types of resources we have land, vehicles, machines, human, ETC. As machines and vehicles are serviced for better performance, human resource is supposed to be serviced. Human resource is supposed to be serviced. For example, in the Bible, in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 30, it talks of how Amalekites invaded Ziglag. 
pay troop, the wives, the children, and also property which belong to the Israelites. And on the way, uh, the, one of the Amalekites had a servant who was an Egyptian. And that servant was sick. So they left him on the way to die. Because according to them, he had no importance. According to them, he was just a useless person. But on the way, when David and his men came and found all that happened, they decided to pursue them. And before they decided to pursue them, uh, David's men wanted to stone him. And he was very much distressed. But the Bible says that David in encouraged himself in the Lord. So even as we talk of uh, the mind, the body, and the spirit connection, that spirit connection that David encouraged himself in the Lord made him to be strong and able to pursue his enemies. So on the way, they found the Egyptian servant. And they gave him food, water. They refreshed him. And he gave them information and also the direction that the Amalekites took. And they were able to pursue them. They overtook them. They took their belongings back. They killed them. And there was a very great victory. It is because they made use of this man who was seen as a useless person by the Amalekites. So as with the police service or the organization. There is no police officer who is useless. Only that it is just challenges that comes on the way. Sometimes they become depressed. Sometimes uh, it is what we call when they have hallucinations. We see them as mad people. We say that they should not be, gi be given a rifle, which is very true, they should not be given at that time. But what next? It is good to seek uh, assistance from the counselors within the police service. It is good for them to be reserviced, to be looked up, uh, at, to be encouraged, to take measures to make that, to make sure that this police officer who is so weak, who is so challenged, whom people are terming as insane, or in other words, madness, can be of a great help to himself, his family, the society, and the organization as a whole. Let the police officers be serviced so that they can give better services to the members of the public. Police chaplaincy, counseling, and the psychosocial support directorate to be facilitated sufficiently to conduct their mandate as soon as possible when required by provision of motor vehicles and finances for hospitality. The services cannot be rendered without vehicles. If the directorate will uh, be given uh, their own vehicles or logistic-wise, if they will be looked at, it will be very important. Because uh, let's say a, a station has only one vehicle. There is someone who needs help somewhere. Maybe there's a police officer who is in, state in, a, in a state of wanting to commit suicide. The counselor or chaplain cannot uh, visit that police officer immediately because maybe the vehicle has gone to uh, visit a crime of scene. Maybe officers have, have used the same vehicle in the station to visit a crime scene. So Sorry, Stella, if you could uh, hurry up a bit. Your time is yes. over. Yeah. So if they have their own, it will be very important for them and the work will be made smooth for the cha uh, ca chaplains and the counselors. Then the key words used there are suicide, suicidal ideation, mental health, depression, and police officers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella, for that uh, informative and eye-opening research that you're doing there and your supervisors addressing a pertinent issue that is affecting most of us currently. Thank you so much.
I hope we have gotten so much informed about that and can be able to contribute to how we can work together with the police officers so that uh, well, if they are depressed, they can seek help, uh, exposure to crime, causing them again to uh, be also wanting to commit the same. Thank you so much. Let us appreciate uh, Stella again, and thank you. At this juncture, I want to now hand over this program to uh, our chairman, Rev, um, Professor Mbantu, so that uh, he can take us to the next level and invite the next speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation by uh, Stella Waiki Moriyuki on the depression and suicidal ideation among police officers in Nyeri Central Sub County. That is a very, very productive presentation. And uh, <clears throat> I'm aware that the forces, servicemen and women within East Africa uh, suffer undetected levels of psychological conditions, including stress and depression. And uh, it is important that in this meeting we can have a dialogue which has substantially been able to address. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking that these police officers, we could be able to classify and categorize them like, for example, we have those on traffic, dealing with traffic. We have those that deal with fire. We have those ones that escort the VIPs. So we'd be able to see the level of depression and suicidal ideation, and then be able to provide an intervention. <laughs> and in this dialogue, uh, we should be able to provide scenarios illustrating integration of psychiatry and spiritual approaches for mental health. Because I'm aware that if we consider a patient experiencing depression and existential distress, a psychiatrist may provide cognitive behavioral therapy to address depressive symptoms, while a spiritual leader may offer pastoral counseling to explore existential concerns and provide spiritual support. So together, they create <clears throat> a comprehensive treatment plan that addresses both psychological and spiritual needs. <clears throat> so that's the reason, that's the dialogue that we are having within these two days. And we could still be able to do research on the strengthening of the psychosocial support of servicemen and women, maybe uh, covering the whole country or even East Africa. <clears throat> so but I think that's a very good thing and uh, I'm excited that the next presenter is Dr. Um, Monica K. Gitonga. Uh, Dr. Gitonga uh, is a, a, a licensed lay preacher. Dr. Gitonga has had a number of uh, years of experience and practice. He's actually renowned within Meru as the expert in an expert and resident consultant for psychological issues at the Olive Counseling and Training Center. Before she established that, she's been a lecturer at Kenya Methodist University for many years and she is one of the first uh, clinical psychologists that graduated around 2016 with a, um, a master's and a PhD 
respectively in counseling psychology and clinical psychology. Dr. Gitonga Monica um, is um, a, a very interesting um, scholar because her training in agricultural <coughs> education uh, gives her an iad stick in implementing what we call hot culture therapy, where people can be able to spend most of their time under stress or duress in a plantation or in a, a hot culture. Therefore, it gives me pleasure to introduce you Dr. Monica Gitonga to make her presentation this time and she'll just take about 15 minutes and then we shall have responses and I want to encourage our viewers that we shall have an opportunity of question and answer like I had already started asking the previous <coughs> presenter to provide I was asking can you provide a case scenario illustrating the integration of psychiatric and spiritual approaches for mental health. So I believe in this presentation, uh, title is incorporating mindfulness and contemplative practices. She will lead us through the dialogue and we should be able to make uh, comments. Let's welcome Dr. Monica Gitonga. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bantu. Um, I must say that uh, I feel refreshed to be back into the academy, which I exited from close to, I should think, one and a half years now into full-time psychotherapy practice. Um, it is very, very refreshing, and particularly to meet all of you colleagues, um, I, I really feel at home. I did not know how much the initial training in agriculture impacted on me, because even when I translated from that to the current um, mental health professional, it is actually um, that training that I'm sure, though in a very subtle way, influenced my setting up um, a retreat garden. And uh, Professor Vantu, you just reminded me that uh, uh, that is part of therapy in the sense that uh, people would come there and just find peace uh, and be able to be connected with themselves, with the environment, and above all, be connected with God. I have been introduced very well, and I appreciate this. But let me also say that um, currently I'm the chairperson of the Kenya Counselors and Psychologists Association in, in Meru region. And uh, in this conference today, I have quite a number of members who are here uh, on their own volition, though of course we had invited them to come and be part of this conference. I thank them for this. Uh, my presentation is um, on um, integrating integrating mindfulness and contemplative practices uh, in mental health. I want to begin by saying that looking back on my journey, I am reminded of a moment that forever 
altered my perspective. It was a seemingly ordinary day, but it held within it a lesson that would reshape the way I saw the world. It was in 1998, August, when the US Embassy was bombed in Kenya, and this did not spare the neighbors to the, to the US Embassy. My two beautiful nieces, ages 15 and 16, died. There being no serious counseling services in the country then, makeshift services, agencies, were quickly set up to carry out PFAs, psychological first aid. Never mind, the services caused more damage than good to a great extent. Living in the rural areas far away from where the action was, no one ever thought that the victims and roots with close aunties, uncles, and above all, loving grandparents. We received no attention of care whatsoever. This set my mind thinking, and in 1999, I began the journey of further studies if I need to be of help with knowledge and skill to anyone going through traumatic experience, thus culminating to my acquisition of a PhD in clinical psychology and thus change of my career. Albert Einstein once said, the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. As I reflect on the evolu evolution of my own beliefs and viewpoints, his words resonate deeply. I present this perspective paper as a conscious view on a topic of importance. In my perspective, the topic before us is of utmost importance at this point in time where issues to do with mental health or wellness and or mental illnesses are in the lips of almost all individuals. When we talk about mental health issues, we are taking off emotional disturbances, whether mild or severe, mental stresses or distresses, and or mood disorders, such as depression, bipolar, or bipolar mood disorder. We're also talking about anxiety disorders, personality disorders, psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia and or psychosocial disabilities leading to significant distress. We're also talking about impairment in important areas of functioning and risk of self-harm. Mental illnesses involve significant disturbance in thinking emotional regulation, or behavior. Most people do not have access to effective care or treatment. Yet, most important to note is that effective prevention and treatment options do exist. Stressors of everyday life. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic in 2019 never made it any better. Individuals lost work, businesses, and in addition, many lost loved ones. This is particularly true in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the mental health treatment gap was already significant prior to the pandemic. The medical staff were not spared either. The pandem pandemic infringed a devastating toll on the world's health care workers with grief, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicide being just a few of the potential long-lasting effects. Doctors are already twice as likely as the general population to die by suicide, and women are the most vulnerable. Close to one billion people globally have a mental disorder, and those with severe mental disorders tend to die 10 to 20 years earlier than the general population. 
Suicide is claiming the lives of close to 800 people every year. One person every 40 seconds. And it is the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 29. Relatively few people around the world have access to quality mental health services, especially in low and middle income countries, where more than 75% of people with mental, neurological, and substance use disorders receive no treatment for their condition at all. But we ask ourselves, where are we at? What is the magnitude of the burden? You allow me to omit quite a number of slides there because of, in, in, in the interest of time, which I'm giving the statistics because I'm sure, as I've said there, the issue of mental illnesses and mental health is in the lips of each and every person. So globally, we have uh, statistics um, there. Uh, and I want to omit all that and talk about caregiving. Lack of access to quality mental health care is a serious global problem with 57% of all cases not getting any help. The reason for this is cited as the cost of care, which is high and out of the reach of many. There are gaps in insurance coverage, a, lunch, I mean a lack of qualified psychiatrists and psychologists, and uh, our presenter from DRC mentioned that because they don't have enough psychiatrists or psychologists. And actually, I remember in 2013, I was contracted by an organization from Canada to go and help in DRC. I was there for five weeks in one of the biggest hospitals called Pansy Hospital to help in de-traumatization because the medical staff, including the support staff, are traumatized because of the war trauma. So they don't have enough. And there's a disconnect between primary care systems and behavioral care systems. Caregiving burden, standards have reported moderate to severe caregiver burden characterized by financial constraint, productivity loss, and loss of employment. So in a nutshell, and from the ensuing, Mental disorders are not only debilitating, but are also risk factors for fatal outcomes, such as suicide and, of course, mortality. Now, I also omit statistics in Africa because I'm sure you are well informed about mental health in, uh, in our continent. Uh, probably a little bit about Kenya. World Health Organization report ranked Kenya the fifth among African countries with the highest number of depression cases. Mental health experts have made an estimation, an estimation that one in every four Kenyans among patients attending routine outpatient services suffer from a mental health related issue ranging from mild to severe disorders. Kenya's mortality rate due to suicide is ranked 29th worldwide, with an estimate of 5.6 per 100,000 persons. And due to the monumental challenge observed, the government set up a task force on mental health in 2019, whose report was released uh, in 2020. And I want to say in the words of the chairperson, one, Dr. Frank Jenga, he said this, I quote, the report is the voice of the people calling to be heard on the important mental health agenda, which is a ticking time bomb that Kenyans are sitting on. During one of the Mandaraka Day celebrations, our former president, Uhuru Kenyatta, acknowledged that the country was facing a mental health crisis. Challenges of managing mental conditions in Kenya include low awareness, limited treatment options, and implied high costs of treating mental illnesses. Um, quite a lot has been done um, in terms of mitigation globally, and I just want to mention to you that uh, uh, um, 
there's always a World Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, which comes in the month of uh, uh, May. And um, this time around, this year, the theme is movement, moving more for mental, for mental health, my health, my right. This was set by the World Health Organization in collaboration with United for Global Mental Health and the World Federation for Mental Health. Moving for mental health, they are encouraging people from all countries to support a global movement calling for greater investment in mental health. And concerning this, uh, the Director General of WHO says this, and I quote, as we continue to live through a global pandemic, we need movement on mental health, perhaps more than we have ever needed before. We need to move for our own mental health, the mental health of our families, friends, and colleagues, and more importantly, so that there is uh, a massive increase in investment of mental health services at the national and in an international levels. And then Alicia London, CEO, the founder of United for Global Mental Health says, our world wasn't set up to respond to the growing mental health needs before COVID-19. And it certainly isn't now. That is why now more than ever, we need the world to move for mental health. And as individuals, communities, businesses, governments, and funders, we must prioritize action, action on and investment in the mental health. I quote the last one, uh, Daniels, president of the World Federation for Mental Health, he says, mental health is affected by many factors and circumstances. It touches on everything poverty, equality, and development, which is why we need to move to ensure greater investment and greater access to mental health for all. So please note that uh, globally, Mental Health Day is always on 10th of October. Let's take note of that. And know that the World uh, Mental Health Day color is a green label. So I hope that the this of this uh, um, platform will remember to wear that because it is the universal symbol for mental awareness where we let all know that we prioritize their mental well-being as well as ours. Then September 15 uh, to 15th October is the Suicide Prevention Month. So a lot is really taking place. Um, I think I want to bypass Kenya, uh, but note that uh, we, there is a mental health policy that was done in 1989, and one reviewed for 2015 to 2030, where the recommendation is to use multidisciplinary approach and guided by the Ministry of Health, the policy underscores the need for corroborative intervention. So we are just in cost even in this conference. I um, think I want to bypass all that so that I can come to this treatment model. I want to suggest that in Kenya, quite a number of organizations have come up, like the, there's the Kenya Psychiatrist uh, Association, uh, which helps in um, research and of course treatment using the, 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 the medical model. And then we have the Kenya Counselors and Psychological Association, which offers professional counseling uh, services in the country. Then we have Nakanda and so on. But there are several private counseling centers licensed to offer the so much needed therapeutic services. And should I say, Olive Counseling and Training Center, of which I am the proprietor and the consulting psychologist there, is one of them. Moving forward, with all this being done, to reach the individual, however, institutions, families, and individuals have a bigger stake 
in working through their mental health issues and maintain, maintaining good mental wellness. The interventional models that are used will vary, but one of the standard, practiced, and highly recommended interventional modality is the one before us and the subject of this presentation, mindfulness and contemplative practices. This model is client-centered. A therapist will use it in session, basically to empower the client who in turn will apply it on self so as to work through mental health challenges and or maintain good mental health. Um, uh, after this presentation, we are going to do uh, one contemplative practice together with you just to have a feel of what it all means. Contemplation is the practice of being fully present in heart, mind, and body, which is in a way allows you to creatively respond and work toward a positive response to a situation. It can be said to be a prayer or a meditation, and there is a practice of deep listening to better connect with ourselves and the divine love. Any contemplative practice is the way we work out the experiences that words elude, how we learn from them, and how bravely we allow ourselves to be transformed by them, even when our normal modes of thinking can't make sense of them. When we consider it as a prayer, then we can accurately say contemplative prayer is a practice for a lifetime, never perfected, yet always enough. Each time we pray, our visual patterns of thinking and feeling will inevitably interrupt and distract us from deep listening. But it's through our repeat repeated failings that we encounter God's grace and experience a transformed mind. The contemplative mind is about receiving and being present to the moment, to the now, without judgment, analysis, or critique. This is what we can call holistic, heart-centered knowing, where mind, heart, and soul, and the senses are open and receptive to the moment, just as it is. In short, Contemplation can be described as entering a deeper silence like we have now, and deeper silence and letting go of our visual thoughts, sensations, and the feelings in order to connect to a truth greater than ourselves. And this is what mental wellness is. I want to go to mindfulness, because this is the final part of the presentation, which is one of the contemplative practice. And by the way, there are, there are, there are several. There is yoga, yoga is part of it. Um, mindfulness is part of it. And the meditation, all those are part of contemplative practices. So we picked mindfulness. Mindfulness means the mind is fully attending to what's happening, what you are doing, and to the space you are moving through. It is the ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we are doing, and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. Mindfulness practice has played an important role in the world's religious, philosophical, and humanistic traditions since the olden days. The practice has increasingly been incorporated into contemporary medical and psychotherapeutic context. Although the views and the practical concerns by the different traditions vary, they however share the perspective that the mind can be trained through contemplative practice and that doing so can help bring about a state of optimal well-being. So mindfulness, being present, can help in cultivation of self-knowledge, insight, 
and wisdom. Cultivation and strengthening of purpose and meaning in life. Where purpose and meaning in life are one of the most robust predictors of psychological well-being. Bringing the wandering mind back to the present moment, a skill that is commonly taught and practiced in mindfulness-based stress reduction classes or therapy session. In psychotherapy, we have several uh, theories. One of, one of them is called Gestalt theory. And uh, the Gestalt theory insinuates that uh, you bring the mind of the client to the here and now. So if they have had traumatic experiences a long time ago, and uh, you cannot go back there, maybe deal with whoever or whatever caused that uh, experience, you train the mind and bring the mind to the here so that they experience what they experienced that time, long time ago. And now with the support, caring support of the therapist, they are now able to work through or process the traumatic experience. Uh, this person says that uh, if the heart wanders or is distracted, bring it back to the point quite gently and replace it tenderly in its master's presence. Even if you did nothing during the whole of your hour, but bring your heart back and place it again in our Lord's presence, though it went away every time you brought it back, your hour would be very well employed. So mind wandering, but then mindfully bringing it back to where you are because practice makes perfect. Uh, mindfulness is known to have several benefits. One is that it is used in the treatment and management of stress, anxiety, depression, pain, insomnia, and even blood pressure. Clinical experience, however, has shown that mindfulness as an important tool in treating personality disorders like obsessive um, compulsive disorder. Uh, it also improves the effectiveness of uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, I want to do, go to the practical because I think we we'll do ourselves a disservice if we don't say something about how it is done. Yeah, summarize, summarize so that we have a conversation. We okay. need a dialogue, eh? Yes, particularly in the area of how to do it, Dr. Muchiri, how to practice mindfulness so as to get to that level of optimal well-being. It involves breathing exercises, deep breathing, deep muscle relaxation, and guided imagery. It also involves paying attention. It's hard to slow down and notice things in a busy world, but take time to experience your environment with all your senses, the touch, the sound, the sight, the smell, and the taste. One time, some chemo officers told me that uh, they have a plan of developing a garden, a quiet garden, and I can't wait to have this garden developed because that is where officers or students would go to be able to experience, to get reconnected with themselves and with the environment. When you eat a favorite food, take the time to smell, taste, and truly enjoy it. Live in the moment. Accept yourself. Focus on your breathing. When you have negative thoughts, try to sit down, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. I do do this uh, shortly. Focus on your breath as it moves in and out of your body. Sitting and breathing for just a minute is helpful. Of course, there are many others, some that are well structured. One of them is called the body scan meditation, sitting mindfulness, walking meditation, 
when and how often should we practice contemplative practices? The simple ones, you can do it anytime, anywhere. The structured ones, you need some time and you need to create time and have a good space that is quiet so that you can be able to practice. In conclusion, there is no health without mental health. Mental health is our biggest wealth. Practice mindfulness as one of your contemplative practice. And with that, I suggest that we do a breathing exercise so that you can have a feel of how it works. So are the participants ready? I want to walk you down uh, a breathing exercise. Now, I want you to sit down comfortably with your feet on the floor. I know you may have heard about breathing exercise many, many times, but this one is so professional and it is touching on an aspect of our mind and our heart. So, just sit comfortably and have your hands on your laps. Well, at that, just feel yourself. Close your eyes. Just feel yourself. Notice your breathing. Notice your breathing. How you breathe in and how you breathe out. Just be aware of yourself. And I'll give you instructions on how to breathe in and how to breathe out. We'll do this only three times, and that's enough. So you're going to breathe in through the nose. Please note, through the nose, your feet are on the floor, your hands are on your laps. So you're going to breathe in through the nose, and then I'll tell you to hold, and I'll tell you to breathe out, and this time through your mouth. And it will be slowly, slowly, until you push everything that you breathed in, you push it out. And later you tell me how you feel. So there you are. One, two, go. Breathe in through the nose. In. In. Hold. Hold. Breathe out slowly through the mouth. Slowly through the mouth. Slowly. Now, second time. Now, when you're breathing in, please remember you're filling in your whole system with this free air oxygen. So, breathe in so that the chest comes out and even the stomach comes out because you're pumping in the air. So, let's go and breathe in through the nose. In, in, hold, hold. Breathe out slowly through the mouth. Slowly, 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 slowly. Until you feel limp. Very good. The last time. Breathe in through the nose. In. In, in, hold, hold, hold there. Now begin to breathe out through the mouth. And this time you make sure you push out everything. Breathe out, 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 out. Remain in that position for two seconds. Having pushed out everything. Thank you very much. You can open your eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Then uh, let's, uh, let's appreciate um, uh, Dr. Monica. <laughs> I'm sure you are refreshed, and uh, that's a good uh, exercise. Uh, how many doses should we take daily, Dr. Monica? <laughs> should we do it every time?
Thank you. Thank you. I want to bring in the chair to uh, at least acknowledge those who are here physically, those who are online, and also the, the various supporters of this uh, conference. Uh, it's important for us to acknowledge that uh, this is being co-hosted. Uh, the link that we are using today is uh, generated in the United States at Harvard. So it's, it's important to know that. Uh, so it's good to acknowledge. So Chair, if you are available, you can acknowledge uh, the participants and uh, then we shall be able to uh, guide the proceedings. Professor Bantu, uh, please acknowledge the participants, those online and those are available, and uh, then we can be able to proceed. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this mindful exercise that uh, our mentor has presented, and I, I would still recommend that as Kenya Methodist University, uh, we need to have an integrative approach, especially in uh, our campuses, and uh, this exercise can be extended to the various institutions, uh, not only limited to universities, but also uh, in ministries, in the governments, because that is what is lacking. And I think when we eventually come up with the global mental health for East Africa, we are going to incorporate those simple breathing in exercises. They're very, very helpful. Uh, I'm also thinking that in future we may have a software that would remind our people who are really workaholics to tell them, no, you need to stand up. Relax, breathe in, hold the breath, breathe out. So if you are on the laptop or computer and you are just there all through, such software should be able to help us to help you uh, get full mind and wellness. So I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monica, and I, I pray that we can utilize some of these simple, simple but clear uh, techniques which can help in uh, well-being, complete well-being. I've seen scenarios where people, when they go to church and the minister begins to minister, I find some of them finding solace in sleep. And when that sleep comes, it comes really completely. It relaxes you completely. I would like these experiences to be utilized also in our workplaces, just for, you see, she only used it about 10, five minutes, and I, I saw people thinking they can go and sleep completely. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's one of the ways we can be able to integrate this. We have a number of presenters, and uh, I want to recognize them. Um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Washira has made some comments, and yeah, I think she's enjoying outside because they are working on clinical assessments, uh, which is very vital and supervision. Then also we have uh, presenters uh, from DRC that presented, uh, including Professor Etnet. Aetnet is on our way to Addis Ababa for a meeting for PAPU, that is uh, the Psychological Union of Psychologists, and maybe we shall have a brief remark later on tomorrow. And then in the uh, interest of time, the other presenters from KIS University, I saw Professor Karen Nyamwangi, and she's been following up. In Uganda, there are a number of followers that I met and that online. Haratina University, we applaud you, and we do hope that uh, this uh, intended global uh, mental health facility within the region will be part of it. And also, I've observed that uh, uh, USIU, Daystar, and uh, Kenyatta University and Nazarene universities are well presented. I saw those ones in Kampala International University. 
they are also represented and I'm very excited that this will eventually come to pass. There are a number of chaplains and reverends from the clergy that have joined us and they are part and partial of this two-day summit. I do believe that the expected uh, uh, outcomes, like what Dr. Monica has said, uh, to have increased awareness and understanding of um, uh, integration. Because if, like, we are doing these simple exercises in Kenya, Tanzania, DRC, South Sudan, Somali, I think it will make a big difference. Uh, I know I would like to ask a few of those online to introduce themselves in the chat platform because we have a section on the chat. Please would like you to write some messages which we could be able to read and share in the presentation. I'm also aware that um, our other presenters from Harvard are going to be presenting and I wanted to ask the IT to project some of the uh, chief speakers from the West who will be presenting so that uh, the members can just have uh, a pictorial view and also to have uh, where Kim University is, what they are doing, some programs, so that uh, people know that uh, this is one of the unique universities in the region um, that is really eager to host some of these important activities within the region. So um, our next present, of course, um, will be uh, Reverend Dr. Tassira, Reverend Dr. Tassira. Uh, this Reverend Dr. Sir, uh, 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 Tassira is very unique and in fact I had an interaction with her in many uh, scenarios. One of the scenarios we met in Uganda uh, when she was presenting on uh, mental health and then later on in schools. She's an expert in that. So Reverend Tassira is an ordained minister of the gospel and a senior lecturer in the School of Education and Social Sciences at Kenya Methodist University, with a specialization in education, curriculum, instruction, implementation. Dr. Kibara brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to her role as an educator and academician. Her expertise extends beyond traditional educational realms, as she is deeply engaged in addressing great concerns in mental health as a spiritual guide. Dr. Akibara is a passionate about integrating spirituality into mental health care and offers spiritual counseling, coaching, and mentorship services to individuals and communities across diverse settings. As a seasoned admission and spiritual leader, Dr. Akibara embodies a holistic approach to education and well-being emphasizing the importance of nurturing the mind, body, and spirit. Her dedication to promoting mental health and spiritual growth reflects her commitment to empowering individuals and fostering resilience within communities. Through her multifaceted role as an educator, minister, and counselor, Reverend Dr. Tasila Kibara endeavors to create a transformative experience that inspire personal and collective growth. Her contributions to education, spirituality, and mental health underscore her unwavering commitment to serving others and making a positive impact in the world. Let's join hands together and welcome Dr. Reverend Kibara Tassira. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Chair, Professor Vantu, and uh, the participants, the, the audience also. 
Uh, I've already been introduced uh, in a very detailed manner. I'm presenting on integrating spirituality, healing, and mental health, a holistic approach. As a, a minister of the Word of God, uh, we are, or I am focused to seeing to it that the people enjoy holistic health. And therefore, a call to this uh, conference excited my heart. Because when we look at the world today, we see the issues of mental health are almost surpassing any other kind of illness. We look at the households, families, every other moment we are receiving in the news. Uh, very disturbing news concerning um, which has a result of mental health. You hear a father has committed suicide, has killed himself, has killed uh, the, the mother, and has massacred all the children. Those are mental health issues. When we come to schools across all levels, primary school, secondary school, colleges, universities. And now we will not go before we get very bad news that a student has committed suicide. Just a case in the point yesterday I was reading over the social media of a secondary school student in Western, one of the schools who committed suicide in a toilet left the others in the classroom and went to the toilet and committed suicide. And the story goes he was very happy in the morning when he met with the other colleagues. We are having issues of relationships, issues in the universities where you hear in various universities students are disturbed to the remit. Police officers, we have heard of our research and research findings. And even without the research we hear over the media, every other day a police officer has sought himself, has sought the wife, has sought the members of the family, has gone berserk and has sought people. Uh, so to me, mental health is really an issue to address. Much has been said here, colleagues, about the various approaches and the centers which have been established by the government to look at mental health. But still, there is a major gap because you're not more a kilometer today. If you are walking or driving a vehicle without encountering with a person who has mental illness, and uh, to a point where you really feel disturbed about it. You can go to market centers today, and if you stand on the street and start uh, counting the mental health, the people who are passing by, within an hour, you shall have counted more than five. Just within one street, in the very small market centers. And this is uh, a global issue. It, therefore, this dialogue is very critical to us and very critical to me in particular, so that we are trying to look at how do we come together as the ministers of the Word of God, as psychiatrists, as the psychologists, as even the families, how to the government to dialogue together and integrate their process and address mental health. My presentation is not provocative. It is just trying to ask us, what do we do? Spiritual uh, approach is very critical and has been used over time from the Bible. And before I get myself off through the introduction, I want to go to, to be more organized by getting to the abstract. We have in contemporary mental health care, there is a growing recognition of the importance of integrating spirituality and healing practices alongside traditional, alongside uh, traditional 
therapeutic modalities and the high as one of the experts in the field, especially of spirituality, explore the inter intersection of spiritu spirituality, healing and mental health, presenting a holistic approach to psychological uh, well-being and the recovery. Drawing an extensive experience as a reverend, an educator and a spiritual guide, I delve into the profound connections between mind, body and the spirit, offering insight into how spirituality can complement and enhance conventional mental health interventions. Through a breadth of evidence-based research, clinical case studies and the personal uh, acnotes, I elucidate the in transformative potential of integrating spirituality, spiritual and healing practices into the therapeutic processes. This presentation examines various aspects of integration of spirituality, healing and mental health, including, uh, we have a clip uh, here, which I would like us to listen to. Can you have it prayed, please? Before we proceed on. It's just drawn from my YouTube. A moment, and then you are going to listen to this. Sorry for the drain, just a moment. So you want them to listen to yes, this? Yes, I want to them to. I want the audience to listen to this. Okay. It is part just of the moment. presentation. Yeah. Sahadna. So It's almost there. Here on Medscape, we have a conversation about you, about mental health, about things that we can do to improve our brain health. And so I wanted to have a, a special conversation today with a, a woman who is uh, interested in, in psychology and mental health and spirituality. And so we, Brittany Moses, is going to be joining us. And here she is. Hi there. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Hi. So great to be on and uh, to see your face and to be having this conversation. I know. We're meeting for the first time. We're just, we're, your head's getting cut off a little bit. I don't know. Oh, if OK. Let me back up then. Um, is that good? That's great. That's great. Hi. So it's really it's nice to meet you. Thank you for so much for coming on. Um, hang on. Are you having... mm. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to talk about mm. and spirituality. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is I think it's something that is such an important part of people's lives and an important part of people's mental health. And so, Brittany, just to start out, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? You're, you're tuning in from California, uh, you're in yeah. LA, you're doing lots of interesting work, you've got a YouTube channel, so tell everyone a little bit about you. Well, hi, I'm so happy to be here. Yes, I'm in 
California in the Los Angeles area. So it's a beautiful sunny day out. We're in the middle of summer. Wish you guys could be here to uh, enjoy the sun, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, I'm studying psychology at UCLA and I research assist at UCLA Civil Institute for Neuroscience and Be Human Behavior. And so that's been super fun. Um, and so, yeah, I, I like to talk a lot about the intersectionality of faith and mental health. Um, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of times people will turn to their faith community or their house of worship um, when they're in psychological distress. In fact, there's a lot of research that shows for over 20 years that when a person's in psychological distress, they'll turn to their church or their clergy before they ever step foot to a mental health professional. Um, and in a way that's understandable, you know, it's very familial. Uh, in a lot of ways, it can maybe be easier to navigate than the mental health care system. So I think for me, I'm really passionate about bridging that conversation so that there is holistic healing, um, but also meeting people where they are from from your worldview, because uh, cultural competence is very important um, to healing and recovery as well. So, so yeah, and yeah, I do YouTube videos. I have a podcast, having conversations um, with both mental health professionals and those with lived experience um, about the faith, culture, and mental health conversations. So, it's been awesome. Uh, I'm enjoying every step of it. Well, it's a, it feels like a piece of <clears throat> excuse me, also that in, in mental health we miss. You know, yeah. that if you're if you're working with somebody and, and a, a lot of the folks um, tuning in are healthcare providers, you know, if you have faith, it's something that you mention maybe, maybe you say a prayer together. If you don't have a religious background, it's something that doesn't feel like it's part of your job and maybe gets avoided or not even asked about. Um, I remember, I'm not really from much of a, a faith background, but, but when I work with patients, you know, I, I've learned so much in terms yeah. of, you know, what gives them strength and it's also surprising it's almost like if you don't take a, a as part of your history i mean it's one of the first things i ask is you know are, is there a, um, a kind of religious or or ethical kind of set of values you ascribe to i should know about as your care provider and so it's um it's such an important part community issues Oh, Instagram sorry. time limit. Sorry, that's <laughs> embarrassing. I wanted, I wanted to hear some of your thoughts about how healthcare providers um, it can, uh, I don't want to say take advantage of, but I'm, I'm really concerned about the mental health and the burnout that happens in healthcare. And it feels like one thing that, that kind of a church community or faith community gives people is a structure around which to how to take care of the spiritual self. I'm just wondering some of your kind of um, guidance from that for people as they're either wanting to deepen their their kind of notion of spirituality in their life, um, or, or if they don't have it and they want to start experiencing it. Like, how do, how, how do people in healthcare do that? Yeah, I, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that because I feel like, so I mostly come from a church background, so I'll just be honest in saying that's kind of where my strength is, but I'm sure that this can be universally relatable when it comes to a faith community. Like you're saying, um, I think it's important to see, I think mental health in general is having a bunch of tools in a tool belt, right? So it's a system of support. Like you may have your psychiatrist or your therapist who is helping you work with the cognitive side or even the, the nutritional side, um, which is very important. Um, and then you have your faith community, which is very familial. That's where you get that social support, which is so important for healthy attachments and healthy bonding. Um, I always talk about how, you know, we literally have neurochemicals like dopamine and uh, oxytocin that are released upon intimacy and that are wired for us to have healthy attachments for one another. And so that social aspect, uh, that social support is definitely a huge tool in the tool belt um, of taking care of our mental health, people that you're doing life with, right? Um, because the truth is that you're, you know, maybe your psychiatrist or therapist, they're not um, in your everyday life, right? They're not in your everyday world. Um, but those who you're walking with in your faith community can hold you accountable and check in with you and say, you know, how are you really doing? Um, you know, and for me, it's really interesting because historically um, speaking, 
the the church kind of was always this place of care like like around 400 a.d before there was institutionalized health care the monasteries were converted into places of care for those who were feeling afflicted both mentally and physically and for travelers passing by so there's always been this foundation of community support there um, that can maybe extend um an office in a way. Um, and so I think having all of that together where we are approaching the biological, the psychological, the social, the spiritual is really going to optimize our, our recovery and our healing for sure. Um, yeah. I was curious, um, you talked about the inner, inner, you're at this intersection of the mental health community and the faith communities. And I was wondering what are some of the common misperceptions that you see people on both sides have? <laughs> that's, yes, that's a really great question. Um, so there do tend to be two camps, right? Um, there is the scientific camp, right? Which is primarily based on the research and what's evidence-based. And that is definitely useful as we want to be doing and wise things that provide actual outcomes. I'm like, let me step back so I don't cut my head out. Um, so, and that's great, right? But like you were saying, they, there may be um, a lack of that cultural understanding such as someone who is of faith and what they're... Okay, thank you, colleagues. That's a conversation on the uh, spirituality and the mental health and the, the holistic care of which is applied by various communities on mental health. And that uh, conversation, one can be able to listen to it uh, in the presentation. So for the sake of time, and because we do want our afternoon presenters to uh, present the time they were given, I'd like to continue. Now, the law of spirituality in coping with the trauma, a grief, and the existential concerns uh, is uh, critical. And uh, we find that uh, when it comes to the law of spirituality, it is found uh, in our churches all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, because the churches or the spiritual uh, guides are interested uh, with the counseling, uh, applying spiritual counseling to the people who are grieved, who are undergoing trauma, and also uh, <laughs> please uh, mute those who are online, online please mute uh, so that we can be in the same conversation if you're online please mute if you're not the presenter for example when people have undergone um, grief through uh, losing their loved ones uh, the spiritual care comes in in handy to uh, assist the person oh. cope with the group, grief and the trauma. And uh, this cuts across institutions, households, and uh, so forth. And uh, I am aware the governments are so much concerned even about that, uh, sending the pastoral uh, guide or professionals to go and offer some spiritual guidance, which brings a lot of relief uh, to the family and the handles the matters of depression and the health, I mean mental health and uh, this should continue. We have uh, culturally sen sensitive approaches to incorporating spiritual beliefs and the practices and the, into therapy. Uh, in the Bible, also culture is not, it is not uh, actually excluded because there are some beliefs in the, in the Bible uh, where you find uh, people believing they have been cast, they have been, uh, their sicknesses is out of sin, like uh, in, in some uh, Bible verses, Bible areas where Jesus is asked, who sinned? Is it this man who sinned or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus replies and he says, neither his parents nor the, nor the, the man sinned. Uh, so uh, there, there are all those kinds of beliefs depending on uh, the cultural uh, backgrounds. And uh, the Bible is also able to, uh, 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 I mean, to approach them spiritually. Now, techniques for facilitating spiritual exploration and growth within a therapeutic context, I've tried to give that. 
There are also collaborative models of care that bridge the gap between Western psychology and the uh, indigenous healing traditions. Uh, this paper emphasizes the importance of honoring each individual's unique spiritual journey and the cultural background while fostering therapeutic environment that support holistic healing and self-discovery. By embracing multidimensional understanding of mental health, this holistic whole approach seeks to promote resilience, transformation, and spiritual well-being for clients across diverse cultural and religious backgrounds. So I actually welcome you to join me even as I navigate the, co the complex terrain of spirituality, healing, and mental health, offering practical guidance uh, and inspiring insights for the mental health professionals, educators, and spiritual practitioners alike. Uh, so together, uh, let us explore the transformative potential of integrating spirituality and the healing into the public of contemporary mental health care spirituality and mental health uh, and there's also another clip uh, there uh, which is also talking about uh, what uh, uh, spirituality really offers but because of time i would not play that clip but i want us to go to look at the, some of the scriptures which are relevant to mental health for example when we look at the first samuel the book of first samuel chapter 16 and verse 23 so and David. And the Bible talks about uh, at, at some moments, Saul would get depressed, would get a bad depression from God, or a bad spirit would come upon Saul. And then David would pray uh, up, and Saul would be refreshed and be well. So, music, which is used, the spiritual music which is used in the church, is the uh, goes along to bring about you know mental healing apart from the healing of the soul and the elevating depression among the members who get into the who are actually the audience in a in a spiritual congregation and we find that you know uh so so would he just get healed would he just get well and the depression would go so david now became accustomed to actually any time so was depressed you would just take a guitar and play music. So this is very important. And therefore, people should be encouraged to gather into the spiritual congregations and not only listen to the word of God, but be in that moment of praise and worship. It is therapeutic and it is hearing by itself. Then in the book of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, the Bible talks about a cheerful heart is good medicine to the heart. That moment when people are interacting and they are very cheerful, the depression goes and it becomes a, a cheerful, like a, a, a medicine to the heart and to the soul. We find that prayer and the healing. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17, God talks of, I will restore to you health and heal your health which means also God recognizes, or in the spiritual dimension, it recognizes that people can get sick, mentally sick, spiritually sick. But the word of God gives a lot of consolation and comfort that God is ready to restore people's health, is able to heal. Now, when you come to, there is a lot about healing in the Bible. You look at the book of Mark chapter 5, Jesus noticed in his spirit that there was a man who was suffering mental health across the sea and told the disciples, let us go to the other side of the sea. And when the demons saw Jesus, they asked him, have you come to destroy us? And they actually, uh, Jesus had to rebuke them and go. But also you need to notice that in the approaches Jesus used, he did not just say, use prayer, like Chakaola issue, or prayer and fasting, no. He was also advising people to go for medical checkup because Jesus would tell the, the, lep the lepers, I have healed you, but go and show yourself to the, to the scribes to be tested that you have actually received the healing. At one moment in the Bible, it is recorded that Jesus is paid 
saliva on the ground and they mixed soil with the saliva. To me, that was preparing the medicine and applied the man on the eyes of the blind person. This time, he's not telling the blind person that he, uh, your faith has made you well, or even praying for the blind person. But he is preparing medicine, using his saliva and the soil, and applying actually medically on the eyes. And as the man he tells the man, go and wash in the, in the river. And the man goes and washes and gets healed. You look at the leprosy of Naaman. Naaman is told to go and wash in the river Jordan. That is actually a practical example of going for healing, practical healing. Not just the prayer, and, the, and not just the prayer and laying of hands and the speaking words of the Bible to person. So the Bible is full of, is actually has three approaches to healing, mental health and even other types of health, no more medicine, speaking the word, music, and the worship. There is also the prayer itself. Where it says, when, if somebody is sick, let the elders go and lay hands on the person, and the person will get healed. But that is not all what the Bible talks about. There is also practical examples of advising people to go to the hospital for healing, to go to the to, to be counseled for healing, uh, to be prayed for for healing, and also you have found the singing and the worship which goes to the which goes on in the church brings in a lot of healing. Cultural sensitivity and the cultural healing practices, acute mental health is, uh, issues and the concerns, those are cultural issues, bring beliefs as from curses and witchcraft in Africa. Those beliefs are also in the, in the Bible. Uh, some environments, like for example here in Kaga, Kaga meaning a place of the, of the witches, and what happened, the place which was really isolated and could not be inhabited by human beings, when the missionaries came and established Christianity, established the Methodist Church, and they conducted uh, cleansing, the demons left, and the witchcraft went. It was dissolved by the word of God and the cleansing of the, by the blood of Jesus. And today we have churches, we have great institutions uh, of higher learning, uh, businesses which have come up in Nicaragua. So what are we talking about? We are saying spirituality can do a lot, but it cannot do it alone. We need to, be integrate, to integrate the various approaches. Now mental health as a result of curse or witchcraft is challenging as the diverse effects on the individuals from the generation to generation. I wanted you, I've talked about the book of Mark chapter 5 verse 1 to 20 the man who was possessed with the demons. And you remember those demons when they were casted and they went to the pigs, all the pigs got drowned into the lake, which means it is a true experience. We cannot deny it. When we come to cultural aspects, there is also the use of acupuncture and the abortees and the CBT. That is cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, acupuncture is a piercing the skin on the side of the brain, the right hand or the left hand, and the blood comes out when one is found to be suffering some mental health, and the blood comes out and a person is healed. That used to be practiced traditionally. But now we find that, you know, also the Bible talks about uh, the way we think. How do we think? How do we think? What influences our thinking? Because the Bible says, as a man thinks so, yes. You are a product of what you think. And uh, what influences you are you to think that way. That is what you become. Because by the time somebody is suffering mental health, has really accumulated a lot of negativity. And uh, has consumed so much, maybe, beliefs in the curses, maybe witchcraft beliefs, and uh, also uh, a lot of pressure, depression, so he becomes now mad. 
But if this is taken out through presenting oneself in some environment of reflections like what Dr. Monica Gitonga was giving here, the person now gets healing slowly by slowly. And therefore, that requires a lot of patience. We therefore I need more research to compare African and Western approaches to healing, spiritual and mental health. You find that even in the hospitals, the hospitals have employed chaplains to pray for the sick, to minister to them the word of God, to pray for the sick there, and so forth. And therefore, even as we think about uh, counseling, uh, about psychotherapy, social, I mean psychosocial approaches, we need to think about also uh, spiritual incorporating or integrating spiritual approaches to mental health. And in so doing, then we can be able to say the person who is the mind, the soul, and the spirit is attended holistically. Thank you so much, and God bless you for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Kibara, for that. Uh, let's acknowledge Dr. Kibara for her presentation. Thank you. We obviously, like you have said several times, this is meant to be a conversation, a dialogue. So we would want to ask those who are on online, please uh, feel free to put up your questions on uh, on uh, on the platform. We will have a chance to interact and uh, you know get uh, some answers to some of the questions you may be holding, and uh, we will be able to respond to the same even as we continue the interaction. Because the, prog the time, uh, our program is uh, learning by high time, we will want to uh, have an opportunity to uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, our, our brothers and sisters who speak French uh, get a little bit of uh, interlude. So we will ask uh, Bona Duncan to go to the uh, place where the presenters are, so just so that you can update us and bring that. And as uh, uh, Duncan does that, we would want uh, those who are airing to also uh, screen out those who are uh, supporting this uh, event so, so that they are also captured. You know, we, we are doing this in collaboration with other institutions. It's important to, to show that uh, so that we do not uh, learn behind. We'll soon get a short break for lunch so that uh, because we have our colleagues in the United States who are now waking up and are ready to do your, their presentation. We'll have a first presentation from uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, participants from the U.S. at about three, and uh, they, uh, they are going to be hoping to be here that time exactly, uh, so that uh, we should be able to, to have taken our meals and come back. So I will ask uh, uh, those screening to show up a little bit of that uh, in terms of who are collaborating with us, who are going to be our presenters in the afternoon. That, that is important, and I will also ask Duncan to briefly give uh, a summary in terms of uh, this, this workshop uh, in the French language for our participants who are in other, uh, other places like uh, the DRC and uh, other neighboring countries who, who use uh, French as their uh, first or second language. Okay. Um, bon après-midi. Alors, uh, je vais faire un uh, sommaire de ce qu'on a obtenu de, ce, de la séance du matin. Donc, uh, le premier uh, par là, c'était uh, le professeur Baguma qui a parlé de l'opportunité uh, de parler sur uh, ce thème ce thème de, de la spiritualisme avec la, la santé mentale. Donc, euh, euh, dès, euh, dès, dès le commencement, le professeur Baguma a accepté qu'il qu y a des complexités sur euh, la santé mentale et il y a des, des facteurs divers qui contribuent euh, sur un individuel et puis il parle de l'importance d'accepter et faire euh, la, euh, la compréhension de, de dimensions spirituelles sur la santé mentale. 
finalement, il a parlé euh, sur euh, la besoin de, de faire les approches culturelles qui se sont sensitives et aussi intégrer les perspectives psychiatriques avec euh, les perspectives spirituelles. Et aussi, et en plus, il, il nous encourage d'accepter la diversité et aussi l'ouverture de de, des approches mentales euh, pour avoir la soin de la santé mentale. Et par conclusion, professeur Baguma a parlé de son, euh, son commettre euh, d'avancer la, euh, la thème de, de, de la santé mentale euh, en faisant la co collaboration et l'innovation sur cette euh, étude. Donc, euh, il, nous, il, nous, il, il nous fait accepter qu'il qu il faut, il faut euh, rejoindre les mains pour euh, faire la, la connaissance sur la psychiatrie et la spiritualisme euh, en faisant euh, le travail ensemble pour promouvoir euh, la santé holistique pour les individuels et les communautés dans le, de, de le monde entier. Alors, à la deuxième partie de la conférence, on a aussi parlé sur euh, un dialogue pour intégrer les psychiatriques euh, les, 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 les et les approches spirituelles pour avancer la santé mentale. Et donc, euh, de cette, de cette partie, on a, on a pour objectif cinq, cinq objectifs pour ce dialogue et pour cette euh, conférence aussi. Donc, pour les deux jours, c'est-à-dire aujourd'hui et demain, on parle sur euh, euh, cinq objectifs. Le premier objectif, c'est faciliter un dialogue interdisciplinaire et faire collaborer entre les professionnels dans le secteur de la santé mentale et aussi les gérants spirituels. Deuxième objectif, il faut explorer les approches innovatives pour intégrer euh, la psychiatrie et les perspectives spirituelles dans la soin euh, de la santé mentale. On a pour objectif, le troisième objectif, de faire connaissance euh, de la rôle de la spiritualisme en promouvoir de la santé mentale et aussi euh, la guérison. Quatrième objectif, identifier les stratégies pour adresser les besoins psychosociaux et aussi euh, pour les euh, professionnels dans le secteur de la santé mentale. Finalement, le cinquième objectif, c'est aussi promouvoir et créer la connaissance de, de la santé mentale sur toutes les communautés uh, qui sont intégrées à la foi et dans le spiritualisme et la et chrétien. Troisième partie de la Séance aujourd'hui, on a à voir aussi euh, le professeur Baguma qui a parlé euh, de la signification d'intégrer le psychiatrisme et des approches spiritualisme euh, pour la santé mentale, la soin de ceux qui sont affectés et faire la collaboration entre la psychiatrie clinicale est aussi les pratiques euh, de la guérison spirituelle. On a quelques questions et réponses sur ce thème qui a été euh, présenté ici. Première question, quels sont les objectifs de la dialogue international pour intégrer la psychiatrie et les, et les approches spirituelles pour avancer la santé mentale et la réponse c'est les objectifs y incluent intégrer et faciliter un dialogue interdisciplinaire 
et faire aussi la collaboration entre les professionnels de la secteur mental et aussi les gérants spirituels dans notre communauté pour explorer les approches innovatives euh, pour l'intégration et aussi avancer la connaissance de la rôle de spiritualisme dans la santé mentale et aussi identifier les, strat les stratégies pour adresser les besoins psychosociaux en promouvoir euh, la connaissance surtout entre les communautés euh, intégrées dans la foi. Deuxième question, quels sont quelques Quelques, 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 quelles sont les quel, quelques euh, connaissances euh, attirées dans le dialogue international Ça, c'est la deuxième question. Et la réponse, c'est on attire avoir euh, une connaissance multipliée euh, dans la, la connaissance de l'intégration et aussi avancer la collaboration entre les professionnels et aussi les gérants spirituels en le développement de la, euh, des interventions innovatives et aussi faire euh, les, les professionnels être en euh, euh, pouvoir et aussi renforcer les systèmes de soutien surtout dans les communautés de foi. Quatrième, euh, troisième question. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous donner un scénario pour illustrer l'intégration de de, des approches psychiatriques et, et aussi spirituelles? Et la réponse, certainement. Considérer une patiente qui a la dépre, euh, dépression et aussi un stress. Une psychiatre peut provenir d'une euh, thérapie pour adresser les symptômes et aussi le gérant spirituel peut aussi offrir euh, les, les services euh, pastorales pour explorer les concerns exist qui existent et aussi euh, donner un soutien spirituel. Donc, tous les deux, il faut créer un euh, plan de, 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 de guérison qui peut adresser euh, les besoins spirituels et aussi psychologiques. Quatrième question, quelles sont les interventions qui peuvent être euh, intégrées pour euh, les approches psychiatriques et aussi spirituelles pour la santé mentale. Et la réponse c'est, les interventions pour inclure euh, la psycho psychothérapie pour, par, par les, euh, les principales spirituels et aussi euh, avoir les, les pratiques qui pour soutenir les groupes qui pour intégrer les, les, les components de, psychologiques et aussi spirituels avec les collaborations et modèles qui peuvent faire la soin de, de, de la, des professions de la santé mentale et aussi les gérants spirituels qui peuvent travailler ensemble pour adresser euh, cette menace. Et finalement, on, par conclusion, le, la dernière euh, présentation de Dr. Kibara. Elle a parlé sur les besoins de la, des professions mentales, les psychologistes, les psychiatres. Et elle a aussi pour nous provenir les, les illustrations et les scénarios avec les exemples et les questions, et avec les, les réponses pour comprendre euh, la fatigue et aussi ce que euh, les professionnels peuvent faire dans leur, euh, dans leur euh, carrière. Euh, et aussi, elle a parlé sur euh, les pratiques euh, pour nous prendre bien et les pratiques euh, d'importance dans les communautés avec les rôles euh, de, 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 de tout le monde dans la communauté. 
et là aussi nous donner les exemples dans la communauté de Kaga avec euh, ce qui existe dans les communautés, le rôle euh, de cultiver les, les, un environnement euh, soutenu avec les, euh, avec les professionnels qui existent dans la communauté. Euh, elle nous fait une discussion aussi sur euh, l'intégration spirituelle avec la guérison, les pratiques euh, et les soins qui peuvent provenir d'un soutien dans le système de la communauté ici. Alors, elle a euh, terminé par nous donner l'importance de, euh, de ce qu'on peut faire comme professionnel en adressant cette importance euh, sur ce thème. Finalement, elle a nous dit que euh, c'est important de continuer cette éducation euh, et aussi pour les, 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 les professionnels et les professionnels les psychologistes et tout, tout le monde qui travaille dans ce secteur pour avancer cette discussion en adressant les besoins psychosociaux pour tout le monde qui est affecté. Alors, dernièrement, on a une autre question ici. Comment est-ce que le professionnel euh, dans le secteur de la santé mentale peut différencier sur euh, la compassion et la fatigue Alors, la, euh, la réponse était, euh, on peut adresser ceci pour, on, 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 dans l'environnement de travail pour la compassion de ceux qui sont affectés par la fatigue et les, rés les résultats pour exposer les autres qui travaillent avec cette personne dans le euh, problème de souffrir et aussi qui peut, euh, euh, qui peut euh, promouvoir aussi une, une dépression et aussi un problème émotionnel. Alors, il faut avoir la soin de soi-même et aussi pour les autres qu'on peut travailler avec dans la communauté où on travaille. Alors ça c'est ce qu'on a euh, avait, euh, comme discussion dans la euh, séance du matin. Alors pour la deuxième partie de l'après-midi, on peut avoir les autres par là et on va faire une tradition de ce qu'il va parler. Merci beaucoup. Et bienvenue. Ah, thank you very much for merci beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to uh, recognize uh, our other participants who are online uh, and then uh, read a bit of their comments that they have sent. Uh, for example, this is from Laura. Laura says, thank you for an interesting beginning of this conference. Sorry for the poor internet connection, and this is very interesting. And during my presentation on art therapy, I think you should be able to repeat. If you are interested, I can send it to you by email. And she has submitted her email. And she's a senior lecturer at Humak University of Applied Sciences in Finland. Yeah, I, I think the other, um, we see doctor, uh, we see, we see doctor, doctor Jacqueline Luguru Kagu, who defines which mental condition is demonic or not? That's a very interesting uh, question. I think uh, Dr. Monica and Reverend uh, Dr. Kibara should be able to respond to that. Um, then uh, I also see um, uh, this other one is from uh, from uh, I think from KIU Tadjin uh, is uh, congratulating us for having had a very interesting uh, presentation uh, for the, for uh, 
He says, good afternoon to everyone. I would like to commend the organizers of this, uh, uh, this, uh, sa this conference. Uh, it, 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 um, of this, it is topical, uh, this topical issue at this auspicious time. And he says, my special kudos, I don't know what they are, goes to my mentor, Professor Bantu, for effective chairing the sessions. And I think I'm not alone with uh, uh, Dr. Mushiri. Dr. Severino Mirisha, COD in Seskemo, participating virtually as I am out of station monitoring. Oh. So we have received, uh, there's another one from Karatina, Dr. Pastor Beatrice Gishiru, is the Dean School of Nursing, Karatina University. Uh, they're all saying uh, kudos. Then we have uh, uh, Professor Patrick Chamanya from uh, Uganda Matters University and the School of Nursing, they are Dean of Postgraduate in Medical School. They're also saying uh, Hongera. I don't know what that means, but I think it is Eh? Congratulations. Uh, I think then I'm seeing some other medical students like I have Joseph, Joseph Fat, and uh, I'm excited that a number of the people are online and they are participating. I wanted to mention that the meeting is continuing and we have our other presenters uh, in the afternoon. And I wanted to request uh, Victor to uh, show the remaining participants for this day that will be presenting that this afternoon. And of course, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Yes, that should be done streaming uh, before we break for lunch. Dr. Jamini Davis will be presenting immediately around three o'clock. Uh, Dr. Jamin Davis is an esteemed associate professor at Meharry Medical College and a leading expert at the Van Bilt as Hamers and Memory Center. With a wealth of experience in neuroscience and psychiatry, Dr. Davis specializes in Alzheimer's disease and dementia research. His pioneering work explores the intersection um, of psychiatric and spiritual approaches in supporting individuals affected by cognitive decline and their caregivers. Dr. Davis' insights into holistic care process make him a valuable contributor to the dialogue on enhancing mental health through integrated approaches. Then the next presenter will be Dr. Caroline Palvasino Maggio, uh, Dr. Palvicino Maggio, I uh, had an opportunity to interact with her in many conferences, and she serves as the director of the Neurobiological Mechanisms of Aggression Laboratory at Marklin Hospital. And I believe the question that was asked about, um, about um, uh, who is responsible for these demons or who determines about demonology, I think that has to do with the biology and uh, Professor Carroll would be able. So she holds a faculty position at Harvard Medical School. As a distinguished researcher in psychiatry, Dr. Palsvinio Maggio focuses on understanding the neurobiological underpinnings of aggression and developing innovative treatment strategies. Her expertise extends to exploring the spiritual dimensions of aggression and violence offering holistic perspectives on managing these complex behavior phenomena. So Dr. Palvizinio Maggio's insights into integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches enrich the dialogue on understanding and addressing aggression. Next is Dr. Dr. Professor Kerry Lassler. Dr. Kerry Lassler is a world-renowned psychiatrist and Chief Scientific Officer at Marklin Hospital, where he serves as a Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. With expertise in trauma and stress-related disorders, Dr. Arisla, as a research spans the fields of neuroscience, psychiatry, and genetics. He is a leading advocate for incorporating spiritual frameworks and into trauma treatment and resilience building interventions. 
Dr. Ressler's contributions to understanding the intersection of spirituality and mental health offer valuable insights into addressing post-traumatic stress disorder from a holistic perspective. I believe you'd be able, able to tell us in the mother tongue what PTSD means, and maybe that should be something that we should also be looking at. Then we have Dr. Shifali Singh. Dr. Shifali Singh is a distinguished clinical neuropsychologist and director of the Digital Cognitive Research Program at McLean Hospital, Harvard University's teaching facility. Additionally, she holds a lecture position in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Singh, uh, the research focuses on leveraging digital health technologies to enhance cognitive function and mental well-being. Her expertise lies in exploring the integration of digital tools with psychiatric and spiritual approaches to mental health care. Dr. Singh's insights into the intersection of technology, spirituality, and mental health contribute to the ongoing dialogue on innovative approaches to holistic care delivery. So together, these facilitators bring a wealth of knowledge, expertise, and diverse perspectives to the international dialogue happening between now and tomorrow at Kenya Methodist University. And they are enriching discussions on integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health will be very appreciative. I believe that we have our other presenters that will be coming in tomorrow, like uh, Dr. Karen Nyamwangi from, uh, pro sorry, Professor Karen Nyamwangi from Kisi University and other teams. They will be presenting on this very important uh, topic. I want to um, encourage the participants who are online and sharing we request that you be able to have a form filled. There is an online form which requires your presence in terms of participation. This is going to help us as we generate statistics of incorporating you in the partnership and also trying to diagnose society's problems and provide interventions I want to thank all of you for having gotten some time to come and be part of this uh, summit. And I believe ultimately uh, this dialogue will be the platform for mental health professionals, spiritual leaders, researchers, and advocates so that they can be coming together annually or yearly or biannually so that we can have a concerted effort in mitigating society's problems. Back to the Master of Ceremonies for further direction. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bantu, for that uh, very good introduction to our uh, next speakers who are coming uh, short while, uh, in a short while, uh, starting at 3 p.m. Uh, members, uh, those who are present physically, I want to give you a short break uh, during which you will be able to uh, take a bite uh, for lunch. And those who are online, you will also have a chance to take a short break. Uh, so it will be fairly short because, uh, like I've indicated, we want to be back to so have the next presenter who is longing in from, uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, start coming in at about 3 uh, p.m. So which is basically about 8 a.m. in the United States. So they are just uh, waking up and they hopefully that we have been awake, we'll be able to listen. So those who are online and who are able to physically also come with us, that's good. Uh, but uh, otherwise, we want to encourage that those who are, you where you have the links, uh, this uh, conference is streaming on YouTube and uh, I think Facebook. Uh, so let's the, the links be shared so that people can uh, stream. Uh, you don't have to go through Zoom. Uh, you can go through the YouTube links and be able to participate in this conference. So uh, those who are online, uh, and, and we are not uh, asking you to, uh, you know, you can go through the Zoom, you can go through the uh, YouTube, whichever is convenient for you to be able to participate. 
uh, I will want to invite uh, uh, Reverend Kebara, who is here with me, to uh, make a short prayer for a uh, lunch break, and then we take off and be back uh, promptly to start at three. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muchiri, our MC today. Shall we bow down and pray? Jehovah God, in Jesus' name, we are before your presence to give you glory, to give you honor, even for the provision of lunch this afternoon. Bless and purify to nourish our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Enjoy your short lunch break. So we will, we will be convening back by about uh, uh, 2.55 so that we are able to start off by 3, uh, those who are within. So take that. It's, it's a short break. It's about 20 minutes or thereabout.
is. Uh, such a gathering of professionals and to remind our, our participants online, this con congregation is made of the clergy, is made up of the chaplains, um, the psychologists, psychiatrists, and even other members within the institutions of higher learning, including universities and colleges. Uh, the keynote speaker emphasized the complexities of mental health and the diverse factors that contribute to an individual's well-being. He underscored the importance of recognizing and addressing spiritual dimensions in mental health care, noting that spirituality can provide individuals with a sense of purpose, meaning, and connection, which are very essential for recovery and resilience. And you will notice that in his presentation, he was trying to bridge the gap that exists between the profession of psychiatry, the spiritual approaches, especially the clergy, the psychologists, and um, he indicated that despite growing recognition of the significance of integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches in mental health care, there remains a lack of international dialogue and collaboration in this field. So many mental health professionals and spiritual leaders operate within zeros, limiting opportunities for interdisciplinary exchange and collaboration. So the dialogue is justified because it will now be focusing within the two days on integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health for several reasons. First, it promotes a holistic understanding of mental health that takes into account both biological and spiritual dimensions. Secondary, it offers and fosters collaboration between the mental health professionals and spiritual leaders, leading to more comprehensive and effective interventions as presented by some of our key not speakers and participants that are talking about um, mindfulness and uh, uh, depression among the police, ethical considerations in this area, uh, in pastoral care, yeah, integrating mental health, spirituality, and healing implications for holistic care across the lifespan, and also um, some of the approaches that we can be able to use in this journey. And the keynote speaker emphasized that there is a need for a culturally sensitive approach to integrating psychiatric and spiritual perspectives. For example, our visitors from the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Professor Etnet and our colleague, were able to speak in French, but even the terms that they are using, like PTSD, still remains PTSD. Stress still remains stress. So there is no equivalent uh, concept in the local language that would give an explanation for 
these psychological conditions. So the keynote speaker emphasized that there's a need for a culturally sensitive approach to integrating psychiatric and spiritual perspectives, taking into account the diverse beliefs, practices, and traditions of different communities. He encouraged the participants to embrace diversity and openness in their approach to mental health care, fostering a supportive and inclusive environment for all individuals seeking healing and support. In conclusion, the keynote speaker affirmed his commitment to advancing the field of mental health through interdisciplinary collaboration and innovation. He called upon participants to join hands in the bridging the gap between psychiatry and spirituality, working together to promote holistic well-being and resilience for individuals and communities worldwide. To give a brief about the background, you will note that this international dialogue on integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health serves as a platform for mental health professionals, spiritual leaders, researchers, and advocates to come together and explore the innovative approaches to mental health care, recognizing the interconnectedness of the psychological and spiritual well-being. So this conference that is going to happen between the 21st and 22nd of March 2024 is happening at the Kenya Methodist University. The Kenya Methodist University has three campuses. One of them is in Mombasa, and the other one is in Nairobi, and uh, the main campus where this hybrid summit is being hosted with a number of participants. So I want to welcome all of you once again for this particular moment when we can read take time to dialogue. The presenters in the morning were able to present and we are required that people can be able to communicate later. So I have seen uh, Professor Caro. Yes, can you Hi, hear? Professor Bantu. All right. Um, Good morning from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. It's a good afternoon this morning of your morning. So I think you're welcome. Um, Good. Um, so, Professor Bantu, I believe um, Professor Davis um, will give his talk. He's scheduled to give his talk now. Yes, Professor Davis, we're waiting for him. And I think uh, on the program, I don't know whether they are giving a brief or you're making an introduction. Yes. And that's what we're waiting for. Um, will you? introduce uh, Professor Davis. Give me one second, Professor, yes. Yes. Okay, Professor Davis is still trying to log on. Okay. I'm here now. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so I'm really excited um, to, you know, thank you again um, to Kenya Methodist University for hosting this very important um, summit of integrating both the spiritual approaches and also the psychiatric and biological approaches to enhance mental health. 
So we're really excited um, to be here today. So I want to introduce you to um, a wonderful and great colleague of mine who I admire deeply, uh, Dr. Jermaine Davis. He's a pioneering scientist at the intersection of biophysics, health disparities, and community engagement. His research in basic science seeks to resolve details of aging and age-related diseases across multiple scales and is at the forefront of addressing these critical gaps in medicine. On the atomic and molecular scale, his lab bridges the gap between what we see on the atomic scale by studying the impact of clinical variants on the three-dimensional structure and function of proteins with what happens on the cellular scale using human-induced pluripotent stem cells. A detailed understanding across these levels is crucial for developing a precise and innovative treatment. However, not all treatments will be generalizable. Therefore, to accelerate precision health, increased public trust, and clinical trial diversity is needed. On the community scale, Dr. Davis has sought to understand motivators and barriers um, in research and participation of, of, um, of the public as well as for the COVID-19 research participation in Black communities. And the results of his work highlights that the public wants to understand the science from trusted and reliable sources. His research in social science seeks to apply this approach to Alzheimer's disease, to understand this communication of basic science to the public, and increases the, the trust and intention to, um, to enroll a, a diverse a patient population in clinical trials. So thank you very much, Dr. Davis, for joining us today. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me okay and my uh, internet is, is stable enough. So I'm gonna start sharing my slides. And um, uh, today's, my, my focus is on Alzheimer's and dementia, um, and some of what we've learned in other areas or fields can be applicable to uh, other diseases and conditions that affect the neurological system, such as um, mental, other mental health barriers, uh, mental health disorders. Uh, so a lot of what, uh, the focus of what I'm gonna talk about is a strategy that we're using to try to increase the public's knowledge about Alzheimer's, particularly um, Black Americans, and how we can actually work together to find um, the ideal treatment conditions for this disease that's dis that disproportionately affects um, Black Americans. And so my talk will go through um, some of the basic science information that we've, we've been trying to discover um, and follow and try to correlate it with um, engaging with the community. So, uh, so we have these, uh, these initiatives called uh, precision medicine or how do we make the right drug for the right person? And so we know that there are these factors that drive health disparities and these health disparities um, can vary across a range of diseases but we know that there are some social determinants of health, meaning where we eat, work, live, and play, and how our environment can actually influence our overall health. <clears throat> we also are starting to understand that there are these biological determinants, such as ancestry-related factors like genetic variants, race, sex, and age, which may contribute to some of the disease onsets that we see, particularly for Alzheimer's. This also involves environmental exposure, so how we interact with our environment and all the other aspects of modifiable factors like diet and exercise. So precision health, um, the main focus is how do we look at our genotype to make a prediction about our phenotype? And for this phenotype, we're um, focusing on a healthy brain versus uh, a severe disease, in this case, which is Alzheimer's. So my lab is focused on understanding some of this missing information when we think about the, the central dogma of molecular biology, we want to look more closely at how DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, 
these proteins interact with other molecules and proteins throughout a specific defined pathway that can dictate the type of phenotype downstream. So one of the questions that we want to address is how do we actually achieve precision medicine for all? So when we think about genetics and, and the impact of looking at the genotype to make predictions about the phenotype, we have to remember that not all mutations are equal. In a case study example presented here, there were identical twins who had a mutation in the breast cancer susceptibility gene called BRCA1. BRCA1 is important for um, cells and it's a tumor suppressor. So mutations in a BRCA1, um, most people would predict would lead to breast cancer. However, in this case between the identical twins, only one disease manifests. So Studying APCA7 on a molecular level, we looked at ex expression in human cells um, across these different variants. We see that overall the expression of APCA7 is comparable. It doesn't, it, uh, the mutations don't induce degradation. Um, so then we asked the question of um, how, does, um, how does it function um, to transport lipids out of the cell? And to study this, we, we used ATP hydrolysis assay. And in this assay, we did two things. In the first assay, we looked at just the control where we looked at the ability of APCA7 to hydrolyze ATP, and that's the first step in lipid transport. And the blue bars represent a basal level of activity. When we added in an apolipoprotein A, which is is um, essentially a cousin of APOE, we see that it stimulated activation of the, of the, of the enzyme, the, AT, um, the APCA7, and increased the amount of ATP hydrolysis. So this suggests that in the presence of apolipoproteins, APCA7 becomes activated. When we looked at what happens in the cell, we asked another question of, okay, it functions, um, what does it actually go to the membrane? So we used another type of experiment called microscopy to look at the localization of APCA7 and the variants to, the, to see if they went to the plasma membrane. And so when we compared these four different variants, these two variants, the 319A and the H395, have been found in African Americans to be, um, uh, to, to confer risk for Alzheimer's and then we wanted to test this other uh, variant, the glycine 215 to serine, to see if um, that's been predicted to be protective. So we wanted to see if there were any differences among these. And so from what we see, for the most part, the wild type and the mutant actually go to the plasma membrane um, 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 fairly well defined. We see some variation in localization in the other two mutants. So we wanted to kind of test just this 319A mutant to see if there were other features that were altered um, uh, in the presence of this mutation. So when we added in, when we repeated the ATP hydrolysis assay with known phospholipids, we see that there's a preference for distinct phospholipids of APCA7 and that these preferences seem to be reduced in the presence of this 319A mutation. So overall, this suggests that the activity of the mutant is reduced and may need to be restored or augmented to rescue this type of mutation. So we took it a little further to ask um, if this mutation actually um, influenced other phospholipids from binding. Um, and so we found that there's another um, uh, phospholipid called Phosphatidylacetyl 45 bisphosphate. We see that in the wild type, it binds to the backbone of the protein. Um, and in the presence of the mutant, the location is the red sphere. We see that it adopts a different conformation and there's reduced binding. So we did that computationally and then followed up with it experimentally, where we actually looked at an in vitro 
and we see that binding of PIP2 to the extracellular domain of APCA7 is strong in the wild type but diminished in the mutant. So we collaborated with a mass spectrometrist called, uh, uh, named Dr. Renee Robinson over at Vanderbilt, and we looked at, we asked the question of what proteomic changes um, happen in the presence of this mutation. So we analyzed the expression of the total proteome of cells that express the wild type, empty vector, and the mutant. And while we didn't see, and so we, we went back and looked at some of the data, and we see that in the PIP2 pathway, one of the enzymes responsible for the metabolism of PIP2 is decreased in the 319A mutant. Interesting enough, PIP2 does not bind a mute, the APOE4 variant, and in postmortem brains, they found that PIP2 levels are decreased. So this suggests that PIP2 levels may be an attractive target for novel therapies to treat Alzheimer's. So what we're doing now is Thank you very much, uh, Professor Davis, for a very enriching uh, presentation. As that was I, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Yeah, we... Uh, let's see. Um, Professor Bantu, would you like to moderate the questions? Uh, no, I was just trying to inform our colleagues here in uh, East Africa uh, that uh, you might need to have share you need to have shared the link, but we can be able to... I think to, we're waiting. Um, uh, uh, because uh, we yeah, so we wanted to, to, to understand that uh, this presentation was well done and well received. And of course, with the major areas of collaboration, and more especially in the model that is being used, the adjusted model of transnational or translational okay, research. So, um, so maybe some questions that I have is, is what are some barriers that you see um, that prevent people from getting into translational research? Like, what We need better trained uh, physicians um, and, and knowledgeable um, public to challenge some of these, these, these um, uh, uh, diagnoses that they get because the ideal point is to, is to get um, treatment or at least start thinking about treatment at the onset. And so the more we have public asking questions about well, could this be, can I get tested for Alzheimer's or what are the signs? The more we, can, we have them take control of their health and we can get them into, hopefully get them into clinical trials. That also means on our side as scientists and clinical trial um, uh, organizers, we need to do a better job of reaching out to the community. So we have to bridge the gap and find some way to inform the public about these opportunities and not only about them, but the benefits of 
of participating, potentially participating in clinical trials. So there are multiple levels of interjection, of intervening that will, um, that will help. And it comes from uh, the community side, the healthcare worker side, as well as the basic science side. That's awesome. Uh, what are some, um, during the COVID pandemic, like I know that that was a, a huge, that, that must have been, that's, that's something that was, that arise all of a sudden. It's a subject that no one um, heard about. What are some, how, how are you so successful, um, you think, to disseminate that information and that the public received it well um, versus other people who, um, that tried the same thing, but they weren't as successful? Um, what do you think, what are some, what are some, I would say like what are, what, what are some um, like techniques or a, a sort of met approaches that you would use, that you use um, with minority communities in the U.S. that you found that were very effective versus your colleagues who tried that but weren't as effective and there was more conspiracy theory around them versus when you approach uh, the community what, what do you like? What are some uh, differences you see there? Well, one of the key things that we recognize is people are naturally curious and inquisitive, and they had questions related to, you know, COVID nineteen, the virus, as well as the vaccine. And so we, there was no, um, there was no judgment, no, no stigma, and Recording we in were not pushing, saying, saying you, you have, have to get, get the vaccine. vaccine. We, we said. said you know, you know, we, we wanted, wanted to convey, convey information, information for you to decide. And I feel like the honest conversations that we had about the challenges or the impacts of COVID-19, as well as the virus, the virus as well as the vaccine, influenced people's understanding of um, the importance of the vaccine. Um, and that led to increased uptake. So, um, so in, in part, to answer your question, um, we were not forcing anything on people. Um, we just offered town hall meetings where we, we talked to the public and addressed their questions. And we made sure to ensure them that no question was, 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 was dumb. Um, you know, everyone was experiencing the, the, the pandemic and the virus at the same time. And so we have to be cognizant and aware of different backgrounds and lived experiences that may influence influence people's decision to get certain types of treatment. Um, COVID, and, and there was a little shame associated with COVID-19. Um, people, people didn't want to disclose that they had the virus, um, but we wanted to create this environment where people felt safe and comfortable and trusted with their information. So the more we can kind of build those relationships and maintain those relationships, um, we believe that that leads to a healthier community. I and we're agree. hoping to see yeah. the, we're hoping to see the same thing with Alzheimer's, um, with the Alzheimer's and, and other neurological disorders. I agree. I think approaching the community where they're at in their environment is the best way to go. Um, rather right, because than, a, yeah. A lot of times these decisions are made in a group of people that don't understand the community that they're helping to understand what are the factors, what, how the community functions and what information they want to know rather than, rather than talking to them, we want to talk with them and have the conversation. So we've done this at churches and we've done this in the community. Um, we've even done this before COVID um, for cancer-related uh, research. Um, and each time we see that people have really great questions, but they have no one to ask the questions to. So the more engagement we have with the community, um, the better. But we also have to remember that the community is not going to understand it from our level. We have to make sure we put it in simple terms so that they understand mm -hmm and feel comfortable talking about it um, and, and following up if necessary. That's amazing. Yes, I think that a lot of times um, 
you know, there's like, during, especially during COVID, I think is a good example. Is like they have this generalization. It's like, you know, the NIH has this, this like, you know, these, uh, you know, all of these guidelines, and then that's supposed to be something that the whole world needs to adapt to, just to their generalization. And they haven't taken into account all of these other communities that don't, uh, that that's not a way to, to communicate with them. Um, and I think it's very important to meet the communities and be culturally sensitive, understand um, some of their questions and address those as well. But a lot of times they, they oversee that. And I think that's why it's not very effective in many countries. Um, so I really appreciate that you go into churches and you speak um, and you empower the community with knowledge. Um, and, and you're right, it does go far, like a long way. Just speaking with people, having a bi-directional conversation um, and and meeting where they're at with more of a of a, a set less you know with um, with simple language rather than with scientific language and not trying to um, to like sort of spook anyone but more so to to provide a, a method of understanding and I think with Alzheimer's is very it is one of those diseases that is um, is very challenging because there's these initial symptoms that people don't understand. There's like the aging component and then there's the disease component. Um, so that's, you, and then you have in neurodegeneration, what I've noticed with aging, there's also this Parkinson's. So a lot of times when patients start, um, at least with our elders, they start to, to show these symptoms. Like it's, I think, how do you know when, like when it's aging related versus synthetic, like when it's something like, okay, now we have a problem. Yeah, it, one thing is it uh, monitoring it. That's the key thing because typically it'll get progressively worse um, fast, but monitoring of behaviors and symptoms is really important. So I try to encourage people to create a, like a health journal to record some of these, these um, things that, that it may be something, it may be nothing, but it's data that um, can be the the physician can use to actually make proper assessments of your of your condition. Um, a lot of times we think that you know the pain in my knee is not related to some other thing, but sometimes these these um, sicknesses or or aches and pains. Um, are part of a bigger issue. So the more the more information we have, the better we can monitor your specific um, condition, and that's that's exactly what we want. We 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 need to move a little bit away from the one size fits all um, treatment model and find out exactly um, what works for individuals for individuals, and and that oh, will yeah. take that will take this bi directional communication where the patient is informed and understands, um, you know, how the physician can actually make these diagnoses um, with the help of the information they provide, like in medical history. So the more we can capture, the hopefully the better we can make these uh, 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 predictions or assessments of, of health. What would you say, what are ways that a, um, a faith-based leader, like a, ma a pastor or imam can can, like what sort of what what do you think that they can talk about, or they can disseminate? What kind of information these um, these symptoms? What what sort of information do you think that would would better equip them to help to to help their their communities? Great question. Um, so uh, one one way is to have uh, pastors. So we invite pastors to Meharry. Um, to actually engage with researchers um, that um, that are um, composed of, of of leaders in the community, uh, particularly pastors in the churches, and we meet with them on a regular basis to talk about um, the research that we do, as well as the direction um, and the Im importance of the research. So we try to have an engaged, ongoing interaction with. Um, uh, church leaders, because we know that um, they have an important role in 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 providing information to the community um, and and demystify things about health, um, particularly in some areas that 
that, you know, mental health in the Black community has been um, really um, difficult because it wasn't talked about. Um, but we need to have these, we need to show that these conversations are okay to have. And people who are experiencing this need some outlet and a way to talk about their challenges because the psychosocial stresses of just holding that in and not having an outlet um, also weigh into the overall health of, of our community. And so um, having discussions like this where it's opened up to the community and, and we just ask questions or the community just asks questions that are answered by professionals in the field really provides that dynamic that's needed to increase the trust as well as overall health of the community. So the more discussions and we the more discussions that we have with the community, the more information we learn about the community, as well as the the more opportunities we have to provide resources for the community. That's a wonderful. That's I, I love that. So empowering pastors um, and faith based leaders and having them work and be on panels. Um, I I agree. I think so. I recent so when I went to Uganda in, in January, that's what we were doing. So. Um, through the Women of Purpose um, International in Uganda, our approach was to um, to work. So we had a symposium where I gave a talk, a pastor gave a talk, then a scientist gave a talk, and then so and vice versa. And I think that the uh, the people in in the community was was more receptive because it's now like I'm engaging with their with their leader and their community that they listen to. Um, and it, they see the bi-directionality. And I think that it's more, that it has, that's how you gain trust from the community. And I, that, that's brilliant that you have them on your advisory board for community outreach. I think they, uh, working together with, with faith-based leaders, as well as with the scientists and neurologists is, is I, I believe for our, it's definitely with many of our communities, it is the best, one of the best uh, treatment outcomes that, would, that I could see. So, and one um, other thing that I think would be important and I can provide assistance with is, you know, we created materials for people to, to give out to people. So we created like infographics about, you know, um, COVID-19 and we, we disseminated that to the community. Now, these were facts that were vetted by scientists and medical, medical um, professionals to ensure it's accurate. Um, but we wanted to put it in, um, in in graphics that were relatable to the community, right? We wanted to make sure that the community knows, um, one, that um, this, this is an important, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the disease is significant and it disproportionately affects um, Black Americans. Um, but we also want to be able to provide information for pe people to look up on their own. So we put reliable sources that we vetted and 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 um, and 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 confirmed for accuracy, so that people had a resource to go to. We also asked what what are the best methods for disseminating this information. So we have to make sure that we're disseminating the information. Um, the way the community wants it, because if the community doesn't want those infographics, then they're not going to read or get the information. Maybe they want something on their cell phone. Maybe they want something on a website. So we had to create multiple media platforms or outlets to disseminate this information to accommodate the community or communities that we, we target, um, uh, that we work with. And so even with mental health, I think it's important that we create um, these type of infographics to help demystify um, some of the, the challenges, the things that we hear with, with um, uh, mental well-being. Yeah, I, that's, that, that's great. That's, um, I, I, yeah, you're right. It's, I think it's not about uh, just having information there. It's about being intentional with the information and making sure that you know, not just checking off the box that you disseminate, for, but actually are people, you know, actually engaging with the information? Are they, re, you know, are they um, receptive to the information? Is there something where they're understanding either a cartoon? And, and it's true through through the whole 
um, COVID-19, I think part of it being so successful in people getting vaccinated or people washing their hands was through a lot of these, um, was through these in infographics, through these cartoons, um, where, and, and some were very complicated and some were much simpler. And I saw some of yours and I thought, like, that was very helpful even for my own family who was hesitant and with conspiracy theories and things like that. But I think uh, meeting people where they are in, in this way, that, that's, that's very, um, yeah, that's very impactful and intentional. Yeah, and so, and so I, I would just say that basic scientists can play a role in increasing public trust overall. Um, but like like we reiterated, it has to be intentional and organized and 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 structured so that um, we maintain the trust within the community. What do you think um, some of the barriers is for um, working with an older generation? So like um, those suffering from Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, um, yeah. where they're not like so readily accessible to a lot of this other technology stuff. Right, yeah, so we had to do, well, when COVID started, we had to do phone calls, <laughs> right? Like not oh, everyone yeah. had access to Zoom. Um, and so we were doing telephone, like a telephone call type conference call um, because people didn't have the technology for that. Um, now COVID made it difficult to do things in person, uh, obviously, but now that, um, you know, the pandemic has been um, uh, 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 lessened, dampened, um, uh, we still have the opportunity to go out into the community and to have these type of interactions that we normally wouldn't get um, through virtual platforms. So one barrier is just access to people. Um, another, another barrier is just having the right forum or venue to do it. Um, uh, and I think those are, those are pretty much the major ones that we've seen, um, thus far. Okay. That, yeah, I, I agree. I think with, um, the older folks, it's, it's about, um, calling them and also like seeing them in person as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the most effective way, um, of, of engaging because they, they want more of like a personal like engagement, personal touch, yeah. And and through the phone, at least you can feel the person's voice. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's from Kenya. We have uh, a few questions and uh, I think it is prudent that uh, uh, Professor Davis has mentioned about the adjustment model of translation research which is very, very vital, and it is in line with what we envision to establish within the East African uh, regions. And also having other people from other countries and universities, it would be very, very relevant. I just have about three questions. The first question to Davis is, um, <clears throat> uh, can you provide a case scenario illustrating the integration of psychiatric and spiritual approaches for mental health. Because I believe that um, if we are looking at the imams, like the attendance of our, our participants, I've seen one vice chancellor, acting vice chancellor from uh, UMA, UMA University, which is also clergy, also, university from KIU, that is Kampala International University, is a, a university that uh, really esteems uh, religion. And then uh, where we are seated at Kenya Methodist University is a Christian institution. So I want to believe that uh, uh, Professor uh, Davis has articulated on that, but I wanted to see a scenario where a patient say, experiencing depression and existential distress, or as Hamer's disease or dementia, or Parkinson's disease, uh, how these three professionals can be of a help. That is one. I would like to have that kind of scenario. But in the case of the two professions, uh, like uh, psychiatrists may provide cognitive behavior therapy to address depressive symptoms, while a spiritual leader may offer pastoral counseling 
to explore existential concerns and provide spiritual support. So in so doing, we can have a comprehensive treatment plan that addresses both the psychological and the spiritual needs. In the case of our institutions in East Africa, can we be able to come up with a center, a global center of excellence in mental health and uh, psychology, for example, having it hosted, say, in Kemu, then we can begin with Kemu, but rotate to other countries to create more awareness, and then we apply digital, uh, digital mental health so that we can engage countries to support that. So the other question I have is what interventions can be implemented to integrate psychiatric and spiritual approaches for mental health? He has at least um, given an approach uh, of how we can be able to... ...or strategy for the community at hand. And having this centralized in the center or institute is going to be critically important. So one aspect of the center that I, that I can contribute or, or discuss is how to engage with the community. So this means that um, what strategies do we have to bring awareness to the community to get the community to come to you? And what strategies do you have to go out to the community? Um, and so part of that is significant on meeting the, the community where they are. So we've gone to churches and had session in churches um, and a full range of uh, religious services as well as informational sessions. And these have been very impactful because um, we can meet the people where they are. So having um, interaction specifically at churches as part of uh, places that the public already goes is critically important because um, I guess one of the other barriers is the accessibility. People will not always have the time or the community will not always have the time to make it to a university campus, but we know that um, on Sunday people go to church and that's a, a, a really great way to interact and engage um, on aspects of everyday life that we do already. And so the more we have uh, or the increased number of interactions um, at church sessions um, will likely lead to more people um, getting aware and having knowledge about um, uh, diseases. Now, in terms of treatments and how to treat patients, I think it's a separate category that needs um, a, a professional to weigh in. Um, but, but providing the platform and understanding the needs of the community um, are, are critically the first step because in building the center, again, you want to make sure that um, the, the public will access and use the center and that it has the resources to provide uh, for the community. Did I, I believe I, I hope I answered your question adequately or questions. He said we can have at uh, uh, the Kenya Methodist University and uh, one of the approaches is that we, we form it and we announce it within the East African region. I'm aware about uh, Kawara University has already a center of wellness, mental wellness. Makere University has, and also the Kampala International University, they established a center of excellence on mental health. So I believe if we begin now a global center of mental health, which should be known throughout the East African region, we can have, say, a summer school in uh, July, for example, and then have another summer school in August, maybe in Uganda, then another summer school in DRC, another summer school in, so that we can be able to distribute them uh, in those areas. One of now, the- Now, with these summer schools, yes. would they include the, com the community or just researchers? Uh, 
uh, it will include the community. Uh, for example, Kabara University is, is mission is that uh, it's a, a university without walls, meaning that they are expected to move to the community. And, uh, and a look at the location of Kenya Methodist University, you will notice that it is a community university. And since we are talking about community outreach programs, for them to be able to articulate on some of those issues, I think these two universities uh, will provide a platform. And in fact, to begin with, we can begin with uh, that global center of mental wellness uh, at, uh, in Kenya. And I think that will be okay. And, uh, <laughs> I think I have seen some uh, hands uh, up. Uh, Professor Karama, the Vice Chancellor for UMA, uh, his hand is up. Uh, I think, Professor, you're welcome. You can make your remarks. Uh, thank you very much. I want to, first of all, uh, appreciate uh, Kemu uh, for organizing this with the other institutions. Uh, and I think uh, I would look at mental health as one of neglect neglected areas that uh, we have to really uh, take up, and especially research in this field is very minimal because of lack of expertise in our areas. And uh, I want to appreciate uh, uh, Davis also for the presentation he has given us. We have to appreciate that uh, all forms of mental health are confused with uh, spiritual and uh, also faith healing comes in and uh, uh, the community aspect as you have put it uh, is very essential but we also need to uh, educate uh, the first line of uh, health uh, providers that is the community uh, promoters to be able to understand some aspects of mental health and to be able to provide that service i also think that uh, the centers that have been established uh, will be very useful, and I think other universities should also benefit from the summer schools that um, are organized through KEMU. And therefore, I really appreciate this uh, process, and uh, I wish that we sustain it uh, for, a, for a much more better understanding of mental health. Thank you very much, Davis, to the Harvard School and to KEMU uh, for this initiative. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Davis, yes. you can respond, yes. That was just a basic uh, uh, information, and it talks about lack of research, which is a very important area, and the confusion and miscom com misconception and misapprehension of some of these ecological conditions. Because I was asking one of our presenters this morning to tell me in, uh, I think it was from DRC, uh, and they speak French, but all the time you'd hear uh, PTSD, you'd hear stress, you hear some of those conditions have not read the direct translation. So by reaching out into the community, it is easier to demystify some of these. We can get people to label them appropriately. And I think uh, this dialogue, this international dialogue should be able to be open, as he said, in the centers that we are creating and uh, since I'm a visiting professor from the Inter-University Inter Council for East Africa uh, to, to Kenya, uh, one of the uh, activities we can start with and will be supported by the Inter-University Council for East Africa is the Global Center, the East African Global Center of Mental Health. And we can begin with Kenya Methodist University and other universities. And um, I'm excited that um, the treatment modalities, like as we integrate, that's what I was asking about scenarios uh, that can illustrate uh, the integration of spirituality and psychiatry, for example. I said a psychiatrist can be responsible for diagnosis and treatment of depression. And then on the other hand, the spiritual person can be able to deal with existential distress, existential anxiety. 
So in other words, they would be working together through a multidimensional approach. And this can only be achieved through a structured platform, right? Right, and, and it's, it's also important to work together and learn from each other. So also what, what's worked for one community, one thing we realized is, um, you know, we have to talk the language of the community and we can't assume that um, the community understands some of the basic things that, that we understand. So when I first started talking about uh, my work, I had to recognize that not everyone understood what a protein was. And so we really have to go back and make sure that we put it on a level where we're not using these acronyms and, and, and things that people don't understand um, because we don't want to lose them. Um, we don't want to lose them in the sense that they disengage or they, they think it's, they get confused at, at what we're saying. So, so we have to learn how to do that because sometimes it's difficult to talk. We're so used to talking to other scientists. Sometimes it's difficult to have these conversations with the general public. Thank you. A few more questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Davis, for the presentation. Um, I note that the in Kenya, and especially in the community where I come from, Meru, uh, a person uh, who has acute mental health and has uh, actually lost his logical reasoning, cannot dress well, cannot uh, reason out well, is just doing uh, things which are crazy, is uh, referred to as Mtuankoma. In Kemeru, which is interpreted in English to mean uh, a demon-possessed person. From your community, what is that person referred to? And when it comes now to psychologists, whom do, do they refer that person to? Or what is the definition of that kind of a person? Because mental health as various levels and various categories. When you're talking about mental health, there are various levels, there are various categories, but I am specifically concerned about this person uh, who has really lost his thinking capacity of verity completely. What do you call that person in your community? And from a medical perspective, who is that? And because from also, even if spiritually, the Bible refers to that person as a demon-possessed person. Thank you. Yes, so that, that is a challenge because um, labeling people, um, putting people with those labels is um, almost uh, uh, creates them as an outsider to the community. And... Um, in, in a lot of communities, we have people like that that are unhoused and in the neighborhood. Um, for the most part, what happens here is to some degree that person is left alone and and no one refers that person. Um, but we need to find the right ways to get get assistance for that person. Um, and And here that starts with the community. So um, labeling that person, we uh, we don't typically have a name for that person, but we do know that um, in some communities that people refer to them as being possessed or some sort of demonic um, entity, um, and and that that may need to change because we don't want to continually create the stigma. And a lot of times with mental health disorders, there's signs that happen way before people um, get to an advanced state. So uh, ideally it would help to have some of these these signs acknowledged early on and assistance giving before, um, before it gets progressively worse. But again, that takes the, the help and impact of the community 
to um, refer those resources and the individual to uh, to get the right help. Uh, all right, there are two other questions. Uh, Dr. Getie, proceed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair. My name is Reverend Dr. Getie Kiambarwa. I want to appreciate Davis for the presentation and all other presentations that have taken place. I'd also appreciate the Working Together Alliance proposed, but just as uh, um, Dr. Kibara asked, uh, maybe the same question from a different perspective is uh, how do we, Davis, uh, get to have different professions work together for a common good to help this person who is struggling so that a psychiatrist does not see this as purely a medical problem and does not appreciate the place of uh, the pastoral or spiritual leaders or the place of psychologists because that has always been a very big problem that um, depending with one's profession they tend to focus a lot on a treatment based on their perspective. How do we get um, all those uh, professions work together? Because as you have outlined in your research, it is important and it is more effective that those people work together. The second thing is uh, always prevention is better than cure. Of course, other than uh, hereditary factors that causes uh, Alzheimer's, um, what programs can we put in place, especially in our context, to contribute to the reduction or prevention of um, conditions such as the one that you have presented and general mental uh, conditions here in Africa? Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry if I didn't answer the question adequately last time. So um, I think... Uh, what we're learning is uh, uh, research, there's not a lot of research into mental health. So in order to kind of bring everyone together, um, we're driven by the research and the data that we learn from the research. So bringing psychiatrists into the fold with basic science researchers, as well as behavioral researchers to understand that these are the type of patients that, um, that are around in the community and how do we work together to prevent the, 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 the um, to demystify kind of these stigmas associated with um, mental health and not label, label the community so that they feel um, comfortable enough to come and get help when they experience earlier signs. So the center is going to be the vital part of, of providing a platform to bring psychiatrists, and different health professionals together to work out a plan beforehand to emphasize how do we actually, this person has this type of uh, mental health condition, but this person has another. How do we treat both of them individually to understand um, the impact or the, the their, their disorder completely to actually give them help? And, and we see that um, using research and, and activities that, that, uh, that other people have developed and implemented and then integrating them into our own community with the right health professionals that can talk about each of the stages of, of the mental health as well as a healthcare professional or basic scientist to understand the general mechanism. Um, and then having these conversations to see, well, how, 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 um, how frequent or how many people in our community does this impact? Um, so the center will, you know, that that to me, the center will 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 provide that role. And these type of discussions are the start. So recognizing and acknowledging that these things are happening across different communities um, is really important to get started. And now to do an assessment of well, what resources do we have to bring together to address these, these, these community members? In terms of your second question for Alzheimer's, um, some of the preventative stuff, it's really different. It's really difficult because Alzheimer's does not have an effective treatment. But one thing we do understand 
that influences Alzheimer's significantly is exercise and proper sleep. So sleep is a really important part of our overall health. Um, what we think happens when we sleep is that the brain basically repairs itself. So if we're not sleeping with quality sleep, it can influence some of the levels of lipids that I spoke about and could lead to the buildup of amyloid plaque, associated, the home, one of the hallmarks of, of Alzheimer's. The other thing that we're learning is that exercise is vitally important um, to, to reduce or prevent the onset of Alzheimer's. So having a healthy community and, and, and a community that can exercise and move around as much as possible plays a significant part. part. So right now, those are the two most preventative measures that can influence um, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, progression or onset of, of, of Alzheimer's. And so we also need to understand other aspects of, um, of, of, of just being engaged with the community. A lot of what of dementia, um, Alzheimer's is the common form of dementia, but dementia happens and accelerates in, in, in old elderly people that don't engage with the community or society. So people who unfortunately elderly that are sitting alone and not, not um, having a lot of brain activity seem to um, decline more rapidly than those that actually do things in the community with their family or in other aspects of moving around. So understanding and providing these resources so that, um, so that P the community can come together to um, help facilitate this. And maybe also this is thing, these are things that can happen at the church as well as the center is having these kind of organized activities to keep um, to keep exercise and 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 um, uh, physical activities um, uh, a part of of a preventative treatment. Uh, next question, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, thank you. Um, Jairo Segbe, student of uh, counseling psychology. Um, coming down from uh, the Nairobi campus. Yeah, I really appreciate the Working Together Alliance, um, but I have a little worry. Uh, in my country, Cameroon, Central Africa, where I come from, investment in mental health is really a challenge. Um, individuals, communities, and governments invest very little in mental health. So individuals that have mental health challenges already are in a very difficult position. Now, the Working Together Alliance means we are going to take more than one health care giver. So the health care providers increase in both number and intensity. That also increase cost. I want to understand what the program has envisaged, especially for us in Africa, in the area of spending, since the Working Together Alliance also augment the cost of treatment. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. So one of the challenges is is finding the right investments. So um, also in getting started, um, it may take one person at a time or a small team of people um, just to provide the framework to get it started. So yes, there's a cost associated with these centers, but there are resources out there that hopefully collectively can build up the resources and funding to facilitate this. So that, that in turn comes with um, coming together and recognizing, well, which resources um, do we have that we can share to actually um, uh, implement some of the things that we wanna do? Um, and again, sometimes that means starting off small until you're able to make an impact and then um, ramping up. So a lot of what, happens here is we have to demonstrate that um, we are actually making an impact. So we have to evaluate our interactions and our activities with the community. And once we demonstrate that we're making that impact, 
we can then go back and request more funds or find more funds to say, look, this is a big need in the community and we want to expand it because these this is what the community wants. I recognize each country may operate differently, but I'm hoping that there are opportunities to synergize and combine efforts to make this a global impact. And then also reaching out to global funding entities. There's an important part of uh, grant writing and finding the right resources to um, to 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 build this, um, and I do believe that there are a lot of resources out there, and tapping together um, will 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 show that um, we all bring in different perspectives of re of resources. Um, it enables more work to be done. Yeah, and just to um, piggyback of what Dr. Davis is saying. Um, so the professor from Cameroon, I understand that some many times it's hard to convince the government to invest in mental health uh, resources because they have other priorities. But I think that having these type of summits, um, so one, so something that we do is like the local universities, like so, um, so for example, like in your school, they, you know, your your um, even scientists, I think that. I understand there's a shortage over there. And I think just even bringing this information, you can partner with us. Like I went to Uganda, I didn't charge the government anything. It was part of my work. Um, I think re reaching, like collaborating with other institutions um, might be a way to go. Like, we, you know, because a lot of times it, we want to know um, more about other remote communities. So there are researchers willing to travel and to to learn more. Where there is a bi-directional um, conversation, where you you know like there's one area can learn from one one side, that one side can learn from the other, because there's still a lot of information we still lack on this side. And so I think you know having these type of summits, um, partnering with institutions in Cameroon would be the way to go. And then we can come up with summits like this that we can raise money. Um, and go back to either, you know, the Alzheimer's Association or any of these other organizations that are nonprofit um, international, we can apply together. If we apply for grants together, it'll be a much stronger proposal. A lot of us um, have, you know, I, I understand the resources here. And, and, you know, we have a lot of grant resources that, that you perhaps might not have in your university. And that's, that's fine. I, like, I'm always, like, I share with, that, with Professor Bantu, we're willing to, we're here now, and we're willing to share with you guys um, some of our resources. And I know there's, you know, luckily through Zoom, we have this platform now that we can have, you know, people to come in and give a seminar on how to write a grant. I, we know a lot of people that would be willing to do that. Um, the reason why I'm always trying to find these uh, free ways of doing it is because in my community, my community is also doesn't they're 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 not well off. A lot of them don't have the funding. A lot of them are in very remote poor areas that don't have access even to a cell phone. But yet, you know, we find these creative ways to getting to them. So and 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 I know like what Professor Davis was saying, like you know, you should have your scientists your your psychologists and your psychiatrists, but sometimes in countries that are, there's a shortage, there's not, they don't have that luxury. So I think, but like, I think just bringing that information just from one person, just sparking that interest is, is still goes a long way because the, the smartphones are still, um, there, there's still a lot of smartphones all throughout. Even when I was in Uganda, a lot of people had smartphones. So people will Google. It's just about planting the seed in their mind and like, okay, this is a this is what's going on. This is what what uh, the some of the uh, th this is what this disease is. These are the type of medications people take. And I think just going back also to the professor in Kenya um, about the patient in, in your in your vill in the in the neighborhood. Um, I think it's not a so what I'm finding is because I I'm I'm speaking with a family right now that has um, has a parent who. Um, who doesn't want to seek medical attention and she thinks that she's possessed. Okay. Like this is something that I'm going to, and she lives in Virginia. So one, of, so I've been working with my friend and one of the things like this is an anecdotal um, story, but one of the things that we're doing is like, I always tell her, I'm like, look, it's fine. If she wants to do a cleanse or spiritual cleanse, that's fine. But 
you have to also take her to to get to to see someone to see a professional like that's also part of it and i think instead of making the 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 community choose between one or the other it's like okay if they want to sprinkle some sage on themselves that's fine but we got to go see also a medical health professional um rather than you know sort of um like judging them for that you know, because it's still that's still all over our communities, you know, the spiritual sense and, and this um, this the demonic possession. All of that is very common throughout. But I think instead of um, shaming them for it, I think it's like I told my friend, I'm like, look, just have her do her ritual. But at the same time, say, OK, mom, tomorrow we're going to get an MRI, you know, and then just having it come together, because I think that just fighting the community and this, it's like. It, it makes them want to choose. And then I think that's where um, this conflict occurs, the conflict of information. Um, so I think having these type of summits where we, um, and, and, and like what Dr. Davis was saying, it's empowering, having pastors and also um, imams like on, on an advisory board for the local university or speaking with even the practitioners, I think is the, is the way to go. Thank you. I, I want to also add that it, it, it would be really um, great to evaluate or summarize this summit, right? So right now there's 67 people in this virtual space. And then I see that um, uh, at, 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 at the Kenya University that there's a group, a, a group, a room of people. Um, and so part of what, um, what we want to emphasize is this is, this is what researchers and, and, and people are interested in pursuing. And collectively, this is a large group of people, um, presume everybody with their own expertise that can contribute. And summarizing the impact of this summit is going to be a, a really important first step because um, people are coming together because it's an important topic to talk about. And we need to highlight some of the differences and challenges of barriers that occur at various institutions so that we can remove those barriers or, or at least remove the majority of them so that we can provide the type of, of, of treatment, training, and information necessary for our communities. So it would definitely be great to provide a summary of this. I know it's being recorded, but also to write this up and, and let the world see you know what 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 we and the Kenyan University was able to accomplish to understand how to address the needs of the community in 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 the mental health in the field of mental health uh thank you very much i think uh, we must be proud to have that conversation i think it has been uh, fairly uh, engaging and uh, thank you professor davis for that uh, very uh, you know, very well articulated presentation and the conversation that has followed. We certainly must be, uh, like you've indicated, we need to ask ourselves what is the take home after this uh, summit? What, uh, where, where do we build, what do we build, how do you build it, uh, build up uh, from where we are? And uh, like uh, Carl has said, uh, how do we enhance the collaboration so that we can support? Uh, the various initiatives from different uh, uh, ends uh, to continue to uh, support and uh, deal with the issues that are affecting our communities. Uh, thank you very much. I am sure we can now proceed to the next presentation unless uh, there is uh, any other reason. And uh, any other question from any other person? Any other comment? We want to move on to the next presentation, which is going to be given by none other by, uh, than, uh, than Professor Edward Bantu. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, MC Dr. Muchiri. I want to take this opportunity to introduce Professor Edward Bantu, our presenter, uh, to the participants. I am Dr. Kibala Tasila. Professor Bantu, an esteemed scholar and distinguished member of the Inter-University Council for East Africa, that is USEA, Staff Mobility Vice President for the World Council for Psychotherapy in Africa and University Professor, Kavara University. Professor Bantu is a renowned academic and thought leader in the field of education 
counseling psychology, he known for his pioneering contributions to higher education and regional integration within East Africa. As a distinguished scholar of the Inter-University Council for East Africa, Professor Bantu brings a wealth of expertise and experience to the Council's initiatives aimed at promoting uh, collaboration and excellence in higher education across the East African region. With a distinguished career spanning decade, Professor Bantu has held various leadership roles in academia, research, and policy development. Its scholarship encompasses a wide range of disciplines, policy, curriculum development, institutional guidance. Through his innovative research and advocacy efforts, Professor Bantu has spread a pivotal law in shaping the higher education landscape in East Africa and advocating for quality assurance, academic excellence, and equitable access to education. As a committed advocate for legal cooperation, Professor Bantu has been instrumental in advancing the objectives of the UCHEA, fostering partnerships among universities, and facilitating knowledge ex exchange and collaboration across borders. His visionary leadership and his strategic insights have contributed to the Council's effort to promote harmonization of academic standards, mobility of students and faculty, and development of collaborative research initiatives aimed at addressing regional challenges and fostering socio-economic development. In addition to his contributions to academia and regional integration, Professor Bantu is widely respected for his commitment to mentorship and capacity building, nurturing the next generation of scholars and leaders in East Africa. His dedication to excellent integrity and inclusivity serves as an inspiration to colleagues and students alike, embodying the, the values of scholarship, leadership, and service are central to the mission of the care. In summary, Professor Bantu's exemplary leadership, scholarship, and commitment to the regional cooperation make him a valuable asset to the Inter-University Council for East Africa and a respected figure in the academic community across the region. His contributions continue to shape the future of higher education in East Africa, leaving a lasting legacy of excellence and collaboration for generations to come. Colleagues and the partners and the participants in this conference, this is the kind of uh, uh, presenter we have at our desk today, and I'd like you to join, to join me to welcome Professor Van to, to make his presentation. Can we welcome him in a clap? <laughs> welcome, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for such uh, an exhaustive introduction. I want to really appreciate that piece of introduction. This afternoon, um, trying to present on a subject that affects uh, the mental health of the participants who are professionals in the various capacities, like the psychologists, the counselors, the chaplains, and the clergy, who tirelessly serve individuals grappling with psychological distress. However, they are not recognized. And amid the admirable mission to alleviate the suffering of others, these mental health professionals often overlook their own psychosocial needs. Therefore, this presentation is going to look into the critical issues of addressing the psychosocial needs of mental health professionals and spiritual leaders, highlighting the significance of acknowledging and supporting their well-being. You will notice that mental health professionals and spiritual leaders 
frequently find themselves in emotionally demanding roles, navigating complex therapeutic relationships, grappling with vicarious trauma and confronting existential questions. Despite the inherent stressors of their profession, there exists a pervasive culture of silence and neglect surrounding the mental health of these caregivers. This neglect not only jeopardizes the well-being of individual professionals, but also undermines the quality of care they provide to their clients and congregants. So recognizing in this international dialogue and addressing the psychosocial needs of mental health professionals and spiritual leaders is paramount for several reasons. First, prioritizing their well-being fosters resilience and prevents burnout, ensuring sustained effectiveness in their roles. And secondly, attending to their mental health cultivates a courage of compassion and empathy within the profession, enhancing therapeutic relationships and outcomes, and thirdly, promoting self-care among mental health professionals and spiritual leaders sets a vital precedent for destigmatizing help-seeking behavior and prioritizing mental health within their respective communities. So there is an urgent need for concerted action to support psychosocial needs of mental health professionals and spiritual leaders across the board. This action entails creating safe spaces for honest dialogue about mental health challenges, implementing institutional policies across the board in East Africa and Africa as a continent to, that prioritize self-care and work-life balance, providing accessible mental health resources and support services, and fostering a culture of mutual support and peer supervision within professional and religious communities. Uh, addressing the psychosocial needs of mental health professionals and spiritual leaders is not just a matter of personal well-being, but a crucial component of ensuring the integrity and effectiveness of mental health care and spiritual guidance. So by acknowledging and supporting the mental health of those who dedicate their lives to support others, we pave the way for a healthier, more compassionate, and more resilient future for both caregivers and those that they serve. Uh, a counselor, for example, working in a high-stress environment encounters numerous clients with complex trauma histories leading to emotional exhaustion and burnout. A psychologist conducting research on sensitive topics experiences secondary trauma from hearing participants' traumatic stories. An experience, for example, of the genocide in Rwanda 1994. An experience in Kenya at, during the 2007 general elections, all these can create experiences that require some intervention. A psychiatrist working long hours, especially now that we have some institutions that have very few psychiatric doctors, psychiatric nurses, case managers, in a facility, they feel overwhelmed by the emotional demands of caring for patients with severe mental illnesses. You can imagine, so understanding burnout and compassion fatigue in mental health care will help the people 
to be able to empathize and sympathize with others. So these examples, uh, I could pause and ask, do the professionals aware of burnout and compassion fatigue? Do they know the signs and symptoms of burnout and compassion fatigue? Sometimes they may know the signs that include emotional exhaustion, cynicism, reduced personal accomplishments, intrusive thoughts related to clan's trauma and difficulty empathizing. But at the same time, you find they are still working while they are aware of some of these. How then can mental health professionals differentiate between burnout and compassion fatigue? One of the basic typical way arises from chronic work stress. Whereas compassion fatigue results from repeated exposure to others suffering leading to emotional depression. I have observed in many countries where the professionals are aware of all these conditions, but there is little that they can do. And that's why I think of coming up with a facility on digital mental health so that they can be able to respond to some of these conditions. One way, of course, for them to have what we call self-care and well-being practices. They are, uh, they are about 10 mental health tips. One of them is doing exercise. You can stretch. You can stretch in the office. If you have a big office, you can stretch. You can do some exercise. You can do relaxation. Uh, this morning, this afternoon, we were given an example of some of the basic means of how we can relax our body. Time outdoors. Let's have some time not to be always in the workplace, but try to have an opportunity to be able to engage in regular exercise, mindfulness, and relaxation techniques. Good diet. I've observed a number of professions like a psychiatrist. They are busy treating and prescribing disease, uh, diseases or conditions, but they fail to consider diet. Good diet is very, very important. Sleep. You need to have an opportunity to go and sleep. Sometimes it is very healthy. Gratitude. At times, you need to, be, to reward yourself for work well done. I've seen many places, even the way I do it myself, I, I reward myself, I put on music, I dance, I feel good. Routines, it's very important that you really schedule the routines um, that are very, very relevant to your area. Socializing. A number of these people, because they are overwhelmed by these conditions, they do not have an opportunity to socialize. They, they minimize the number of persons. And I think in our dialogue this afternoon, this morning, we need to embrace community outreach programs through the churches, through the community uh, corporate responsibility. And most important, Let's not engage ourselves into drugs, smoking. Actually, one of the risk factors for suicide is getting involved into drugs and alcohol. Most important, we need to provide access to mental health resources and counseling services. And Davis, it is like he was preempting my presentation when he said, we need to leverage activities so that we can be able to get help. We want to make collaborations. We want to make partnerships. That's one way we can be able to solve most of these problems. That's why as we endeavor to come up with these 
programs, it is important to help one another. Um, building supportive communities and their roles. This has been one of the most discussed area in this presentation, the all of this day. Everyone is talking about creating peer support groups or supervision circles. This is something that we are lacking in Africa, where we need to have supervision. Like when you get depleted, you can be supervised. And I think in uh, the communities we envision to go to, we need to train most of the people. Establishing workplace wellness programs and encouraging open communication and empathy among colleagues. Because I've seen a number of times because you are emotionally depleted, you can shout at your person or your uh, officers or subordinates in a manner that does not construe, that can, I'm saying is that, that when you are emotionally depleted, there is a likelihood of shouting at your people that you are supposed to be taking care of. Encourage open communication and empathy among colleagues. Provide access to mental health resources and counseling services. One of the most critical way of how we can be able to cope with the overwhelming requirements of job is to exercise spiritual and existential coping. We should be able to reflect on personal values and beliefs, finding meaning and purpose in work, and engaging in spiritual practices such as prayer, meditation, or ritual. Like in Japan, for example, it's a requirement that you visit the community at home. You visit your grandparents, you visit your relatives. But in the current situation, where people are left to be living alone, and as a result of an increase in technology, advancement in technology, the relatives are only seen during the special days, Christmas, Easter holidays, like it is coming. So we need to develop uh, an attitude of putting in place when we can be able to, co to cope by visiting our relatives. Engage in spiritual practices such as prayer, meditation, or ritual. I have attended a number of churches, and some of these churches, when they are praying, they can pray, they can talk to God, they can shout. That's how they feel good. We have trainings in Harvard. Harvard can have trainings at Makere or Kawari or uh, Kenya Methodist University so that we can have a transfer of knowledge, uh, especially in terms of culture. Encouraging regular team meetings for collaboration and debriefing. Uh, like if we have a symposium like this one, we have called the clergy, the imams, the educators, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, so people would be able to emote. And some of the topics highlighted, you discover that people are emoting, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. The role of spirituality and existential coping. It is important to recognize spirituality as a source of strength and resilience, but we need to be able to do it cautiously so that we do not mislead the people that we lead. I have had experiences in some countries where people have been misled to the extent of losing their lives. A case in point, we have an example here in Kenya where a certain denomination, uh, so-called the Shakahola, went into uh, spiritual aspects to the extent that a number of people lost their lives. Even in Uganda, there are situations where people were burnt in a church because 
they did not have a psychologist, they did not have a psychiatrist to determine and classify the level of mental illness so that treatment could be done earlier. And therefore, it is important to integrate spiritual practices into counseling or therapy sessions when appropriate. Sporting clients in exploring existential questions and finding meaning in the experiences. We should be able to ask ourselves, why are we here? What do we gain? Why are we alive? And such kind of existential questions will help us to find meaning in the work that we do. Why should I have interest in talking to someone? Why should I have interest in helping someone? So those existential questions will rejuvenate us in the support systems that we have. Collaborating with chaplains or spiritual leaders to address clients' spiritual needs. You will notice in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says that God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the person became a living soul. Soul is psyche, is the mind. And therefore, most of the priests, the chaplains, the clergy, are practicing on how to bring wellness, a living soul. But in the process, they need to be supported. They need to collaborate with psychologists. They need to collaborate with psychiatrists so that they can be able to define conditions that are demonic, conditions that are psychiatric, and conditions that require psychotherapy. Most important is professional boundaries and ethics, maintaining confidentiality and privacy of clients' information. I have seen scenarios where bishops and clergy when they are preaching and making introduction of their sermons, they begin giving examples. These examples uh, that may indicate someone within the congregation having that particular experience. And if you do it, the member will just leave your church the following day. So it is important to be very careful in maintaining confidentiality and privacy of clients' information. Avoid dual relationships and conflicts of interest. Sometimes you may find that as you help, those are helping professions. Somehow you may find yourself engaged between the client interest and what you are interested in. For example, business. It's not important, it's not required that you do business with your clients that you are counseling. Seeking supervision and consultation when facing ethical dilemmas. Every person is very unique and this uniqueness requires personal therapy, requires supervision. Someone should be there for you. Each of these professionals, as we do the partnerships, we should be able to seek some form of debrief because of certain situation that can create a dilemma. So adhering to professional codes of ethics and the standards of practice will help us to avoid uh, stressful scenarios. It is also important to participate in ongoing training workshops and conferences and dialogues like this one we have today. Engage in regular supervision or consultation with experienced professionals. I'm aware that in Africa this area still lacks, but even when at its formative stage, we need to engage in regular supervision, consultation with experienced professionals, and staying updated on the latest research and evidence-based practices. 
So pursuing professional development opportunities to enhance clinical skills and knowledge. Every day we should be learning. At one time when I was in school, it was difficult to write five. It was difficult to write three. It was difficult to write seven. It was difficult to write nine. So anytime I want to write nine, it is letter P. Anytime I want to write seven, I don't know what name I can give. Maybe a broom. Anytime I want to write three, it is just facing the other direction. So uh, these professions that we are getting in, every situation should be presenting a learning experience. There are examples that are rated to integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health. What is the significance of integrating these professions? One is that integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches acknowledges the interconnectedness of psychological well-being and spiritual well-being as I mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 which leads to more holistic and comprehensive care for individuals experiencing mental health challenges. As you noted, one of the speakers talked about the spiritual aspect that was experienced by the disciples. Jesus used an avenue where he could get the disciples and take them out for purposes of rest, for purposes of nourishment. That story talks about Jesus taking the disciples to cross the other side of the lake. And while they were crossing in the other side of the, of, of the lake, a storm aroused during that time. But because they had a supervisor, they had a mentor, he woke up and told them, be still, I'm here with you. So this kind of approach recognizes that mental health is influenced by biological, psychological, social and spiritual factors. And I'm aware that Professor Carroll will be talking about aggression and the neurobiological basis of behavior. So when we get together as a team, we cooperate as one body, then we shall make a significant difference in the lives of others. I want to give you a scenario number um, where a client struggling with depression, seeks therapy from a mental health counselor, and during the sessions, the counselor incorporates mindful exercises and encourages the client to explore their spiritual beliefs and practices as a means of finding inner peace and resilience. For some of you who go to church, I believe when you are there, and you're really exhausted, and a pastor begins to preach, there's a tendency of calmness. There's a tendency of feeling at home. And what happens is, is that the sleep just takes over. And the preacher will preach and preach. By the time he finishes, you have already finished your sleep. And it's very, very interesting. But if we have a structured facility, we could be able to practice some of this. So through this integrated approach, the client experiences a sense of connectedness and purpose leading to improved mental well-being. You can imagine all these examples illustrate the connectedness. You have a bishop, you have an imam, you have a clergy, you have a chaplain, you have a psychologist, you have a, a psychiatrist, all of you at peace. I'm looking forward to a situation in Africa where we could have such things work. We should not, without doubt, that civilization began in Africa. And therefore, I'm looking at a situation of integration. Having one African global mental health facility, having all the members becoming part of the mental wellness of people. My question is, how can mental health professionals collaborate with spiritual leaders to address 
the diverse needs of individuals seeking mental health support. I'm aware that when you meet someone on the street picking things and papers, it doesn't mean that the person is completely offline. It means he has been disturbed. And most of them have seen that people have gone to school and they are better. So mental health professionals can collaborate with spiritual leaders by fostering open communication, mutual respect, and interdisciplinary collaboration. This collaboration may involve joint assessments, joint referral systems, joint shared interventions that integrate both clinical and spiritual perspectives. I would like a situation where a priest, a clergy, an imam encourages or invites a psychologist and says, excuse me, I have observed that this one is not really religious. It is psychological. Then the psychologist says, I think this one is a psychiatrist. So what I should do, let us help in all integration. But lack of this will bring about problems. Scenario number two, a psychiatrist working in a community mental health center, collaborating with a local pastor to provide mental health support to congregants experiencing anxiety and stress. You can imagine if a, a psychiatrist comes to Kemu and says, I want to check if all of these members of staff are okay. And then the church agrees. You can imagine how we can be able to solve most of these uh, mentor-related problems. So together, they can organize a series of workshops that address both psychological and spiritual aspects of well-being incorporating principles of cognitive behavior therapy and pastoral counseling. My question then is, how can spirituality and existential coping strategies be integrated into therapy sessions to promote resilience and meaning making? The approach is that therapists can integrate spirituality and existential coping strategies by exploring clients' beliefs, values, and existential concerns within the therapeutic context. This may involve incorporating mindfulness practices, guided imagery, existential questioning, and narrative therapy techniques to facilitate meaning making and spiritual growth. Scenario number three, you have a psychologist working with a client Facing a terminal illness, he explores existential themes of life and death during therapy sessions. Together, they discuss the client's spiritual beliefs, fears, and hopes for the future, integrating existential coping strategies to promote acceptance, peace, and a sense of legacy. I've seen a number of people who are suffering from these terminal illnesses. And before they get to another world, they always call relatives to talk about the whole experience. If we have a combination, a combined effort of these professionals, I think it will provide peace for the person moving. While this is important, what are some ethical considerations um, when integrating spirituality into mental health care? Like in our facility that we envision to have and to begin with, it is very important to include respecting clients' autonomy, cultural and religious diversity, confidentiality, and avoiding imposing personal beliefs on clients. Most of the professionals in the area of mental health, they use their life experiences these life experiences are detrimental to growth because the clients you work with are different from you. So the experiences you have worked on could not be used
for the experiences for that client. So mental health professionals should also be aware of their own biases and limitations when addressing spiritual issues in therapy. <clears throat> I know a number of professionals go to church and there is also a tendency because you have known the Bible, you want to use it in that particular manner. There should be some limitations so that you don't misconstrue and affect the well-being of the client. Scenario number four. A counselor working with a client from a different cultural background encounters challenges in understanding and addressing the client's spiritual beliefs. So the counselor seeks supervision and consultation to gain cultural competence so that ethical practice respecting the client's autonomy and the world view throughout the therapeutic process is protected. So it's very important for that. I want to believe, having said all these aspects that are supposed to guide the client who is also a professional, would help navigate in this triad of helping themselves as professionals and also helping the clients that they serve. So these interventions may include psychotherapy, informed by spiritual principles, mindful based practices, support groups, and integrating psychological and spiritual components. God bless you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Let's appreciate him again. Uh, thank you so much for that very highly informative presentation. We have followed you very keenly and also the scenarios you have given unto us. I want to observe that you have talked about one particular issue which is very common, stigmatization and the negative, very high negative perceptions towards uh, the mental health uh, patients or persons whom we think they have really uh, gotten useless and so forth. Um, stigmatization and the perception makes the situation worse. I want to give a scenario. Oh, last month, I went out on a Saturday to buy meat in a certain marketplace, and I found a person uh, standing near Hambuchari where I wanted to buy meat. And the person was seemingly manned, suffering very acute mental health, but he's speaking a lot of English. So seeming to have been even gone up to the university level. And uh, I was afraid of that person, though I wanted to buy meat, there, I packed the vehicle. And I walked very slowly to the butchery, and he noticed this lady is afraid of me. So the person, I don't know where he collected a carton box and teared it into pieces and made a pathway like a carpet towards my vehicle using those pieces up to the entrance door of the, 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 my door for the, for the driver. And he came and told me, as you walk out, I want you to use this carpet. <laughs> uh, I looked at him. My meat was packed. And he stood outside near the vehicle. So I went out and used the carpet. And I stood at the, at the entrance of the door and I called him. And we had a conversation. And I asked him, what is your name? He told me his name. And at that time, he had kept everything down. And he was very sober, and everybody was looking at us, was watching. And uh, I asked him, what do you do? He told me he doesn't do anything because he's not able to do anything at all. Uh, 
I didn't want so much conversation with him because in any case he was very dirty and the smell was not very good. So I asked him now, I want to buy you soda. So can you get this some money and go and take soda? He told me, no, I don't take soda. Allow me to take what I like eating. And if you allow me to take that, I will take your money and go and feed myself. I told him, okay, you can get the money, go and have anything, what you like eating. And uh, start looking at, checking on what you can be able to do to earn your own living. He told me, it's okay, I will try. I was not like this. Uh, some people uh, messed up with me. Now he has started opening up. Uh, so, and he was very, very grateful, and he didn't make noise again. I went to my car and left, and realized that these people, uh, they need to be appreciated. They can open up, they can talk, and they can explain their problems. But what happens with us out there, in most cases, there is negligence, there is stigma, and uh, there is also um, profiling them, which makes the situation extremely worse. I have also known of another, some other people who are not very good at Chogoria, and they relate very well with some people. You become good to them, they are very good, and you converse. But if you become violent, they also tend to be violent against you. So the question is, as communities, as a household, how do we handle the mental health people? In trying to provide the healing, how do we provide that care? That care, that care in the approach. When we do this as grown-ups, what about the children? The children even throw stones to them. So these are, we need to know these are human beings, these are our people, and we need to come together to understand their behavior and be able to ask ourselves a few questions in providing mental care, the health care, as the people, as the spiritual care, psychologists, uh, families, what do we do? How do we approach them? Thank you so much, Professor. I want to open this session for a few clarifications from the members, and I want to ask now our, uh, my partner here, Dr. Muchiri, to take us through the questions and clarifications. Thank you. Uh, indicate that um, those examples you've presented are really very relevant. People are like fruits. People are like fruits. And each one of us, we know the benefits of taking a fruit. At one time, I loved to take guavas. Another time, I desired to take purple. Another time, I desired to take avocado. Another time, I desired to take Recently, when I came to this uh, uh, university, a friend of mine took me to take some other interesting fruit. This fruit, he called, she called it, um, I've forgotten the name. But I know another time when I went to South Korea, there was a, a fruit called durian. Durian is a very, very, very sweet fruit. But this durian, before you, before it is cut and served to you, if they bring it, it really smells like human feces. And at one time, I almost refused it. Actually, when they served it, I just looked around at my neighbor and I said, have you stepped on something? And I said, uh, he said, no, this is a fruit called durian. It has come and it's very, very sweet. So I tasted it and it was very, very sweet. So this means that 
No one single person is born mad. No one single person is made mad. It is the circumstances of life, the treatment that people get from others that make them smell like durian. I've traversed in East Africa and I've found this is the scenario. All these people you see on the streets picking papers, sitting down with luggages, is because someone neglected them. Someone abandoned them. So we should put structures in place so that we can be able to help them to recognize their need for help, to support clients in exploring the existential questions and finding meaning in their experiences. Why are they in that situation? And coming up with a global mental health facility within the region would be able to do assessment of these persons and then classify their conditions and provide treatment modalities for them. We can direct them to the church, we can direct them to the mental health facilities, psychiatrists, we can also take them into continuing education. So I think that's very important and we need to uh, observe that and uh, help them out. If it is a situation in uh, Japan uh, and China, such people will not find them on the streets. So the psychiatrists the mental health professionals will just pick them and have them taken or committed into those facilities. So it's very important that we know that human beings are like fruits. There are those fruits which are very sweet, there are those which smell, but not necessarily that they are very bad. So we need to be able to recognize that, and that is the way to go, and that's the basic way to begin treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bantu, for that uh, presentation and enlight enlightenment. Uh, we want to take a few questions as we tie together the day that has been. Uh, I have seen uh, Jacqueline, your heart is up. Uh, you can ask. I can see Dr. Monica. Uh, so let me give them a, ch a chance, my, uh, my brother here. So let's go start with Jacqueline online. Then Dr. Monica, down. Then uh, once you've given those three uh, questions, then we can have Professor respond to them. Uh, let's start. Jacqueline, are you online? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening. You can hear me? Yes, proceed. All right. My name is Jacqueline. I'm from Karatina University. And I have a mental health condition. So unlike every other profession here, I am the point of discussion. I suffer from a mental condition, and I appreciate this, this conversation because it is uh, generally giving me hope for tomorrow. And I want mm -hmm. to address um, issues raised from morning to now and also raise a question. That question I had raised earlier had been presented by a lady. Uh, she has just spoken, I've forgotten her name. Which mental conditions are demonic and which ones are not and basically uh, um, because I've gone in, I've been diagnosed with a mental condition I was diagnosed while still employed at Karatina University were it not for diagnosis I would be that mad person in the street that much I know but intervention came both psychological and spiritually but before spiritual intervention came I had to go through a psychological assessment. And while at the rehabilitation center, the spiritual aspect was brought in. So all of them had to come together for me to walk this journey. And my condition being genetic, which is bipolar disorder one, mm -hmm. is genetic, um, has made me see the value of spirituality in the journey, medication in the journey, and support from the community. And what you are saying that community mm -hmm. and society have to be brought on board is because the stigma that we face is basically from the society and the part of the society is the church. And I hope and pray by the end of this conference 
the church will come on board with a positive mind. Not the positive mind of calling us name of Modomogoroki or someone who's possessed. A mind that will know what I know that I'm Jacqueline, I have a mental condition, it's a disease like any other that needs spiritual um, intervention to get better, needs a doctor to get better, and for me to walk this journey. And when you call us names, because I advocate for it everywhere, because I work also with the Office of the Second Lady, when you call us names, we tend to get violent. We tend to fight for our space, and how we do it is very, is very is animal-like. And we, we want to stop doing that. If only the society will accept us for who we are, because we contribute so much to the society if given a chance and a positive platform. And this platform, I believe, by the end of this conversation, if we have good guidelines and good conclusions, then there is hope for people like me, for people that I have given a voice, because I'm that voice that is not ashamed to say I have a mental condition. It does not define me and does not define my future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to respond uh, immediately so that uh, in the interest of time, uh, I want to thank you for your experiential knowledge about knowing what to do and when. The purpose of this international dialogue on integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health it serves as a platform for mental health professionals, spiritual leaders, researchers, and those advocates to mental health. The platform that we are making as a result of this meeting, we want to form one global mental health for East Africa. And I think Jacqueline Karatina University would be part of this establishment. We want to come up as a nation, as a continent, as a corporation, so that we address some of these issues. There is an interconnectedness between the mind, the body, and the soul. And this is the time we should raise up. I like uh, Jacqueline, I think you might have read the book of uh, Numbers 5, that talks about Deborah. This generation now requires women into leadership positions because you must define, you must raise up, you must speak. And God has now chosen you. You are the person that is going to bring, to carry the mantle. I wish would have such kind of persons like Jacqueline who can really come and team up with this global initiative that we want to have. And that's the reason we are saying we need to recognize the interconnectedness of the psychological and spiritual well-being. This debate or dialogue will continue until tomorrow and ultimately we should be able to come up with something tangible. And at the end of my visit to this university, I'll make a big report for the University Council for East Africa for that mounting or establishing or operationalization of the global mental health facility. We shall begin with Kemu, then move to other countries within the region. I want to thank you uh, for that experiential knowledge and laboring is not acceptable. We shouldn't label anybody. We should now stigmatize the condition that people are suffering. All of us were created in the image of God and as a result of that image of God, we are good to go places. But if we are neglected, if we are abandoned, if we are not taken care of, if we are not diagnosed appropriately, we will do a misdiagnosis because of lack of that interconnectedness. So it's my prayer 
and my <laughs> desire that we now get connected so that we can become all. I want to thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banti, for that presentation. Uh, right from morning. Right from morning, um, something has been sort of uh, disturbing me in the sense that uh, I thought it took me so long to understand the difference between psychiatry and psychology or psychotherapy. And today I realize that uh, a lot of what we are saying, including the, 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 the theme of this conference, is talking about integrating psychiatry and spiritual, omitting psychology. Uh, but in the process of talking, we're actually talking about both. I want them to say, to the benefit of any person who might have had trouble, like I had before I got to understand these things, that psychiatry is not the overarching uh, profession that houses other professions, including psychology. Psychiatry is a standalone profession uh, in mental health. Psychology is a standalone. Um, theology is a standalone. But we are all mental health professionals. Mm. I want to refer to what uh, Jacqueline has just said. Uh, Jacqueline said that uh, for her to get where she is, she had to have the services of all those people. There was a medical doctor who is mm. a psychiatrist, mm. I believe. Mm. She had to work with a psychotherapist mm. because she needed to be helped to even understand mm. what this mental condition is. Because the psychiatrist, um, they would treat them and treat, uh, of course, they use medical approach. And they may not have the time to explain what this is. But a psychologist will sit with the person because that is their work and help the person understand what this condition is and how they can live with it with support uh, by all the other professions. Of course, the um, spiritual um, people will come in and support in terms of prayer and encouragement. So I wanted to say that uh, uh, I would have been very happy if the theme was integrating psychiatry stroke psychology uh, and, the spiritual, and the spirituality in mental health uh, in mental health matters. Having said that, I want to thank Professor uh, Bantu for the presentation. Uh, along the way, I, I felt like uh, there are some people we might be omitting in terms of uh, mental wellness of mental health professionals. Uh, in my mind, it kept occurring that probably we should say uh, mental wellness for all people helping professionals. And the reason why is because we have many conductors who are not psychiatrists. Of course, we know the, 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 the basic tra training for all of them is, 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 med is medical, but then we know the, the, the branch out. So we have many conductors who are dealing with very difficult cases and they also need mental health, uh, I mean mental wellness. We have social workers who deal with very, very difficult cases, human beings uh, going through very difficult uh, situations. They also need uh, mental, mental wellness. So for me, uh, Professor Bantu, we are actually talking about all people helping professionals needing self-care, needing mental wellness, and therefore, your presentation becomes very, very good and raising all those people. But my question is, how shall they know? How shall they know that they even need that mental wellness? You and I are lucky. We've gone through uh, counseling psychology and uh, clinical psychology, and it has, it's an integration in our study 
that mental wellness through self-care is critical. I remember when I was exiting KEMU, the academy, to go into full practice, full-time practice, I was invited by the vice chancellor and the, and, the, and the DVC, I suppose, and the registrar for the exit interview. And they asked me why I'm leaving the academy. I said, it's self-care. I can tell you for sure I had to explain what that meant. What is self-care? Because we are taught that we need this. But what about these other professions? Do they know that they need it? So what shall we do? So that right from the foundation, the basics, they know that they need self-care. Compassion fatigue is so much in the medical world. But do they know that they need that care? Until one or two or three of them break down, either with depression or anything else, anxiety and so on and so forth, uh, behavioral uh, challenges, and therefore they seek personal help. As a community, do they know? So I think this remains my biggest question because we may talk about mental wellness for the um, professionals, mental health professionals, or people helping uh, professionals, but do they know that they need it? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Gitonga Monica, for those observations. I want to begin with the last question. How will they know? Actually, I'll give answers related to the Bible. In the book of John chapter 3, there was a man educated in the law profession. This man was called Nicodemus. Nicodemus did not know anything at all, but he knew his profession. But the visitation in the night to see Jesus have volumes to speak about personal therapy. He went, and the Bible says, they talked one on one. He was powering out. He had that there was someone called teacher. And in the discourse, one on one, Jesus was able to talk to him and ultimately diagonized the conditions that he had. One on one. He had how will they know? Nicodemus had. In this conference, in the dialogue, we are trying to facilitate an interdisciplinary dialogue. And a number of people, when you look at the platform, we had about 70 persons on this dialogue. We used the social media and we had that. How will they know? We requested our partners in the U.S., that this is a big issue. And in the presentations, you saw them. How will they know? In John chapter 4, there was a Samaritan woman. This Samaritan woman was lonely and alone. Lonely and alone. That is John, John chapter 4. Lonely and alone. If I would be saying in terms of psychology, she had a psychological condition called loneliness. We have a number of psychological problems including anxiety, fear, phobia, panic attack, depression, gambling, suicide. Those are psychological conditions. Now, how will they know? In the Western world, some of these conditions happened because they didn't have a, a corrective name to name them. Like PTSD, like schizophrenia. When these conditions came to Africa, as we thought these people are demon possessed. Indeed, people get possessed. The Bible talks about the demon possessed person. So these conditions can be known, one, by 
facilitating dialogue. The Samaritan woman dial had a direct dialogue with Jesus. And Jesus, when he was talking, he tried to reveal some of the things that she was going through. And one of the key aspects was, even the husband you are living with is not your husband. And from that, the woman had to go and call a number of people. So, us beginning a global mental health within East Africa, we shall add more partners, like the Samaritan woman. The Bible says when they were brought, they filled the garden. Chapter 5 of John. How will they know? There is a story of a man who had been mimed for 38 years, crawling. We have had this suffering paralyzed. These mental issues can paralyze your operations, can paralyze the way you communicate with others, your bosses. You have even seen most of the CEOs. You get into the office, he says, get out of my office. And yet, this office you applied to go and serve. But as we say, that is an diagonized mental illness. Now, this dialogue is a combination of psychologists, mental health professionals, psychologists, the clergy, the imams, the counselors coming together. Now, what happened in the well? <laughs> Jesus found everybody was very happy, enjoying the, the privilege of healing in the pool. Ultimately, he went to. How would they know? He went to the man who was mimed for those years. And they had a one-on-one -on -one talk. He said, uh, so what do you want me to do for you? I want to walk. The man was asked, pick your mat and walk. We are now psychologists, mental health professionals, counselors. We are now coming out and we are finding these conditions as you have put them. You find in the education, the teachers are not behaving well. You go to the law, justice and law. How many lawyers have you have you have had a counselor? How many lawyers have been diagnosed? In the court of law, how many psychologists have been contacted that we need you to give an expert knowledge about the condition of this case? How many of you have been contacted during the Shakahola incident that are at least find out from a psychologist to see whether this was a real thing or and made experience of these people. So we are coming out as a team. We are coming out as a group. We are coming out as partners so that people can know. How will they know? One of the ways they are knowing is that interdisciplinary dialogue. And I want us to move it away. John chapter 8. I'm not preaching, but because there is an interconnectedness between spirituality, psychology, and mental health. In John chapter 8, there is a scenario of a woman who is caught in adultery. Actually, the Bible puts it like this, that this woman was caught in the very act. Are you seeing the guilt? Are you seeing the anxiety? Are you seeing the fear? Are you seeing the depression? Instant? Are you seeing the vicarious trauma because of those conditions? But Jesus was a psychologist. He wrote, he read the minds of the people. He wrote on the ground and said, if anyone has not done it, let him be the first to stone. The implication of this teaching is that we should now raise up psychologists. It's your time. Pastors, it's your time. Theologians, it's your time. Psychiatrists don't treat things that have not been classified. Psychiatrists will understand that this condition is schizophrenic and the treatment for this is this. But before you treat, can you have an interaction with a psychotherapist to tell you that these conditions that have made this problem are unmet needs and anticipated expectations that have not been um, uh, shared with the persons that are in this area. And then now, the psychiatrist will begin to treat a condition that is clear set. You had Jacqueline explained to us 
that he's a victim and this condition she is aware about it. So what we should be doing now is to promote awareness like Jack Jacqueline. Awareness and understanding of mental health issues within faith-based communities. When we set a center here, for example, in this region at uh, Kenya Methodist University, and I'm trying to find ways of where we can set it, do you see this will be the only regional center where people will be referred to? In the West and area, and especially Marklin Hospital, uh, Harvard University facility, they will be supportive. You heard Professor Davis saying, we can look for funds, we can do things together so that those who have can give those who don't have. But for us, we have. We have the facilities. We have the human resource. We have all that is needed. So the conversion and international dialogue of this nature, they have now known. I'm answering your question, how will they know? Ultimately, when Jesus was left with the woman, they again talked one on one. And then Jesus told the woman, where are your accusers? And he looked around, everyone had disappeared. And then she answered, no one. What did Jesus say? He told the woman, now my dear friend, go and see no more. It means the person had a condition. And had she not gone through those processes, she would have been killed before she could meet the standards that are put in place. It is your time now. You have come. It's important that now we can begin to say, okay, let us explore innovative approaches for integrating this. Like one day we can say, let us have all the imams. We can influence government. Most governments now require that people be in good mental health. You are very lucky that the president of this country is a Christian and he advocates prayers every morning. If we say now at Kemu, Kenya Methodist University, we had a very important dialogue on the integration of psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health system, and we need your support. Do you know the president knows that about 70% of persons in the community are mentally ill? You think he doesn't know? He's an old doctor. Doesn't he know that he is looking for men and women who can help? When you have very good people in good mental health, education, economic, social transformation will be well. So I believe that how they are going to know is through this kind of dialogue. And I can assure you, being a representative from the International Inter University Council for East Africa, and one of the protocols is integrating in education. I am here. You think if I went back to Uganda and asked the president that now this is an issue. I have had soldiers fighting and killing each other, committing suicide. But there is a facility we need to begin. How do you support us? In Tanzanian parliament, there was a debate about why women are refusing to be married. They have reached an age, but they cannot marry. So one of the debaters said, I think this thing must be investigated. It must be mental illness. In DRC, where we have had a presenter, this is a big issue. So how will they know? <laughs> they have started knowing, and therefore, we should continue. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I can talk and talk because mental health and me are inseparable and would like to make sure that we have these persons, personalities in their mental wellness. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we will be, we'll be I'd waiting. Like uh, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, just a minute. Eh? Ah, Reverend Dr. Kari, yes, we'll give you a chance. What I'm saying is we need to, of course, uh, wind up. It's almost getting to 6 uh, p.m. on this side of the globe. Eh? And uh, we have a continuity of this tomorrow. So I'll give those who are going to ask just to say or to comment straight without adding or without uh, explaining. And then I'll ask Professor Ban to, to propose to answer the questions tomorrow after they ha he has had them because otherwise he will not finish today. 
Uh, so let me go. We, I have uh, uh, my friend uh, uh, who was from Nobu campus. Uh, you can ask your question uh, briefly. Uh, then uh, very briefly, then uh, and then you, uh, the professor will not answer straight. We will go to the next, and then we will agree on how to proceed so that uh, people are not uh, uh, exhausted beyond, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, not to be able to turn up tomorrow. We need them to turn up tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, we might uh, li li talk about mental health and then uh, practice it here, which is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, Professor Bantu is uh, my lecturer. He's taking us in personality, theories of personality. Back in my country, Cameroon, we follow him every day here. And this is critical. We are going to open this triangle of uh, psychiatry, psychology, spirituality. We make it a square. Why am I saying we're making it a square? Because when we follow personality theories in my country, Cameroon, talking about burnout, burnout, you know, of a psychological expert and psychiatrist. We started a program called Spending Behavior Restructuring Program, in which we found out much burnout were caused by financial pressure. You know, professionals work for money. Most of them went to the profession for money. And now when you tell them relax, exercise, dieting, they tell we don't have enough cash. So what we realize is you have to teach individuals on how to restructure their behavior with respect to spending. This is interesting. Professor Bantu's personality theories taught us that there are several kinds of spenders. You know, when you look at Freudian spenders, these are people who spend money because of carryovers from childhood. When you look at Ericksonian spenders, these are those that spend sometimes to buy identity and possibly to create intimacy. When you look at Bandora spenders, they spend because they are model to spend. So because of this spending behavior restructuring in my country, we were able to uh, influence individuals to modify their behavior and spend less. And by spending less, they put their money in a, a financial pool and they were able to create a financial service provider. I think we as owners of psychology, this is an institution that teaches that if we can be able to pull finances together by teaching individuals on not to spend from individuals to communities to government, we can open a triangle of collaboration from psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, spiritualists, to financial empowerment. That makes it a square. Thank you very much. Uh, next, without uh, elaborating, Professor Ban to take note. Uh, Leverett Dr. Ankari, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. I am Reverend Dr. Mary Kari, a chaplain at the University of Embu. And uh, I want to apologize for joining late. Today we are the Thanksgiving service in our university. Uh, to mark the end of the academic calendar year. Now, uh, in Osea 4-6, in Osea 6-4, it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And I want to look at the African context or culture whereby men are branded to be tough. And when you look at what the professor has presented and look at the scenario in the churches, women are the majority. Women are in many groups, like the Chamas and so forth. So they have an opportunity to vent out what they are going through, and they are able to release their stress. And mental illness is not very high among women, though there are some many cases. But you find that men will die quietly. So this dialogue is very key. And as we move forward, we need to have mechanisms of making it possible for the men or the male child or the, even the mature ones to speak out and to be involved in as many social groups as possible. Thank you very much. It's a very fruitful dialogue. God bless. Um. Thank you. Uh, there was a hand here. Did you really want to ask a question at some stage, or your uh, question was answered? Yeah, okay. You can make a comment. You open the mic and make the input. I'm going to ask Professor Bantu to keep this overnight.
girl, dear nice. I've been rejected by the community, I've been rejected by my family, I've been rejected by God. So she ended up attempting suicide. So I want to support what, what Jacqueline was saying. The church needs to look at things positively and realize uh, the mental and some people are created in God's image. My other point is uh, I wanted to I'm a cons have a concern about uh, Dr. Monica's uh, statement. I'm not talking as a healthcare provider, I'm a senior nurse, retired. Healthcare providers experience a lot of burnout. Mm. And that's why you hear the mistreating patients. Mm. But they do not know where to seek help. But this conference is a high opener, and I hope it will get to them as soon as possible. Thank you. Been informed. Yeah, you can briefly respond, very briefly, so that we, we tie the knots together for the day. Yes, I've been informed by the past of ceremonies to take these as assignments for home. But I wanted to begin with the last presenter. With the, she says she's a retired senior nurse. I want to go against that. There's no one who is retired. Um, uh, when you are still useful and you are still on this earth, God still wants you to provide the experience which you have. I want also to reiterate that there is a verse in the Bible which I'm going to bring for you tomorrow that talks about prostitutes and are ahead of you to the kingdom of heaven. But you see, someone may not have read such a verse in the Bible. So it's right to push away this person who is a drunkard and all that. Okay, it says prostitutes and tax collectors. Tax collectors are people who really take it without mindful thought of the struggles you've taken. So, but the Bible says that prostitutes and tax collectors are ahead of you to the kingdom of heaven. That means everyone is acceptable in every situation. The only weakness is that we don't know. And that's such kind of dialogue will help us to help them. Uh, Reverend Dr. Nkare, I thank you for this important presentation from Embu. Hosea 6 verse 4, he says, my people perish because they lack knowledge. Uh, our, our, our motto of Kavar University says, knowledge is the future. And the future is here for Kemu. And this is the time now to look at this knowledge and bring the future where? Here. This dialogue is intended to come up with projects that will create more debate. And one of the output we envision to have, which we've already mentioned, is coming up with a global center of mental health and psychology which will be housed here in Kenya Methodist University, but it is not limited to Kenya Methodist University. So we will request all the other universities that have participated in this meeting to make sure that they attend the, the meeting tomorrow because the conversation is still continuous and they want to make a difference within East Africa. Now my student, who is doing uh, theories of personality, is very important. This dialogue is very important because you can know the different types of personalities and how they behave. And you have exemplified one on financial literacy. Indeed, one of the risk factors that create poverty here is income, money, how we spend our money. Money literacy or financial literacy is a big topic of debate. And as you saw Davis saying, they have the resources, but we need to know our personalities. Like they can give us all the dollars, and in two minutes we have finished them. So personality theories will help us to see whether we are going to incorporate in our triad spirituality, healing, the clergy, and mental health, and then financial literacy. So we will now, through the dialogue, we should be able to come up with modalities. Professor Caro will be talking about aggressive behavior. And he's doing that kind of study using the model of the fruit fly. 
Animals are very good because we study them to understand human behavior. So this dialogue is late. We should have started it yesterday, if not yesterday, but one. But God's timing is always the right time. Thank you very much, and thank you for these wonderful questions. I believe that this conference ultimately will be very useful to all. Thank you, and of course, uh, no, I need to mention that this conference has partners, the partners from Harvard University, Makere University in Uganda, Kawara University, the Maclean Harvard Medical School, the Vanderbilt Memory of Alzheimer's Center, the Counseling and Training Center for the Olive Counseling and Training Center, uh, then we have the Methodist Treatment Center, and the other universities that have not been profiled here, but they're part of us, including the Uganda Matches University, the Kampala International University, and other universities here that have not had their logos. But we do hope uh, tomorrow before the end of our meeting, the schools will be part of us. I believe, Nkare, you are aware that now uh, you said the Embu University and other universities will need to have that cooperation so that we can start on a new chapter on integrating mental health, spirituality, and psychiatry. Thank you and God bless you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's applaud uh, Professor Bantu and all those who have made contributions during this session. Uh, Dr. Carlo, can you still hear us on that end of the globe? Yes, yes, Professor. What, what time is that, Ed? We might, we might decide to use your clock. It, Ours is uh, moving 11, too fast. <laughs> 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Good. We, that means we, are, we still have a long day. <laughs> we, can, we can spend a little more time. Thank you very yes, much. Yes. Yes. Would you want to make a, a you make a, a, a comment before we we close on this side? Here it is now six p.m. No, I'm I'm just I'm very excited. Um, I'm I'm really grateful to um, Kenya Methodist University to Dr. Kinodi um, for meeting with me and Professor Bantu for orchestrating this entire symposium. I think it's very important that we all collaborate um, and come together. So my, I've always, um, before I became faculty, so one of my dreams was to always collaborate with professors in, in, in Africa. Um, because, you know, every time you think of collaborations here, they always think of maybe, you know, Oxford University or some of Cambridge. And I always make the argument like, why? There's also brilliant scientists all over, you know, in Africa, and there's also brilliant scientists in South America. And so I've been, um, I've been really adamant and advocate of, of also putting other universities on the platform of, of the scientific map. So I'm really excited and, and thank you so much for uh, holding this event and for allowing us to participate. Um, we, we're really looking forward to more collaborations to come um, with, with the different uh, countries in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will allow Professor Bantu to make the last comment for the day, even as he uh, highlights the, uh, the other topics that we shall cover tomorrow. Uh, and uh, he's the chair of this organizing team, so this is why I'm giving the chance to make the final word. Now, not as a presenter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for creating time to be with us. I was reminded of the scripture that I was supposed to talk about that is in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, um, verse 31. And it says that prostitutes and tax collectors who believe will be ahead of us in the kingdom. I would turn it this way, that now we have believed that mental health is cardinal to the life of an institution, is cardinal to the life of an individual, is cardinal to the well-being of a country, to the well-being of Africa. If we believe that it is doable and it is possible, then the sky is no longer the limit 
but the heavens. So I want to believe that this, this dialogue that we have started uh, today will eventually be one of the platforms for most countries and the continent to be on the front line to change the mindset of the people about the interconnectedness of spirituality, psychology, and psychiatry. Tomorrow, we shall have the following activities. Remember, the Vice Chancellor was expected to give a welcome remark in the morning, and I'm very sure we will not miss it tomorrow. So the Vice Chancellor will be able to give her remarks, uh, but um, um, I have to confirm that to you that she has been following on very well because she's one of the persons that are very committed to the mental wellness of the clergy, the chaplains, the psychologists, and other professionals and advocates of mental health. So she'll be providing her remarks. Uh, eh, you can see she's already there, and uh, I think she has been following. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Mary Kinoti, we do appreciate your presence, and we have already informed the members and the participants that you shall give your remarks tomorrow. Thank you very much. The next presenter, of course, in the morning hours, will be those that we have um, asked to present, who did not have an opportunity to present today, will be presenting tomorrow, including the Professor Karen Yamwangi from Kisi University. And uh, Karen Yamwangi is a professor of psychology. She serves as a, 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 an elder and these days, uh, ladies have become elders, and I think that's their time now to take up leadership roles. So she'll be speaking tomorrow uh, at some time. Then we shall also have uh, Brenda. Brenda will be talking about... Oh, I'm saying that tomorrow we shall have the following presenters. We shall have... Uh, Professor Karen Nyamwange, and Professor Karen Nyamwange was expected to speak today, and she'll be speaking about assessing the impact of digital technologies on the holistic health of frontline healthcare providers in Kisi County, Kenya. And uh, uh, the other presenter I mentioned is Brenda Nalwanga. Uh, will be talking about community outreach in faith-based communities. And then we shall also have uh, other uh, thematic areas that the ICT has already captured but have not yet come to this table. But we shall also include them if time will allow. We shall also have uh, Professor... Uh, Laura Jamin, who will be talking about digital health. And as we are talking about leveraging digital health services within the East African region, this will be part and partial of our presentations that we shall have tomorrow. So please, I beg that you don't miss, and if you must miss, postpone the missing so that you can be able to attend to that. Then after that, we shall have Professor Peter Baguma, who was the keynote speaker, uh, to talk about PTSD and veterans. I believe that um, Professor Peter Baguma, uh, you've known uh, his experience, an experienced veteran in psychology and a renowned professor of psychology in Africa and he's also uh, the president of the World Council for Psychotherapy in Africa, and he will be talking about uh, PTSD and veterans, and maybe we shall ask him to say it in his mother tongue. 
what PTSD is and maybe schizophrenia. I'm also aware that our professor also from the Western area has experience in uh, veterans, PTSD and veterans. So we shall have a conversion kind of daily, daily uh, dialogue on these two uh, aspects. We also expect uh, other presenters. We want to thank Dr. Davis for the presentation on Asheimers and dementia. And Professor Caroline, uh, Professor Caroline uh, has been working with us in almost all this uh, beginning and she'll be talking about understanding aggression. It's a very important subject in uh, mental health and is using the models of the fruit fly to make this easier. And especially now that the period of leadership is to ladies, should be talking about aggression in the female, ag understanding aggression in female. Then also, we shall have presentations from other colleague, Pro uh, Professor Kerry Ressler, will be presenting on post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is a very important aspect because most of the people carry on with what we call vicarious trauma. Things that they left in the past keeping on disturbing them until now. So we believe that uh, Professor Kerry Ressler, who is one of the key partners and the chief scientific officer at Macklin Hospital, Harvard University's teaching facility, is going to be speaking to us again tomorrow. Uh, uh, during that session, I want to encourage the participants to register online and for those universities that are part and partial of this establishment, I request that you encourage your colleagues and participants to fill in the online form so that when we are saying we need support to start off this global mental health facility, which is supposed to be providing psychological first aid, doing assessments in all areas, we have the capacity and the capacity will be reflected in the form that you fill. I want to thank Professor Mohammed from um, Umar. Uh, Umar University. We do hope that uh, people are saying that Muslims, Muslims, but I believe that the universities I've mentioned, Kampai International University, the Umar and other universities in Dar es Salaam and DRC will form a body that we can have centers where we can be able to integrate I also want to mention at this time that uh, the participants that presented today, we shall have uh, Professor Shafali Singh, is a psychiatry lecturer at Harvard Medical School. And she will also be presenting and making her remarks, and especially in the areas of mental health. And Later on, we shall have reflections on key learning and insights from the conference, and then holding things uh, in, uh, positive, we shall come up with the ways forward. Uh, we have expectations. We have expectations, and these expectations are supposed to guide us on the way forward. And based on uh, what we mentioned during the day, we expect increased awareness and understanding of the importance of integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches in mental health care. And we also expect enhanced collaboration, including Cameroon now on board, between mental health professionals and spiritual leaders. We also expect development of innovative interventions and programs that integrate psychiatric and spiritual perspectives. And we also expect empowerment of mental health professionals to address their psychosocial needs and prevent burnout. And I think uh, Dr. Gitonga mentioned that we need now also to roll it down to look at other professionals and uh, not limited to the judiciary, but to medical doctors, 
because they also inhibit conditions that are likely to exacerbate their service delivery to the caregivers. And we also expect strengthened support systems for individuals experiencing mental health challenges within faith-based communities. Like Jackie, I believe we need to have a talk, actually we need to have a dialogue with you so that we can come up with a foundation for the voices of the voiceless. And I think Jacqueline, uh, you'll need to uh, provide your details and then you shall be able to carry it further. The importance of this dialogue is that it should provide a platform for sharing knowledge, experiences, and we have people who are going to uh, present on grief, grief experience, um, and best practices in integrating psychiatric and spiritual approaches for enhanced mental health, and it will foster collaborations and partnerships among the stakeholders. You shouldn't be surprised that most governments within Africa will have an opportunity to front uh, mental health as one of the key areas to promote uh, transformation in various areas, leading to improved mental health outcomes for individuals and communities. The approaches that we have used so far, we have incorporated keynote presentations, we have had panel discussions, we shall have workshops and um, uh, interactive sessions. And of course, if we don't finish these uh, interactions, we shall now forge a way of having another meeting or workshop. And of course, uh, this presentation for today has featured presentations from experts in psychiatry, psychology, spirituality, and mental health advocacy. So the participants have engaged in the discussions. We have had case study scenarios, experiential exercises, like someone said uh, that she was a, um, a, a victim of bipolar and through this uh, spiritual interwoven, she has been able to recover and she knows, she still recognizes that she has that condition, but that is no more because she has not known the, how it does. So these discussions have deepened the understanding and skills that we can now use to approach some of these issues. So Professor Caro will be also presenting on gender-based violence. Professor Caro is also an advocate of uh, women empowerment in terms of helping them to seek services uh, that will help them have safe environments. So I think with those kind of remarks, I'd like to call on the Master of Ceremonies to move to the next agenda. Uh, thank you very much. Again, I want to appreciate everybody for coming. Those who are online for logging in, please do the same tomorrow. Uh, the logging information is already the same. It's the same, so please uh, log in early so that we can continue the day. Yeah, and of course, take note of uh, if you had questions that were not responded to, uh, we still have an, we have, we have a chance to respond to those questions. And so please come, uh, come early. We start the registration between 8.30 and 9. Uh, so please come and uh, those who are able to come physically, we would be happy to have you here. Uh, please join, uh, join in. And uh, so thank you very much. We uh, want to uh, bring this uh, uh, to a close. I want to invite Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, Douglas Severus to be able to uh, conclude. Uh, this uh, uh, with the uh, prayer. I'm hoping that uh, there's a cup of tea. None. Okay. Thank you. So then, uh, Reverend Douglas, please pray for us. It's not tea. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this time that we are concluding for our first day. I want to thank God for uh, the care that He has taken unto us, and also the way we have been enriched in very different ways. And therefore, as we conclude, we want to pray also looking forward for another great day tomorrow. So let us pray and commit ourselves before God at this time as we disperse. Father, in Jesus' name we are before you. We thank you. We bless your name because of this moment that you have uh, reached us, O oh Lord. 
Thank you for all that has taken place during this day and all the presenters and uh, even all the participants want to thank you dear Lord because of this wonderful intersection that we are uh, uh, looking into, uh, intersection between spirituality and mental health and all those other things that are coming God Almighty and they're also revealing themselves in the process. We want to pray dedicating each and everyone before your name. The Lord, through this knowledge and the wisdom, you are going to uh, make us and also the people that we interact with uh, uh, very beneficial to each other and even to the society at large. Thank you for, our, uh, the, for, for the chair of uh, today's uh, meeting. Thank you even for everyone else. And uh, we want to thank you for all of us as we disperse. Lord, continue to be with us and bless us and give us a restful evening and night. And enable us to come again tomorrow. We also want to pray for those who have not been able to join us. That Lord, you are going to create an opportunity for them. That tomorrow we are going to meet again. And continue with this uh, wonderful conference. Hear our prayer. Dear Lord, and bless us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace. And the love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, of course, if you have made a notice of anything that you think we should work on before tomorrow, please uh, pass by uh, the secretariat desk so that you can notify us, so that we can rectify and so that we can have a better conversation tomorrow. Thank you very much. Those who are online, we are uh, welcome again and again. You can put your, your questions on the chat because this is recorded. Thank you.